And that may sound rather complicated to you. For one very good reason, it is rather complicated. But you are listening to the Home Service, so don't be misled, even when our announcer comes on and says... This is the BBC Light Program. Oh, I have a minute, a minute. Here, how do you do? How do you do? Come here often. Well, only when I have some announcing to do. Oh, what do you say? Oh, nothing much. Uh, things like, um, this is the BBC Light Program. No, oh, that's very good, isn't it? <laughs> nice. Yeah. Go on, say again. Just one. No, I'd rather not. No, go on. Be a devil. <laughs> no, it, it, it sounds so trite. Well, trite. <laughs> Oh, very well. This is the BBC Light Programme. Oh, isn't he marvellous? <laughs> Good. Here, Hugh, mm-hmm. what would you say if you were an announcer and you had to say something like that? How would you do it? Something like that. Oh, that's nice, too. <laughs> I say, Betty, come here and meet an announcer. Why, is he nice? Charming. You know, he says things beautifully. And he's got a clever little catchphrase. Oh, what? This is the BBC Light Programme. Oh, <laughs> I must listen. And so you shall. Go on, Mr. Announcer. Oh, all right. This is the BBC Light Programme. Oh, it's out of this world. She hasn't finished yet. Ladies and gentlemen, whatever happens during the next 30 minutes will certainly be beyond our care. Oh, nice. Wait a minute. Do you mind keeping quiet? I what he say? He said keep quiet. Oh, it's sorry. Thank you. Among those taking part are Hilary St. Up John Crumble, Marjorie Hockflitch, Sir Cranworthy Crittington Groyle, Fatima Higgins, Gladys Rumbold, Alderman George Simcox, and of course Mr. Kenneth Horne, who prefers to remain anonymous. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Kenneth Horne. <laughs> Hello and good evening. Well, first of all, here's a special message to all our listeners in Iceland. Wrap up. <laughs> Well, now, tonight, tonight I was going to talk to you about current affairs, but quite frankly, I've never had an affair with the current, so... (laughs) Instead, let me tell you about some of the things that happened to me last week. On Monday, I attended a wine-tasting festival. On Tuesday, I was told that I had a good time on Monday. (laughs) But just the same, Tuesday evening, I popped into the Polybergier, but there wasn't much on, so... (laughs) So instead, I went along to the Poetry Lovers Guild at Oxshott's. And I listened to some rather unusual verse reading given by a young lady from Gloucester. (laughs) She'd obviously led a very full life. (laughs) On Wednesday, I went to Gloucester. (laughs) Thursday, I spent all the morning digging in the garden and mowing the lawn. Afternoon, I played four sets of tennis and I won them all. What's more, I felt as fresh as a daisy and... I don't want you to think I'm boasting, but I must say that lots of men half my age just couldn't have managed it. I suppose it's because I always keep myself in tip-top condition. Friday, I couldn't move. (laughs) But Saturday was really an eventful day. I remember that morning, I'd got up earlier than usual. Yes, Prudence, I'm in the bath. What is it? Oh, Mr. Owen, your breakfast's nearly ready. Oh, thank you. Oh, Prudence? Uh, Yes, sir? Have you seen anything of my midget submarine? No, I haven't. Oh, that's funny. It was here in the bath the last time I reviewed the fleet. (laughs) Now, let's see. Cruisers, battleship, destroyer, aircraft carrier. Oh, it's all right, Prudence. I found it. I'll come right down. Morning, Mr. Owen. Oh, good morning, Prudence. Here's your paper, sir, and the morning post. Oh, now, come along, sir. Your breakfast will be getting cold. All right, all right. Well, now, let's just have a look at the crossword, shall we? One down, one down. What you'd expect to find in a monastery garden. Four letters. Oh, I can't be bothered with the thing this morning. Let's have a look at some of these letters. Ah, now, here's an invitation to dinner. Captain and Mrs. Barrington Wycherley Struve request the pleasure of your company at a champagne supper at Barrington Towers on the occasion of their winning the first divvy on the football pool. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that sounds rather jolly. 
Oh, here's another invitation. Now, what does this one say? Mr. Humphrey Borum Stiff will be at home at 7.30 on the evening of the 14th. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, and so will Kenneth Horn. <laughs> oh, this one looks interesting. We should like to have you for luncheon on the 28th. Signed, the South Borneo Cannibals Association. <laughs> now, what else is there? This one looks exciting, exotic perfume, tiny, ladylike handwriting. Who could it be? Oh, it's from Pat Lancaster. Dear Ken, I've been going through several songs for the new show, and I think perhaps you might like a song from South Pacific. It's called A Cockeyed Optimist. P.S. It goes like this. When the sun is the bright canary yellow, I forget every cloud I've ever seen. So they call me a cockeyed optimist, immature and incurably green. I have heard people rant and rave and bellow that we're done and we might as well be dead. But I'm only a cockeyed optimist, and I can't get it into my head. I hear the human race is falling on its face and hasn't very far to go. But every whippoorwill is selling me a bill and telling me it just ain't so. I could say life is just a bowl of jello and appear more intelligent and smart. But I'm stuck like a ghost with a thing called hope, and I can't get it out of my heart. Not this heart. I hear the human race is falling on its face and hasn't very far to go. But every whip of will. It's telling me a bill And telling me it just ain't so I could say life is just a bowl of jello And appear more intelligent and smart But I'm stuck like a ghost With a thing called hope And I can't get it out of my heart Not Yes, I think the song she suggests should be jolly good. In fact, I can't wait to hear it. I get a nice, uh, nice round of applause afterwards, probably too. Oh dear, look what's this? O H M S. Good heavens, it's from my income tax office. Dear sir, you may not be aware of this, but a proposal has been made to pull down your local income tax offices and to erect in its place a theatre. A protest meeting will be held at 11.15 on Saturday when we hope to have your support. What a nerve. I wouldn't dream of going. P.S. Don't forget you still owe us some money. You can certainly count on my support. <laughs> now, what time does it say? 11.15? Oh, good heavens, I must hurry. It's only four doors away. <laughs> a protest meeting? Right inside, sir. You're just in time. My friends, this is indeed a most serious business. Uh, 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 if this tax office is pulled down, it will be the thin end of the week. Uh, uh, more and more tax offices will go, and less and less people will be paying income tax. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. My friends, one day income tax may become a memory of the past. But mark my words, no form of entertainment, however sordid or debased it might be, will ever take the place of the living, breathing commissioners of inland revenue. <laughs> 
to the Minister Chairman. Yeah. May I make a proposition? Oh, all depends what it is, madam. Well, <laughs> in the view of the fact that our premises are to be demolished to make way for a place of entertainment, I should like to put it to the meeting that we anticipate their scheme by ourselves supplying entertainment in income tax offices. You know, a, a sort of pay-as-you-laugh service. <laughs> or um, assessments with a smile. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, at that point I left. Quite frankly, the whole idea of entertainment in income tax offices gave me quite a lot to think about. I mean, can you imagine what it would be like to walk into your local tax office one day and be greeted by this sort of thing? Well, hello there. This is your genial host and compare, 247 oblique stroke 2984, oblique stroke 38, subsection D, saying good afternoon and welcome to the Income Tax Show. Yes, if we can bring just one smile to one little face today, then somebody slipped up somewhere. <laughs> and now, dear sir or madam, with reference to our show, I am commanded by the Commissioners of Inland Revenue to bring you Government Grant and his Whitehall Steel Band. Income tax, income tax, everybody hates income tax. People's hearts are filled with hope. Get that little puff or envelope. A married man with no family was claiming an allowance on Schedule D. He came to children, and in that place, he wrote the words, Watch this space. Income tax, income tax, everybody hates income tax. 96 is the surtax rate. So wonder everybody doesn't emigrate. Hey, oh, hey, oh. Taxmen come and I want to go home. A businessman whose name you needn't know To Paris with his secretary had to go The expense was allowed as necessary A successful trip, not a word to busy Income tax, income tax Everybody hates income tax We brought you the news that you wanted to hear In tonight's report on the fiscal year Oh, lay And now, to deal with your tax problems, here is Miss Romney Marshes. Uh, it's been a worrying week for some of you. <laughs> the particularly um, anxious blue eyes of Finchley. <laughs> no, dear, under no circumstances should you accept a present of 51% of the preferred ordinary shares, or you'll find that in no time at all he'll be giving you the business. <laughs> and now, now we turn to Lonely of the Conservative Club Moscow. <laughs> you say that since you've been out of the country, your wife's taxes have got in arrears. Tell her as nicely as you can to take them out of her ears and send them to the nearest tax office. <laughs> well, now, our last problem comes from... A Goldilocks of South Kensington. Who is actually with us today? Would you come up here, please, Goldilocks of South Kensington? Goldilocks, come along, Goldilocks, dear. Don't be bashful now. Come along. That's right. Well, I, I wish I hadn't written to you now. <laughs> My dear, we're all friends here. Now, what is your problem, Goldilocks? <laughs> well, you, you know on the income tax form there's a little box affair and it says, Do not write in this space. Yes? Well, I wrote in it. <laughs> oh, did you now? Well, um, let's have a look at what you wrote. Oh! 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 Well, I think this should be dealt with by our expert from the Treasury, Mr. Maltravers! Hello? Who called? Somebody want me? <laughs> yes, Mr. Maltravers. Perhaps you'd read this. Hey, that's putting it a bit strong, isn't it? I'd never have thought this of you, dear. I didn't write it. He did. 
Oh, well, that's all right then, Mrs. Marshes, you'd better leave this to me. Now, sir, first of all, I think I should point out that, of course, we can't possibly do what you suggest. However, <laughs> if, you feel, if you feel that we have assessed you rather harshly, then we'll give you a chance to reduce the tax payable in our new quiz game, Beat the Assessor. Oh, thank you. Now then, sir, for each question answered correctly, we halve your tax, but should you fail to answer them, then your tax is doubled, right? Right. Right. First question. What is the difference between a red plush carpet? Give reasons. <laughs> well, I, I suppose you might say that the overall effect is dependent upon... I'm sorry, sir, your time is up. Bad luck. <laughs> That's doubled your assessment, but you're still in the game. Now, question <laughs> number two. Number two, listen carefully. There is a cage 30 feet long containing a full-grown Bengal tiger. At each end of the cage, there is a hole through which the tiger can put its head. Right? The tiger runs down the cage at 30 miles an hour and sticks its head through one hole. He then runs up the cage at 40 miles per hour and sticks his head through the other hole. Then down the cage at 50 miles an hour and sticks his head through the first hole, up the cage at 60 miles an hour and sticks his head through the other. Now the question is, at what speed will the tiger be travelling when it can stick its head through both holes at once? <laughs> The uh, four no trumps. <laughs> I'm sorry, sir. You failed to beat the assessor, which means you now owe us the sum of £15,942. <laughs> but now it's the jackpot question and your chance to wipe out your entire debt by answering just one simple musical question. Right. Can we have the blindfold, please? There. That's it. Now, you can't see, can you, sir? No. Good. Then listen. Now, what tune is this and who is playing it? Soldier, soldier, won't you marry me with your musket, fife and drum? Oh, thank you, style of the Malcolm Mitchell Trier. <laughs> Soldier, won't you marry me with your musket, fife and drum? How could I marry such a pretty girl as thee when I've got no boots to put on? Oh, how can I marry such a pretty girl as thee when I've got no boots to put on? Well, up to the cobbler she did go as fast as she could run. Run! Bought him a pair of the best that were there and the soldier put them on. She bought him a pair of the best that were there and the soldier put them on. Soldier, soldier, won't you marry me with your musket, fife and drum? How could I marry such a pretty girl as thee when I got no socks to put on? How can I marry such a pretty girl as thee when I got no socks to put on? Off to the haberdasher she did go as fast as she could run. run. Bought him a pair of the best that were there and the soldier put them on. She's bought him a pair of the best that were there and the soldier put them on. Soldier, soldier, won't you marry me with your musket, fife and drum? How could I marry such a pretty girl as thee when I've got no pants to put on? How can I marry such a pretty girl as thee when I've got no pants to put on? Well, off to the tailor she did go as fast as she could run. run. Bought him a pair of the best that were there and the soldier put them on. She bought him a pair of the best that were there and the soldier put them on. Soldier, soldier, won't you marry me with your musket, fife and drum? Oh, how could I marry such a pretty girl as thee? With a wife and a baby at home. 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 Now we come to the special Kenneth Horne documentary feature, Hornorama. Yes, each week at this time, Kenneth Horne and his team of investigators will bring you a factual report on topics of immediate interest. And tonight we present a close-up on atomic power. Is it here to stay? And if so, are we? <laughs> well, now, what is atomic power? I'll just ask this policeman. 
Morning, Constable. Uh, good morning, sir. I wonder if you could help. Yes, certainly, sir. Well, now, Constable, what is atomic pump? Oh, well, now, sir, the atomic power, now, that happens to be one of my pet subjects, as you might say. Oh, splendid. Well, perhaps you'd tell us all you know. Certainly, you? certainly, Thanks. sir. On the 15th of June, I was proceeding in a southeasterly direction, a half moon, <laughs> when I perceived a motor vehicle parked on one side of the road. Thinking there was something odd about the date, I approached. Yes, 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 quite so, sir, yes. But what is atomic power? I'm coming to the answer. Well, yeah. well, I take out my notebook and I duly goes up to the owner of the aforementioned motor vehicle and I says, Hello, I say. <laughs> I suppose you're aware, sir, that this here vehicle is causing an obstruction of the other motor vehicles used in the street. Yeah, Constable, uh, very interesting indeed. But what is atomic power? It would be telling you in my own way, sir. At this point, I observed the driver of this particular vehicle was beginning to get a bit nasty about the situation. Well, now you know us London policemen. It isn't often we have to resort to the use of force and the execution of our duty, but on this occasion, I'm afraid I had to bring into operation my handcuffs and take the driver into custody. And that's why, as you can see, one handcuff is attached thus to my right wrist, and the other... Well, now he's gone. <laughs> What is atomic power? Doesn't anybody know what it is? Yes, I think I may be able to help. Here's my card. Oh, uh, thank you. Very glad to have you with us, Mr. Uh, Mr. Henry Spindlethrow of the International Atomic Research Association. Well, now, sir, perhaps you'll just briefly tell us all about it, will you? Certainly. Well, you see, uh, a formulae uh, for this in expressio of a mathematic. Would you like that? Yes, I would. Please <laughs> yes. go on on those lines. <laughs> Well, the average curriculum at the 11 or plus C gives it a half C M of E square D. <laughs> you see? Uh, and that, uh, and the basic fundamental... <laughs> a fundamental of it was the first formation of the solar system where... <laughs> exploding... <laughs> yes. Yes, I quite understand that. Now, now um, a lot of us I know, uh, I and in common with many other people, have been worried about fallout. What is your view on that? I'm glad you asked me that one. <laughs> yes. Well, where that of the mercy in the holy doom, fall out, folly and constrain it. The Porsche heard the sudden motion of venison. <laughs> now, tell me, how does, uh, how does nuclear fission come into all this? Ah, yes, yes. Well, now, there, uh, there is a real concentrale before the zeta explodes most of the escape electrodes. <laughs> See? And uh, it manifests, or shall I give you a manifest in a practical form? I think it? it would be better that way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, there you see, in the average lighter, will gradually develop its sound to a very tiny, triddly howdy lighter, which explodes it and burn away half the cigar into the throcus of the larynx of the human being. <laughs> you see? Uh, also, uh, it's going to make it simple for the housewife in a laundrette where rotating the blankie. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, mm. yes that, uh, that I can understand very easily. Now, now, sir, it has been nice of you. Nice of you to come along here today. Have you got some message that you'd like to go away with them or send over to, to mankind, really, to tell us about atomic power and the benefits that it can bring. May I do it in the words of the poem? Yes, I'd be glad if you would. Yes. Well, here am um, and where that or the average walk, I'll do Shakespeare for it again, if I may do most, where you walk or strut it on that stage, then scan the leader for your newspaper page and suffer your most for day for day. The human being put his nose to the grindstone, all will be well at form. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, now. <laughs> now that we know what atomic power is, how will it affect our everyday lives? Well, one day, undoubtedly, it'll take the place of our present heating system. George! What is it? It's getting quite cold in here. Pop out and fill up the scuttle with some more uranium. Oh, all right. I'll just chuck this last bit on the fire. <laughs> Horrible slaty stuff. <laughs> and then again, in the kitchen of the future, pride of place will go to the atomic pressure cooker. <laughs> Edith, Charles, Peter, Robin, come along.
song, Dinner's on the Ceiling. <laughs> But perhaps one of the most interesting developments will come when it's possible atomically to control the weather. Hello? Anne in Stratton? Yes. Oh, just one moment. I'll put you through to the weather controller. Weather controller? Uh, agriculture here. I say, old man, the crops in the Dorset area are getting a bit parched. Could you possibly lay on a rather heavy downpour for us? Yes, yeah, got that. Heavy downpour, Dorset area. Just a minute. <laughs> Hello, your heavy downpour will be starting in ten seconds from now. Oh, hello, Arthur. The rain come down a bit sun, didn't it? My rheumatism are an half treating me as something chronic. Ah, fair throwing it down. It is terrible weather. I don't care what they say. If you ask me, I reckon it's all these atoms that are doing it. Yes, I think it is too. Well, so much for the future. Now, what of atomic power today? Well, it's still mostly in the experimental stage. And the other day, I visited one of our principal atomic research stations. Halt! Who goes there? All right, no need for alarm. It's only me. Oh, it was me. Kenneth Horn, I'm from the BBC. No, 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 no. No, you don't understand. I'm not from workers' playtime. <laughs> I got a personal letter of introduction to the director of research. Very good, sir. You'll find him in the radioactivity room. I see. How will I recognise him? Quite easy, sir. He's the one that glows. <laughs> Thank you. Ah, uh, Kenneth Horn. Yes, that's right. Well, now, sir, perhaps you'd tell me exactly what you do here. Oh, pleasure. Well, now, uh, you see this machine here? Mm -hmm. Now, what do you think it is? What, this one? Hmm. Well, I'd say it was a super heterodonic regurgitating calculator. Oh. Uh, however did you know? It was just a shot in the dark? <laughs> How does it work? Well, first we get some plutonium, and then we get some uranium, and we mix them all together in this cyclotron, and then we turn on the gas, and before you can say Joseph Locke, we raise it to a temperature of 60,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Good gracious. What's it used for? <laughs> Making toast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now, 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 you just make yourself at home, and don't steal any secrets. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> Well, that gives you a rough idea of how they're carrying on in atomic research. But um, what of the future? Soon, perhaps, interplanetary travel will become an everyday affair, enabling the people from two different worlds to meet in friendship and universal goodwill. Perhaps even in our time, we shall see a flying saucer from another planet land in the very heart of London its passenger to be greeted with traditional British settlement. I'm very sorry, sir. You can't park that here. Now, I'm, I want your name and number. I'm, I'm not... Well, there you are. There'll be another Hornorama next week when the subject will be Coal is the Outlook Black. <laughs> also, in next week's program, we have the Norwegian Fisher Folks Ballet Company in La Vie en Rose on Toast. <laughs> Horace Tindersley performing Seal and the Mast Pipes and Drums of the Wickhampton Building Society. <laughs> so, until next week, this is Kenneth Horn saying goodbye for now. And remember, whatever you do, don't gossip about butter knives. You know how those things spread. You might have been listening to or have just missed Beyond Our Ken, a sort of radio show which gave employment to Kenneth Horne and also to Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Betty Marsden, Ron Moody, Patricia Lancaster, Stanley Unwin, the Malcolm Mitchell Trio and the BBC Review Orchestra conducted by Harry Rabinowitz. The script... Believe it or not, was written, and letters of complaint should be sent to Eric Merriman and Barry Chook. However, the onus must inevitably fall on our producer, Jake Sprague. This is
this is the BBC. You? Yeah, I believe you two have met. Oh, yes, of course. You're the chap who says this is the BBC. Yes, I am, and I'm sick of it. Uh, that was evident from the way you said it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he, he did it rather well this week. No, I don't agree. He lacked fire. Oh, I seem to me, Yes, Kenneth. I know spirit of adventure. Now, the way I do it here, you see... You don't want to know about the way you... Know. Know. Yes, well, ladies and gentlemen, whatever happens during the next 30 minutes will be beyond our ken. It's certainly beyond me. <laughs> Among those taking part are Dipsley Whydock, Humphrey Tinkerton Cox, Ecstasy Lemur, the Right Honourable Sid Dunmore... <laughs> Ori Potterton, Dame Mary Hackforth Witchett, and of course Mr. Kenneth Horne, who prefers to remain anonymous. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Kenneth Horne. <laughs> Hello and good evening. And now, first of all, here is a special message for all our listeners with baggy trousers. Belt up. <laughs> Well, now, tonight I was going to talk to you about the problems of litter, but the producer said it was a lot of rubbish. So, um, <laughs> instead, let me tell you about some of the things that happened to me last week. On Monday, I went to the annual holiday dinner of the Godalming Vegetarian and Nut Cutlet Society, <laughs> where, with a rather cunningly arranged system of subdued lighting, they were serving a main course of roast goose. <laughs> Unfortunately, they left most of the feathers on my portion, and the whole thing well, left me feeling a little down in the mouth. However, <laughs> on Wednesday, I attended the big fancy dress ball organized by the well known society hostess, Mrs. Alison Van Frump. <laughs> Everyone was there Mr. General Dunstan and his wife, Sir Henry Grunthorpe and his wife, Colonel Willoughby Blandings and somebody else's wife. <laughs> I myself danced most of the evening with Miss Penelope Hacking Smith, a rather attractive debutante. Not a reluctant one either, because <laughs> when I asked if I could take her home, she immediately agreed, so I took her home. Thursday, her parents came round and asked for her back. <laughs> Friday, I spent a rather dull day at home because the television had been repaired. <laughs> but on Saturday morning, I decided to do a spot of shopping. I had to get a wedding present for a friend of mine, so I popped into our local department store, Fortnite and Peabody. <laughs> Good morning, sir. Can I be of some assistance? Well, you see, my name is Kenneth Horn. Oh, I don't think we can help you there. No, 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 no. You don't understand. I'm uh, I'm looking for a wedding person. Oh, well, there's plenty to see. I'll show you around the store. Oh, thank you very much. By the way, are you the manager? Oh, no, sir. I'm the store detective. Oh, really? How interesting. Yeah, do you find there's much uh, pilfering these days? Oh, I should say so. Do you know at our branch at Croydon last week we lost 43 umbrellas, two plastic sausage cozies, and a fluorescent cummerbund? Really? Sure. Worst case of theft was at our branch at East Grinstead. Really? What was missing? Our branch at East Grinstead. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that's what I call shoplifting, eh? <laughs> 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 oh, dear. Well, there's our music and record department. A lot of people are giving records as gifts, you know. Yes, that might be an idea, too. <laughs> man, dig that crazy beat. These cats. Are the most crazy man, crazy. I'll take that one, Daddy O. Very, very unusual. What an extraordinary chap. Oh, not really, sir. The bishop comes in here quite often. <laughs> Now, sir, I'll leave you to browse around, sir. I'll, I'll just attend to this young lady. Yes, I've got a better idea. You browse around and I'll attend to the young lady. <laughs> <laughs> and good heavens, it's Patricia Lancaster. <laughs> what are you doing here? Well, I'm looking through some music for the show. What do you think of this one, Ken? Well, it's got a very pretty cover, but I'm afraid I don't know it. Oh, well, if only orchestra here, I'd sing it for you now. Would you? Yes. Well, hold on a moment. Mr. Grimble, mm -hmm. do, you, do you happen to have such a thing as an orchestra on the premises? Oh, funny you should ask me a thing like that. Yes, as a matter of fact, we have. It's our musical festival week, and we happen to have the entire BBC Review Orchestra here. Forward, Mr. Rabinowitz, please. Well, good heavens, this is an incredible coincidence. It really is. <laughs> I'm afraid it's going to look as if the whole thing had been planned. <laughs> Oh, well, never mind. Sing, Pat. I'm not at all 
in love, not at all in love, not I, not a bit, not a mite, though I'll admit he's quite a hunky guy, but he is not my cup of tea, not my cup of tea, not he, not an ounce, not a pinch, he's just an inch too short of himself for me. Well, of course, I've noticed that manly physique and that look in his eye. And I'm sure he can cut most any man down to his size. He must be as fierce as the tiger when he's there. And I bet he cries like a little boy when he's sad. But I... Not at all in love, not I, not a straw, not a hen. I don't care if he's as strong as a lion or if he has the rest of you crying. You may be sold, but this girl ain't buying. I'm not. Thank you, Pat. Jolly nice, too. Well, now, sir, we haven't solved our wedding present problem, have we? <laughs> I've got it. Our china department. Over here, sir. I thought with the very thing. Uh, uh, just get it down, will you? Uh, there. It's this week's special offer. A charming contemporary dinner service comprised... Look out! Look out! Oh, look out! Oh. Three hundred and sixty-five pieces. <laughs> Three sixty-five. What happens if it's leap year? Thank you. <laughs> Rather than an early leap year this year, isn't it? But um, I don't think I'll take it. Um... <laughs> I say, um, what about this? Oh, that's uh, well. Of course, we do sell a lot, but not generally as wedding presents. Oh. <laughs> I must say you don't often see them with roses round them. Well, that's true, sir. And, of course, this particular model is rather unique. How do you mean? Well, listen. And charming. I think I'll take that. Very good, sir. I'm sure your friends will be delighted with this novel musical beer tankard. <laughs> Ten guineas, please, sir. Ten guineas? Oh, yes. Genuine dress from China. Oh, why is it stamped a present from Bogner? Oh, just a printer's error. Oh, I see. <laughs> anyway, that reminds me, I, I haven't fixed my holidays yet. Oh, why not visit our happy holiday travel bureau? Just ask for Mr. Ratchet. I will. <laughs> Mr. Ratchet? Yeah. I'm uh, thinking of going on holiday. Got a splendid idea. Well, now, can we interest you in one of our special seven-day lightning coach tours of the continent? Seven countries in seven days, including a free film show on the last day to show you where we've been. <laughs> no, I don't think so, thank you. It doesn't appeal, sir. Oh, very well. And how about Spain? Dark, mysterious, intriguing, romantic, exotic, pulsating, and dirt. <laughs> no, I'm afraid not. Well, never mind. Well, look, I, that that poster there, that looks an attractive place. Yeah. I like the feeling of the of the hot sun beating down on the white stucco walls and that 
glorious stretch of golden sand sweeping down to a cobalt sea with the white-sailed yachts dancing on the water. Yeah, back and head. <laughs> I've gone off it. Well, look, Sally, let's approach this thing sensibly. There's a globe of the world over there. Why don't you just go over and sort yourself out? And when you made up your mind, come back and I'll be happy to make you a visit. Good idea. Right. Some people. Two different worlds. <laughs> Hello. Yes, happy holiday travel, Bureau. Yes, August bank holiday. Right. Yes, two second-class day returns to South End. Yes. Thank you, Sir Bernard. Good day. <laughs> Ah, so is that. Yes, I'm sorry to be a nuisance, but have you got another globe? Oh, no. I'm sorry, I just can't decide. Can't you possibly suggest where I should go? I could, sir. We don't run trips, sir. <laughs> now, look, uh, how about shuddering sand? Oh, is that a good resort? Oh, it's more of a last resort. <laughs> Here's their brochure. Read it for yourself. Good day. Good day. Shuddering sands. Well, now, let's see what it says. Hello there, holiday makers. So you've decided on shuddering sands for a sunshine holiday. Here are some of the attractions which will make your holiday the one you'll never forget. The Candy Floss Works Brass Band will, as usual, attract many people to the beach. They'll be playing every day in the park. <laughs> Music of a different nature is provided with the afternoon concerts of classical works in the tea gardens. A wit on the council has described this event as tea and symphony. <laughs> and I hope he wasn't re-elected. <laughs> One special feature this year is the human bird man who takes off from the tower twice nightly and can be seen flying around the west coast, if windy, the east coast. <laughs> Finally, there is our concert party at the end of the pier. Yes, there they are again, not only by popular demand, but also because they've been cut off by the tide since last year. <laughs> yes, your visit to Shattering Sands is not complete. Without seeing the sequinettes. Oh, no, I can't possibly read any more about shuddering sands. And as for the sequinettes, well, I haven't actually seen them, but can't you just imagine what that little show is like? It's time to say hello and welcome to the show. It's time for introductions to be made. We'd like you all to know. Frinton entertaining you with puppetry and dancing and, of course, a song or two. And I am Elsie Blossom. I'm known as Soubrette. I do a bit of everything, and I'm not married yet. <laughs> I'm, of course, the baritone. My name is Stanton Hope. You've probably all seen me doing ads for toilet soap. You get a little luckier each day. <laughs> Of television fame. No, don't look at your programs. It's my heart remain. I'm Piggy Fox, the comic. Some people say a star. If you like the jokes I tell, you'll find me in the bar. We've introduced ourselves now. That seems to be the lot. Now, wait a minute, everyone. There's someone we forgot. Yes, of course, it's our producer, manager, and star, ladies and gentlemen, Headley Clangmore. Now, boys and girls, after that spot of fun, it's time to introduce you to our baritone, Stanton Hope. And good evening. I've uh, I've chosen first to sing a very popular ballad of yesteryear, The May Tree. Thank you. <laughs> In my garden grew, as pretty as can be, there were little pink blossoms in her hair. But lonely and sad was she. She pined for a nearby oak tree. She never knew the bliss of being held in the oak tree's boughs or the thrill of an oak tree's kiss. <laughs> the winds of March came blowing and blew with such a force that the oak tree was nearly uprooted but the May tree stood firm of the cards. <laughs> she sturdily held the oak tree, her branches held him fast, and when later I saw the oak and May, I knew it was love at love. 
two young trees are married now. <laughs> and I'd like you all to know Mayflowers bloom from the old oak tree and the May tree bears mistletoe. <laughs> Well, all good things must come to an end. We do hope that if you liked our little show, you'll tell all your friends about it. And if you didn't keep your trap shut. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, though, don't forget a complete change of program on Tuesdays and Thursdays. <laughs> and our next show is program number 35. So if you're ready, boys and girls, this is the sequence signing off. Oh, has it been a lovely evening? We hope you've had a lovely time. We've tried to do our best with some very guests. And now we say farewell in rhyme. It's really getting it for feelings now. The time has come for us to go. We will not say bonsoir, but yay, au revoir. We'll be seeing you again. So I decided to go to Bunn. <laughs> For one thing, the standard of entertainment is much higher. I mean, this year, you can hear, for example, our very own Malcolm Mitchell trio, who are here now to play Blue Tail Fun. Jimmy Crack on, and I don't care. Jimmy Crack on, and I don't care. Jimmy Crack on, and I don't care. My master's gone away. When I was young, I used to wait. On my master and give him his plate And pass the bottle when he got dry And brush away the blue tail fly Jimmy Crack on and I don't care Jimmy Crack on and I don't care Jimmy Crack on and I don't care My master's gone away One day he ride around the farm the flies so numerous they did swarm. One chance to bite him in the thigh. The devil take the blue tail fly. Jimmy Crack on, but I don't care. Jimmy Crack on, but I don't care. Jimmy Crack on, but I don't care. My master's gone away. The pony run, he jumped, he pitched, he threw my master in the ditch. He died, and the jury wondered why. The verdict was. A blue tail fly. They lay him under a cinnamon tree. His epitaph is there to see. Beneath this stone I'm forced to lie. The victim of the blue tail fly. Jimmy Crack on, but I don't care. Jimmy Crack on, but I don't care. Jimmy Crack on, and I don't care. My master's gone away. The victim of the blue tail fly. Welcome to the special Kenneth Horn documentary feature, Hornorama. Yes, each week at this time, Kenneth Horn and his team of investigators will bring you a factual report on topics of immediate interest. And tonight, we present a close-up on books, what the public are reading. They ought to be ashamed of themselves. <laughs> well, to start our inquiry, I paid a visit to a little bookshop just off the Charing Cross Road and pushing my way through a crowd of elderly gentlemen busy copying down phone numbers from the advertisements outside, <laughs> I went in and spoke to the proprietor. Oh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Now, what sort of books do you sell here? No, I'm not a policeman, are you? Certainly <laughs> not, no. Oh, uh, well, in that case, they've got all sorts of books, you know. Fiction, adventure, travel, biography, all sorts. Yes, but which do you sell most of? Those in the plain wrappers. 
Now, let's see. Mind you, last week I did sell 400 copies of Tolstoy's War and Peace. Did you, my Joe? Yes, of course, I had to put a different cover on it, you know. <laughs> nice bit of stuff she wants, too. <laughs> oh, you'll have to excuse me. Here's another customer. My dear sir, this book you sold me last week, The Bad Woman of Tunbridge Wells, is absolutely disgusting. I've never read anything quite so sordid in the whole of my life. Uh, have you got the sequel? <laughs> <laughs> certainly, sir. Here it is. Son of the bad woman of Tunbridge Wells. <laughs> so much for the bookshops. On the other hand, for the really discriminating reader, there is, of course, the government stationery office. Oh, hello. Of course, we've got something for everyone here. Who could fail to be absolutely fascinated by some of our recent publications? Uh, for instance, take oxyacetylene welding for beginners. Hmm? <laughs> oh, it's such fun. All you need is a cylinder of oxygen and a pair of sunglasses, and you can play for hours. Well, now I've read that. It's too exciting. Oh, no. <laughs> no. But you know, my favorite is our latest, a real bestseller. Yes, it is. It's the survey by the Commissioners of Inland Revenue on the incidence of monetary transference within the Allied companies of the heavy duty steel wire string and blast Trans Corporation of Hamel Hempstead. Yes. Well, that's fascinating. <laughs> It's one long, merry romp, you know. <laughs> and it's written by the same team that gave you glass blowing for the over 80. Oh, <laughs> yes, but now, uh, what of the public reading? Well, the only reliable source is the public library, and our reporter Cecil Snaith is waiting for us now outside one of London's leading libraries. <laughs> Well, I'm standing here now, just outside the main entrance of this very great centre of learning. Here, books can be obtained on any subject you care to mention. It has, in fact, the most comprehensive collection of books to be found anywhere in the world. In a few moments, I'm going inside to talk to the chief librarian, Miss Parkinson, who has been in charge here for a great many years and is acknowledged to be one of the most foremost experts on literature. Where better then to find out exactly about reading uh, and the habits of the public? I'm, uh, I'm going inside now. Uh, oh, there is Miss Parkinson, now at the far end of the shelves. Uh, Miss Parkinson, I wonder if you could... Shh! Oh. <laughs> With that, we return you to the studio. <laughs> Thank you, Cecil Snaith, one of our most brilliant commentators. And now... And now let's turn from the people who read to the people who write, the authors. Well, being an author isn't always easy. Often it takes months of tedious preparation and ceaseless hard work to produce the finished novel. But what a wonderful feeling of achievement when that moment is finally reached. And no wonder that the author wishes to share his moment of triumph with a close friend. Thank goodness it's finished at last. Come in. Oh, Rodney, how good of you to come. <laughs> I wouldn't miss this moment for anything, Charles. Sir, <laughs> <laughs> well, you finally finished the book. Yes. Oh, Rodney, I can't tell you how glad I am it's all over. Was it beastly? <laughs> <laughs> no, I... Dear, the agony I went through with this one. Plot wouldn't come right. Characterizations eluded me. There were days when I just could not write a word. But now, at last, it's done. Read it to me, Charles. Very well. <laughs> <laughs> Cuddly Bunny popped his little pink nose out of the web of him. <laughs> Good morning, world, he said. <laughs> Turning now to crime, we immediately think of that celebrated authoress, Agatha Trist, <laughs> who, with some 450 books, 27 plays, and three or four films to her credit, is undoubtedly a unique phenomenon in the literary world. Unique, perhaps, because Agatha Trist herself is a rather genteel, middle-aged lady of simple taste who lives in the seclusion of a quiet house in the country. The other day, one of our reporters went down to take tea 
Thank you, Jenkins. That will be all. Very good, madam. <laughs> now, now, Mr. Marshall, how many lumps for you? Two, please, thank you. Now, Miss Trist, how did you first become interested in the subject of crime? Well, 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 well you see, it's such a fascinating subject. I don't think anyone can fail to be interested in the play of human emotions involved in crime and its solution. You see, I look upon each of my little tastes as a challenge to be met. Well, you certainly succeeded. I suppose it is really quite difficult to be constantly thinking of new situations and methods of murder. Well, well, well of course, I am experimenting all the time. For instance, your tea. <laughs> uh, I, I beg your pardon? Oh, it, it's quite a new poison. My husband discovered it in India. What? You, you, you mean that... You, you mean, uh, 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 oh. You rang, madam? <laughs> yes, Jenkins. Put this gentleman in the gun room with the others. Very good, madam. Oh, oh, and Jenkins. Yes, madam. Show in the book critic from the Radio Times. <laughs> So much for the books of today, but what of the future? Well, the trend is towards talking books, the putting on record of the classics of literature. Soon, perhaps, we will no longer read our favourite books, but settle down in the evenings and listen to them on gramophone records. Do not muse at me, my most worthy friend. I have a strange infirmity, which is nothing to those that know me. Come, love and health. Whoa. Man, dig that crazy Whoa. reading. This yeah. cat is the most. Go, man, go. <laughs> well, there you are. This is Kenneth Horn saying goodbye for now and leaving you with this thought. Is it better to have loved a short girl than never to have loved at all? <laughs> Why have you been listening to or have just missed Beyond Our Ken, a sort of recorded radio show which gave employment to Kenneth Horne and also to Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Betty Marsden, Ron Moody, Patricia Lancaster, the Malcolm Mitchell Trio and the BBC Review Orchestra conducted by Harry Rabinowitz. The script, believe it or not, was written and letters of complaint should be sent to Eric Merriman and Barry Took. However, the onus must inevitably fall on our producer, Jake Sprague. <laughs> Did you? Well, I didn't intend to get a laugh. Well, the fine attitude you take on a comedy show is either in what you say, it's the way you say it. I'll show you. Ron? Yes? Yeah. Here, show this gentleman how to get a laugh by saying, This is the BBC. This is the BBC. There you are, you see? You've got a laugh. 
Yes, I know, but I am an announcer. Well, no comment. Well, all right. <laughs> we'll just stand there and announce the program. Oh, I mean, you know, we'll oh, dear. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, whatever happens during the next 30 minutes will certainly be beyond our care. Among those taking part are Senor Alfredo Rodriguez Hemingway, Bert Fitch, Noel Hartington Wainscott, Hilary Boot, the Honorable Priscilla Gormsdyk, Rear Admiral Pike, and of course Mr. Kenneth Horne, who prefers to remain anonymous. Ladies and gentlemen, Kenneth Horne. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to Beyond Our Care. Now, first of all, I have a special message for shipping. Will all ships expected in the Thames estuary next Thursday afternoon please proceed with the utmost care? I'm going paddling. <laughs> well, now, tonight I was going to talk to you about the domestic habits of the lesser spotted nighthawk. But having had a closer look at the domestic habits of the lesser spotted nighthawk, I thought we'd better leave that sort of thing to the Sunday papers, so... <laughs> instead, let me tell you about a rather unusual dinner I attended last Wednesday, given by the League of Physicians, Doctors, and Surgeons. We started off with a plate of peridioxycarbotetrachlorate, jocularly referred to as brown Windsor soup. <laughs> However, the next course was Supreme de l'Université College Outpatients Department Francaise. <laughs> Or in English, cottage hospital pie. <laughs> for, for sweets, we all enjoyed steamed golden pudding smothered in a delightful syrup, which turned out to be Dr. Fosdyke's lightning cough cure. <laughs> and then the eminent surgeon, the eminent surgeon, Dr. Scalpel Fippingham Forceps, told us some of the very amusing things that happened to him on the way to the theatre. <laughs> All in all, I had a splendid evening on Wednesday, and I haven't eaten so well for a long time. Thursday, I went to the doctor. <laughs> Friday, I felt much better, and it turned out to be quite an eventful day. As usual, I had breakfast in the time. Can I clear away now, sir? Oh, I say, Prudence. Yes, sir? Just look at this desk. I can write my name in the dust. Oh, sir, I wish I was educated like you. <laughs> well, whip a duster over it when you've got the moment, will you? By the way, Prudence, what's the time? It's just nine o'clock, sir. Oh, is it? I'll just switch on. I mustn't miss Housewives' Choice. Hello, housewives, and what a lovely sunny morning it is. Just put those old pots and pans away for a while as you listen to your very own programme. And good morning first to Kenneth Horne of Kensington. I hope you're listening because here is the record you asked for. Oh, at last I've been waiting for weeks. <laughs> oh, bother. Hello. Hello, Ken. This is Hugh Paddock here. I said, you know they're playing your record on Housewives. Yes, I know they are. I happen to be listening just now. It's yes, unusual well, for me because I never listen to the program. Well, thank you, Hugh. For some yes. reason, I switched on this morning. When I heard your well, name mentioned, very I nice something up and let you know just in case you hadn't had the wireless on and you might have missed it. Yes, yes, thank you. But I hope you don't mind my ringing. No, you. certainly not. I, I, I must ring off now. I'm trying to listen to the wireless. Goodbye. Oh, oh not again. Oh, dear. Hello. Hello, Ken. This is Ken. <laughs> Confusing, isn't it? <laughs> I live there, boy. Am I right to suppose it's actually you who asked the teddy bear picnic on my right choice? Yes, that's right. <laughs> oh, frankly, oh, I'm surprised. I mean, after all, <laughs> the teddy bear picnic. <laughs> Well, what's the matter with it? Oh, nothing really, I suppose, if you like that sort of thing. I mean, if it had been me, I would have asked for something much more artistically satisfying, like I'm a pink toothbrush. Yes, yes. <laughs> Well, thanks for phoning. I, I really must go now. Oh, sorry, Madam Keep. Sure, sure to go. Oh, bother. My record seems to have finished. Now I shall have to request it again. Now, oh, where's my pen? Ah, now then, here we are. Perhaps you may remember. Oh, here's another one. Yes, it was me. I did request it. I like the teddy bear's picnic. I'm asking for it again. And who is this? It's Patricia. Oh, Patricia Lancaster. (laughs) 
Sorry to be so rude, Pat. Now, what can I do for you? Well, Ken, I just boned about my song for the show. Oh, I say, I've got an idea. Why don't you do the teddy bear's picnic? <laughs> well, I'd love to, Ken, but I've already chosen my song. It's called, I'm Gonna Ring the Bell Tonight. Well, that's an even better idea. How does it go again? Like this. <laughs> I don't care what I did last night or the night before that and the night before that too. I'm gonna ring the bell tonight. I'm gonna ring the bell tonight. That's what I'm gonna do. I'm a glow and I'm feeling so happy. New Year's Eve. Lost my heart if that's the clue. I'm gonna ring the bell tonight. I'm gonna ring the bell tonight. That's what I'm gonna do. And when the moon takes five minutes Intermission, I'll be wishing the intermission through. Here's to you, here's to me, and here's to my life that's merry. I've just got to whoop de I'm gonna ring the bell tonight, I'm gonna ring the bell tonight. That's what I'm gonna do. When you're in love, the feeling's fancy. Your heart is happy, your feet are dancing. You're in a state that's done near trancy. It's almost Good to be true. I don't care what I did last night or the night before that and the night before that too. I'm gonna ring the bell tonight. I'm gonna ring the bell tonight. That's what I'm gonna do. And when the moon takes five minutes intermission, I'll be wishing the intermission through. Here's to you, here's to me, and here's to a life that's merry. I just got to whoop de do. I'm gonna ring the bell tonight. I'm gonna ring the bell tonight. Gonna ring the bell Thank you, Pat. That was lovely. And came over the phone well, too. Goodbye. Oh, uh, excuse me, sir. There's a gentleman to see you. Shall I show him in? Yes, of course. In here, sir, please. Uh, oh, good morning, Mr. Horn. My name is Duncan Warrington Barker, D-I-G-B-B-C-O. All right, you don't know how to spell it. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, in a few weeks' time, we're starting something entirely new in radio. Oh, this is something quite revolutionary for the BBC. It's a panel game. Oh, no, not another one. Ah, but this one's completely different. Gilbert Harding won't be in it. I see. <laughs> and now, Mr. Horn, we would like you to be the chairman. Oh, thank you. Now, the idea is this. It's a symposium of questions from an invited audience answered by a team of experts. And, I may add, we have devised a rather witty little title. Oh, really? What's that? We're calling it a symposium of questions from an invited audience answered by a team of experts. Oh, that's <laughs> Very catchy, very apropos, isn't it? Yes. All right, I'll do it. Oh, good. Now, the first broadcast is coming from the old barn, little twittering box. Right, well, I'll be there. Uh, oh, sir, uh, by the way, excuse me, uh, a bit embarrassing question. Do you happen to have any influence with the housewives and children? Oh, Mr. Forsett. Here, there's something going on in the old barn. Ah, there generally is this time of the evening. No, no. Be they BBC fellers with some new fangled panel game. Why don't you come along? Tis free. Uh, all right, I will. I say, would you mind keeping that cow quiet? Now. Now, quiet everybody, please. Thank you. This is the BBC, and welcome to Little Twittery. Tonight, tonight our panel consists of first, at the top of the table, philosopher, poet, and writer, Bertrand Bussell. Yes, good evening. And next to him, charming and talented actress Eunice Gaysmile. Hello. Next, our expert on local government, chairman of several committees, and prospective parliamentary candidate for the Goodwin Sands. <laughs> Mr. George Simcox. Hello, all. <laughs> Finally, the well-known countryman and author, Arthur Fallowfield. <laughs> right? 
Right, well, now that's our panel. And now we're ready for the first question, which comes from... Uh, Timothy Hatt. I should like to ask the team, do they agree that the current high rate of super tax discourages incentive, and does it reverse the profit-output ratio, thus creating a retrogressive movement in regard to the production of non-essentials? And a very good question, too. <laughs> does the team think... Uh, what the gentleman said. Russell? <laughs> Russell? Uh, uh, well, he's no good asking me. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I haven't painted that yet. <laughs> I mean, uh, when I was at Cambridge, I did a thesis once on the subject, and we really came to the conclusion that, economically speaking, that, uh, well, he's no good asking me. I just don't know. <laughs> no. Now, Miss Casemile, uh, would you care to elaborate on that? Well, darling, I think the question had something to do with money, and, of course, I'm all for it. But when it comes to the question of tax, I'm afraid I can't give any advice because, frankly, darling, I just don't pay any. <laughs> oh, what have I said? <laughs> George uh, Simcox, perhaps you can contribute something. Well, I've had a lot of experience on finance committees, and we used to have a saying in the old council chambers, money talks. And that's true, you know, money does talk. Of course, all it ever says to me is goodbye. <laughs> Well done, Simcox. <laughs> and so you should be. <laughs> now, Fallowfield. Fallowfield, what's the countryman's view of all this? Well, I think the answer lies in the soil. <laughs> what do we simple country folk know about super tax anyway? We like to live a plain, honest-to-goodness, down-to-earth life. As I said to my chauffeur this morning, <laughs> Phil Potts, I said, to the glorious day, drive me down to the country. I don't think you can do it. Thank you, Arthur, very much. Thank you. Well, the team seems to be agreed on that point. Uh, next question. Oh, I'd like to ask a question. Well, just a minute, sir, just a minute. I think this lady was first. My name is Mrs. Florence Fox. Well, never mind, dear. Yeah? I'm very worried about my teenage daughter. Does the team think that young girls nowadays are given too much freedom? Sim Cox, we'll give this question to you. I'd rather have the teenage daughter. <laughs> yes, right. Now, Eunice, Eunice? Well, darling, I do understand this problem because I played the part of a mother with this same problem in a recent play. And it was one torment after another. My billing wasn't right. The dressing room was appalled. <laughs> and my dear, as for the leading man, well, he didn't seem to get the hang of his part at all. Absolutely no sense of character. But, you know, surely that was the play you did with Alec Guinness. Yes, that's right. Whatever became of him? <laughs> now, Arthur, Arthur, what have you got to say about uh, teenagers? Oh, good luck to them, that's what I say. <laughs> it's no good, you know, you can't fight nature. It's all harmless fun, anyway. I'm sure Miss Gaysmile would agree with me. There's no harm in a bit of kissing and cuddling now and then. Now, is there, you need? No, darling, none at all. Good, then I'll see you afterwards. <laughs> I think we should hear from Bustle on this now, Bertrand. Get this chicken off my lap. Oh, it's an egg. Bustle, Bustle, please. Bustle, pay attention, please. Now, do you think that teenage girls are given too much freedom? Well, I think I can answer this one. Uh, you see, as a man of the world, I, I feel that it is all... But there have been certain situations in which, uh, how shall I put it, I, I do feel qualified in saying it. I, I make this statement in all sincerity. Uh, well, I, I remember once, uh, uh, what was the question again? Are teenage girls given too much freedom? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> and on that note, we'll say goodbye from the panel, George Simcox. I do Eunice Gaysmile. Night, night, darling. Arthur Fallowfield. Happy plowing. And Bertrand Bustle. It was just new at asking me. I mean, I, no, I haven't the faintest idea. Was, uh... <laughs> and with that, ladies and gentlemen, we return you to the studio. <laughs> and we're just in time to hear music for milking provided by the Malcolm Mitchell Trio. <laughs> Well, I've sung this song.
song, but I'll sing it again Of the people I've met and the places I've been Of some of the troubles that bothered my mind And a lot of good people that I've left behind So long, it's been good to know you So long, it's been good to know you So long, it's been good to know you What a long time since I've been home And I gotta be drifting along I walked down the street to the grocery store It was crowded with people, both rich and both poor I asked the man how his butter was sold He said, one pound a pile for two pounds a gallon I said, so long, it's been good to know you So long, it's been good to know you So long, it's been good to know you What a long time since I've been home Gotta be drifting along So long, it's been good to know you So long, it's been good to know you So long, it's been good to know you What a long time since I've been home And I gotta be drifting along Gotta be drifting along I've got to be drifting along. And now we come to the special Kenneth Horn documentary feature, Hornorama. Yes, each week at this time, Kenneth Horne and his team of investigators bring you a factual report on topics of interest. And tonight, we present Sketchbook for 1908. The pages of our sketchbook are turned by Mr. Kenneth Horne, suave, debonair, a man about five foot ten in his stocking feet. 1908, a great year for stocking feet. 1908, a bad year for shoe polish. <laughs> How well I remember that year. Nobody asked you. 1908, a year that had gaiety, charm, elegance, and 12 calendar months. Yet they don't make years like that any longer. <laughs> a year of achievements. Come on, be a sport. All right, little old man, I will go away with you. How well I remember that year. <laughs> 1908. First, let's take a look at the ordinary man. Revolting, wasn't it? <laughs> now let's turn to something... That's right, go on, turn your back on the ordinary man. The time is coming! The hour is at hand! The work is at Amazing. About time, too, lazy devil. <laughs> 1908. How well I remember that. Oh, a glittering decade. And at the fashionable hunt balls, the cream of society gathered. Glittering and decayed. Lady Caroline, that's hottish with a trifle hottish. <laughs> yeah. Indeed it was, Lieutenant. I wonder if it's any cooler out on the veranda. Much. <laughs> uh, Lady Caroline. Oh, it's no use, Reggie. You know our love can never be. After all, you are only a third lieutenant, and Daddy is Colonel of the Regiment. Oh, don't let that worry you. I'm not a snob. Oh, Caroline. Oh, Reggie. Ah, unhand my daughter. Oh, Colonel Smellingham Phipps. <laughs> Sir, I do hope you're not thinking of holding Lady Caroline against me. You were doing all right on your own. <laughs> Caroline, return to the ball. Now, you, sir, who are you? Lieutenant Marshbank, sir. Marshbank? Yes, Marshbank? Uh, Her name is Miss Miller. I, <laughs> I seem to remember a tiger Marshbanks. 
once drank four Mayfair clubs dry and threw a policeman into the serpentine. Any relation? My mother, sir. <laughs> Yes, a best fine woman. Well, we'll forget this incident, Marshbanks. Let's return to the ball. Good heavens, sir. It's gone. Gone? Good, you're right. I say, can we have our ball back? <laughs> Nineteen hundred and eight. How well I remember that year. A year of conquest in the air. Yes, on a day in May, several English aviators were drifting silently into the sky. In balloons. It was, in fact, the international balloon race. I, 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 think, I, I think I'm gaining on them. I, I'll throw out the sandbag, and up we go. Now, another sandbag, and up, and up... Another one, higher, another one. Oh, higher, higher, higher. Oh, what a wonderful sensation it is floating along with the breeze. Rising, dipping, rising, dipping. Oh, it gives a man something. What say you, Caldicott? 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 Caldicott! <laughs> Funny, I could have sworn it was a sandbag. <laughs> But it wasn't only in aviation that progress was being made. In America, uh, Mr. Henry Ford had already developed the prototype of his new family motor car. Oh, Martha, come on out here. Land sakes, Elmer, what in the world is that? That's a motor car, Martha. And this year, gentleman is Mr. Henry Ford. He designed it and built it. Glad to know you, ma'am. This here is my new design for a family car, and I'd be mighty obliged if you and your family would take the first ride in it and kind of try it out. Oh, well, gosh, Mr. Ford, we'd just love to. I'll call the family. Matt, Joe, Bill, Gwendoline, Sylvia, Geraldine, Frank, Ezra, Penelope, Mortimer, Hank, Shirley, Alma, Jr. Come on, kids, we're going for a ride with Mr. Henry Ford. Oh, uh, that's everyone, Mr. Ford. I guess we're all on board. Oh, gee, gosh, isn't that exciting? Theatres are booming. At the Shaftesbury, a fashionable throng flocked to see Lim Chittagong and Madge Wellington Boot, and, and they gasped at the audacity of their new play, The Unbuttoned Glove. <laughs> it achieved worldwide fame. The newspapers in New York had this to say. The Unbuttoned Glove is sensational. Never before has the theatre experienced such a thrill with this play that begins where the others leave off. It will hold you, grip you, move you, enthrall you. Yes, it's a story of lust, hate, greed, envy, sex, violence, and corruption. And in London, the Times said... Diverting theater. <laughs> but of course, to the ordinary man in the streets, the music hall reigned supreme. Ooh, we must make money. Went a lot further in them days. For a shilling, you could have a real good night out, mate. Three-course dinner, seat at the old home, music hall, plate of whelks, a pair of boots with two whiskers, and a couple of Adley's Guide to the Turf, mate. All for a shilling? Yes, I've still got some souvenirs of them happy times. Have a whelk. Thank you. <laughs> yes, Sue will never forget the old home. Greatest music hall of them all. Now, alas, still open. <laughs> Here is a typical program of 1908. Ada Vest, stereo. Mortimer Chandwit, rope dancer. Conrad Heppington, impersonator. 
Phyllis and Enid Suave. Fun with the Cobra. <laughs> and many others contortionists. <laughs> but perhaps best loved of But perhaps best loved of all was the lovable Harry Biggs, as he used to sing this lovable song. <laughs> We must apologize for the quality of the recording, <laughs> which, of course, is very old. But in case you missed one or two of the words, we have with us in the studio the lovable Harry Biggs himself. Now, Mr. Biggs, would you sing that song for us now? Yes, 1908 was indeed a year of melody. <laughs> and, of course, in these modern days of American musicals, one soon forgets the days when British musical comedy was on top. And the hit show of 1908 was undoubtedly The Boys Are Back, which starred a young, vivacious personality, Miss Cicely Drawbridge. <laughs> no one who ever saw the show will forget her singing this song. Ron Moody, Patricia Lancaster, the Melton Mitchell Trio, and the BBC Review Orchestra, conducted by Harry Rabinowitz. The script, believe it or not, was written, and letters of complaint should be sent to Eric Merriman and Barry Shaw. <laughs> However, the onus must inevitably fall on our producer, Jake Brown.
This is the BBC. Here, here, hello. Oh, yeah. good gracious, it's you again. Well, what is it this week? Well, you know, you know, you say this is a BBC. Yeah. How do you know it is? Well, it's written down on this script. No, you don't want to believe everything you see in the script. There's a lot of lies. I mean, you can't go Look, on Look, I'm not a bit interested in the script. Well, neither am I, really, but the money's good, isn't it? I mean, that's why I feel a little bit pleased today, reckon. Oh, yeah, dear. Ladies and gentlemen, whatever happens during the next 30 minutes will certainly be beyond our care. Among those taking part are Beulah Stukley, Sutherland Fitzroy Prim, the Honourable Amelia Working Fitzmolton, Harry Rabinowitz... Oh, but that's no real name. <laughs> Mervyn Linseed, R.A., Lance Corporal Herbert Potts, and, of course, Mr. Kenneth Horne, who prefers to remain anonymous. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Kenneth Horne. <laughs> Hello, good evening, and first of all, here's a special message to all golfers. See ya. Well, now, tonight I was going to talk to you about the Colorado beetle problem, but since the Colorado beetle has no problems, except with other Colorado beetles, <laughs> let me instead tell you about some of the things that happened to me last week. On Monday, I went down to Henley-on-Thames for the Association of Misers and Skin Flints Water Carnival and Regatta. Unfortunately, it had to be cancelled because none of the members was prepared to push the boat out. <laughs> And so I popped along to the British Tire Manufacturer's annual blower. <laughs> Left me feeling rather tired. However, on, on Tuesday, I enjoyed an afternoon of Shakespeare at the new open-air theatre in Tufnell Park, where they are doing Julius Caesar in traditional Roman dress, if wet, in gumboots and sou'westers. <laughs> On Thursday, I paid a visit to the Airman History Roof to meet some meteorologists, or as they are sometimes called, liars. <laughs> I spoke to one prominent weather forecaster who's been forecasting prominent weather for many years, and he told me exactly how it was done. Apparently, every morning they send up a balloon to which is attached a pail, or to give it its technical designation, a little bucket. <laughs> And if it comes back with water in, they know it's been raining. <laughs> Friday, Friday, I think, was my busiest day. In the morning, my first call was to my barbers for a short back and, oh, dear, you have let it go, sir. <laughs> anyway, he was in his usual jocular mood. <laughs> <laughs> and in this act was turned to the producer and said, No, it's in the other room. <laughs> <laughs> you can use that one if you like. Of course, you'd have to clean it up a bit. Give it a shampoo, you might say. Yes, you might. If you were feeling a bit off colour. <laughs> oh, I say, sir, you've got a mole on your neck. Have I really? Yes, you have. Go on, shoot, get up. Go on. Good. <laughs> They, uh, they come in from the river, you know, sir. <laughs> oh, well, there we are, sir. No, a spot of brilliant tea, sir. No, thank you. A little spray, sir. No, thank you. How about a little French polish, sir? No, I don't think so. <laughs> Anything else you wanted, sir? All right for razor blades, toothpaste, shaving cream? No, thank you. Good gracious, look at the time I must fly. Wings, sir? <laughs> <laughs> I shall have to hurry. I'll be late for my singing lesson. <laughs> You know him. It's Kenneth Horn. I'll just put this cotton wool in my ear. Good morning, Professor. Oh, hello. There's Pat Lancaster. <laughs> what on earth are you doing here, Pat? You certainly don't need singing lessons. No, well, can I? I just like to keep in trim. Well, I'll give you the address of my barber. Um, by the way, what are you going to sing on the show this week? A song from Expresso Bond. It's called. Go on, sing it for me now, Pat. All right. 
Yesterday's life was an unpaid laundry bill, a tattered billboard, and yesterday's cry. Suddenly there are flowers on the windowsill. I could sing like a lark in my pie. Ring up the curtain. I'm almost I'm almost sure I am in love, in love, in love. At least it feels like love. I'm all at sea, and then I hear your voice again, and the sudden Pat, see you on Tuesday. Goodbye. Well, Professor, we better get on with my lesson. All right, Mr. Holmes, here is your cotton wool. Thank you. Love it is all that is in love. It is lovely. Oh, if you go down in the woods today, you're sure of a big That's enough. surprise. Oh, no, Peter. Danke. You... Whoa. No. If you... Yeah. 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 Mr. Horn, why must you persist this is thinking? Isn't there already enough trouble in the world? <laughs> I'll have you know I'm quite highly regarded in musical and artistic circles. In fact, this very evening I've been invited to a little soiree. There'll be verse reading, a spot of music, and afterwards they're serving food and drink. It's a sort of uh, soiree with a binge on top. <laughs> Oh, dear, I'm sorry about that. Come on. <laughs> now, where did I put that invitation? Ah, here it is. Mrs. Olga Cremorne requests the pleasure of Mr. Kenneth Holmes' company at a meeting of the Muswell Hill Cosmopolitan Society of Musical Appreciation. Verse reading, dramatic recitative, and billiards. <laughs> Flat 3A, Curl You Mansions at 7, P.S. Please bring a bottle. It gets rather chilly at this time of year. Well, I must say I'm looking forward to an evening of music and culture. Sounds as if it might be rather unusual. Ah, here we are. Girl, you mentioned. I'll just ring the doorbell. Mrs. Olga, come on. No, I'm the butler. 
No, I mean, I mean, does Mrs. Olga Cremorne live here? Next door. <laughs> Oh, it must be here, then. Oh, Mr. Kenneth Horn, how nice of you to come. Just leave your shooting stick and plastic mac in the hall. <laughs> if you can find room. But I'm afraid it's terribly crowded with all this furniture. As a matter of fact, my friends call me the hostess with the mostest in the hall. <laughs> well, now, now, everyone's in there. Oh, I wonder if you'd mind taking this tray of cocktail snacks in for me. Certainly, I'll be delighted. I say, everyone, grub up! <laughs> oh, terrible. I don't know who you are, sir, but I think it's a positive disgrace to burst in like that in the middle of the exquisite leg of Miss Hopflitch and her ensemble. We must at all costs preserve the refined and dignified atmosphere of this select gathering. You come charging in here with a tray of food. <laughs> <laughs> And up the end of it! Oh, you stabbed my hand with a sausage stick. Now, what you doing with that fool? Oh, God, you do love a girl. Here, leave some for me. Oh, this tastes a bit peculiar. Madam, you're eating my carnation. <laughs> well, I'm glad to see you haven't wasted anything. Oh, who's for this last sausage roll? No. <laughs> Delicious. Lovely. <laughs> oh, I'm glad you two are getting to know each other. Oh, incidentally, Mr. Horn, this is Mr. Humphrey Borum's sister. Oh, how do you do? Yes, you're Kenneth Horn, are you? Uh, I heard your radio show last week. I must say, I found it dull, insipid, inordinately unfunny, and completely lacking in good taste. I'm glad you liked it. <laughs> what exactly do you do? I, sir, am a poet. Yes. Yes, I specialize in poems on London. Much of my work has been written about the town. About time they washed some of it off. Ah. <laughs> quiet, everyone, quiet, quiet. Now we're going to be entertained by Miss Marjorie Hockflitch herself with a delightful cello solo. <laughs> Excuse me, miss, uh, would you care to dance? Well, I'd love to, but I'm afraid I can't. Not while I'm playing the cello. <laughs> Mr. Horn, Mr. Horn, why don't you sit down? What a good idea. I can't see anywhere to sit. Oh, yes, yes, there is. Look, look here behind you. This contemporary wicker work chair. It's the latest thing, you know. Oh, yes. Oh, you know, I thought it was a dog basket. How silly of me. Well, I'll just... Uh, I'll just... <laughs> You're right, you're right. It is the dog basket. No, no. Oh, come along, Pinky. Pinky, dear, Pinky. Let go of the gentleman's leg, Pinky. Oh, dear, you see, he's a playful little fellow. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Come along, Pinky Poo. Time for walkie poos. Come along now. Come along. Oh, off you go. Oh, oh good evening, madam. Are you the owner of car number 309 GMC? No, no. I, I expect it's one of my guests. Oh, do come in. Quiet, everyone. I'm looking for the owner of car number 309 GMC. Oh, that's mine, officer. The coupe, dance. Yes. With the coffee and cream bodywork. That's right. And the dusty pink seat covers. Yes. Simply heaven. Yes. <laughs> Wherever did you get them? I just adore that cute upholstery. Oh, the whole thing's quite a picture. Oh. <laughs> oh, do you really think so? Oh, yes. Yeah. But if I may venture to criticize, there's just one little thing wrong. Oh, really? What's that? Got to leave the lights on. Oh, oh, I'm terribly sorry, Constable. Well, I hope it won't happen again because the lights may cut a difference, you know. <laughs> Given the whole thing a sort of a glare. <laughs> Everything all right, Constable? Oh, yes, thank you, madam. I'll just get it. Oh, don't go, don't go. Stay and join in the fun. Oh, may I? Oh, of course. Make yourself at home. You'll find the punch bowl over there. Oh, thank you. Oh. <laughs> 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 it's a bit nippy at first, but it's 
looks lovely once you're in. <laughs> and now, friends, we've got a big surprise for you. Elton Croft will sing some of his folk songs. Oh, hello, hello. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, here are just a few of the many old English folk songs that I have collected from such eminent authorities as Alan Lomax, Cecil Sharp and Benny Hill. And I'd like you all to join in on the Fol Lol Lars. Right, here we go. Said Adam to Eve in the garden of old, Tis like a taste of heaven. The fun begins at half past eight, and leaves off at eleven <laughs> with a full and a lol and a la 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 and a hey down merry down day the cotton mill workers were oppressed their lives were filled with gloom for they had to raise their hands on high if they wanted to leave the loom <laughs> with a fall and a lull and a la 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 and a hey down merry shh shh quiet everybody please oh there it is again quick quick now everybody round the table is there anybody there <laughs> Who are you? Bert Gormstike. <laughs> Have you a message yes, to tell us? Yes. What is it then? Built up. <laughs> I'm trying to get to sleep up here. I'm on night work here. I'll be caught up in it. What can we do? It's the man upstairs. He's always complaining. Oh, never mind. Never mind. On with the party. Well, I think it's high time I contributed something to this evening's entertainment. I happen to have brought my tennis saxophone with me, and I'd like to play it for you now. First, may I give you a night on, on the Bear Mountain by Tsubulka. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, good night, Mrs. Cremorne. I think I'd be going now. <laughs> Sorry to rush off. I've just remembered I've left the kettle on. Good night. Mustache now. Great fun. See you again soon. Good night. Uh, it's been wonderful. Punch was absolutely delicious. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Extraordinary thing. Everybody seems to have gone suddenly. <laughs> Oh, wait a minute, there's one person left. Obviously, he's the only real music lover in the whole crowd. I, I say, sir, I do hope you enjoyed my little offering. Hey, hey, what did you say? I can't hear a word of change. Speak up on you, man. It's a little bit hard of hearing. Speak up, young man. <laughs> well, there, there you are. If that's a musical circle, then I'm glad I'm a square. But not too much of a square to enjoy the music of the Malcolm Mitchell trio as they play The Lonesome Traveler. Traveling, traveling, I've been a traveling on. I am a lonesome. I am a lonesome traveler, I am a weary and a lonesome traveler, I am a weary and a lonesome traveler, I've been a traveling long. I travel here and then I travel yonder well, I travel here and then I travel yonder well, I travel here and then I travel yonder well, I've been a traveling long. I travel cold and then I travel hungry well. I travel cold and then I travel hungry well. I travel cold and then I travel hungry well. I've been a traveling on. Traveled in the mountain, traveled down in the valley well. I traveled in the mountain, traveled down in the valley well. I traveled in the mountain, traveled down in the valley well. I've been a traveling on. Travel with the rich and travel with the poor. Well, I travel with the rich and travel with the poor. Well, I'm gonna travel it all. One of these days I'm gonna stop all my traveling. One of these days I'm gonna stop all my traveling. One of these days I'm gonna stop all my traveling
documentary feature, Pornorama. Yes, each week at this time, Kenneth Horn and his team of investigators will bring you a factual report on topics of immediate interest. And tonight, we present a close-up on art. Do we really understand it? Well, this, this painting quite beyond me. I, I just don't know what it's supposed to be at all. I mean... Uh, looks like one terrible hodgepodge of messy colours. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Imagine waking up one morning and finding that staring at you in the face. What a ghastly picture. And that was the man who painted it. <laughs> yes, art is a confusing subject, but even if we can't understand it, there's no stopping our thirst for knowledge. Just go along to any of our leading art galleries and see for yourself the eager throng of true art lovers. And over here we have a selection of old masters. Quite superb, magnificent. Yeah. Look at this one here. Isn't that exquisite? The Mona Lisa. Magnificent. Mona Lisa. No, no. Mona's the right name for her. Look at her, eh? Oh, look at her. Picture of me for her, Yeah. That's what you look like when I come home late at night. <laughs> yeah, of course, this is only a reproduction. The original is in the Louvre. This place for it, if you ask me. <laughs> well, I mean to say, I mean, they appreciate that sort of thing in Paris. Uh, no, this one here is a Renoir. Is it? Looks like a woman in a feather hat to me. <laughs> Renoir was the artist, you know, he specialised in these gaily dressed Parisian women. Did he? Mm. Well, he's a bit of a lad him, wasn't he? <laughs> hey? Now, then, this one's much more my cup of tea. Very lifelike, I must say. Two lovers snogging on a park bench. You are looking out of the window. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dozy me. <laughs> that brings us to the end of our conducted tour. Thank you so much. It's been delightful. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> of course, it is usual. It is customary to... Uh, hey. uh, Oh, 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 uh, oh, yes, yes, sorry. Oh. Uh, there you are, then. Uh, Many thanks. Turn on. Thank you, sir. I haven't seen one of these little silver property bits since before the war. <laughs> yes, well, I've enjoyed going round with you, too, and uh, I'd like you to accept this. Ah, thank you, sir. Uh, not at all. I, I say it must be pretty awful for you to have to cope with people like that. Oh, no, sir. It's not every day we are honoured by a visit from Sir Gerald and Lady Kelly. <laughs> Well, now we turn to the artists themselves, for whenever artists meet, you can be sure of a lively and stimulating conversation on art. Let us now listen to two such artists as they discuss their work. Well, Rodney, what do you think of it? Charles, I think it's superb. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You do, rather. Such depth and perception. <laughs> And you've, you've managed to catch the full inner significance of your subject. I particularly like the delicate undertones, the powerful imposter, the fusion of neorealism with the post-impressionist feeling. <laughs> I'm terribly glad you like it. Like it? My dear Charles, I think it's quite the best thing you've ever done. And I do sincerely hope it doesn't rain, get washed off the pavement. <laughs> Now we're going to have a look at another aspect of this fascinating subject, and one that rather appeals to me. Artists' models. A lot of words are busy about that. Yes, sir. Uh, we mustn't forget the debt the painter owes to those hard-working girls who spend many long hours, well, how shall I put it, sir? Uh, sitting pretty. <laughs> oh, 
dear, wash it off the pavement. I like that. <laughs> anyway, let's let's take a quick peep inside a studio in Chelsea. Oh, oh a bigger one. <laughs> Yes, the world of art has many facets, but of course, to get the real atmosphere of that bohemian life on which the true artist thrives, one has to go to Paris. So I went. Ah, oh, how nice it is to be in Paris again. I'll just sit down here at this sidewalk cafe and have a glass of wine. <laughs> Shocking service here. Yeah? Waiter! Oh, how silly of me. Um, Garçon! I say you! You and me, monsieur. Yes, I've been sitting out here at this table for ages. You call this a sidewalk cafe? Certainly not, monsieur. This is our furniture. We have been evicted. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh, bad luck. It must be a French prime minister. <laughs> Ah, here we are, Montmartre, the artist quarter, the home of surrealist painting. Monsieur, a word in your eye. Ah, modern painter. <laughs> oui, monsieur, please take a look at my latest painting. I'm most unhappy about it. Oh, what seems, what seems to be the trouble? It is the nose, monsieur. I'm terribly worried about the nose. Oh, why don't you just change it? Change it? I cannot find it. <laughs> Yes, this is the Montmartre of today. A rather different one from the Montmartre of the 90s, gay, vital, and outrageous. I can see it all now. Hello, Marie. I haven't seen you for some time. Eh? Well, I have been out of town posing for Renoir. And uh, now there is a real gentleman, uh, different from that Van Gogh. He is a peasant. Ah, but it is nice to see you again, is it? And you know something? This is my first visit to the Mulan Rouge. Oh, how do you like it, eh? Oh, it is marvelous. It is so gay and exciting and... Ooh, what is that under the table? Don't worry, Sherry. It is only Toulouse Lautrec. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Paris was and still is the mecca of art. And a real art lover can always find something to interest him wherever he looks. You know, postcards, the lovely no, postcards. No, no, yes, one here. No. Yes, look at this one. No. Yes, very nice. Oh, that one, that one is rather nice. Yes, yeah, yeah. I think so. Well, yeah. This is Kenneth Horne saying goodbye for now and leaving you with this thought. If a man keeps 500 pounds under his pillow, is it enough to retire on? Good night. <laughs>You have either been listening to or have just missed Beyond Our Ken, a sort of recorded radio show which gave employment to Kenneth Horne and also to Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Betty Marsden, Ron Moody, Patricia Lancaster, the Malcolm Mitchell Trio and the BBC Review Orchestra conducted by Harry Rabinowitz. The script, believe it or not, was written and letters of complaint should be sent to Eric Merriman and Barry Took. However, the owners must inevitably fall on our producer, Jake Sprout. <laughs>
Is the BBC... Yeah, I say, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, not I sure again. Hello. What is it? It's very good of you to give up all your spare time to come and say it. Well, I'm paid for it. What? <laughs> paid for it? Thank for saying that. Oh, that's window, isn't it? But this isn't all I do, you know. I also read the news. Well, there's nothing in that. Oh, really? I'd like to hear you say things like, Mr. Tramby Croft was, of course, a preeminent connoisseur of universal antiquity, specialising in the Baroque, Rococo, Pre-Raphaelite and Byzantine period. Ah, well, that's easy. Oh, go on, you say it. Listen. Mr. Tramby Croft was, of course, a preeminent connoisseur of universal antiquities, speculating in cocoa, Edinburgh Rock, <laughs> and fresh paper No, it's all right, all right, then you better go on and announce it. It's all wrong, really, though, I should... Thank you very much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, whatever happens during the next 30 minutes will certainly be beyond our care. Among those taking part are the Honourable Charles Cobweb, Deirdre Popplejoy, Councillor Ulysses Grift, Sir Frisbee de Nosh, Grace Golightly, the Maharaja of Huddersfield, and of course Mr. Kenneth Horne, who prefers to remain anonymous. Ladies and gentlemen, Kenneth Horne. <laughs> Hello, good evening, and first of all, here's a word for all French waiters. Garçon. <laughs> well, now, tonight I was going to talk to you about drilling for oil, but I thought you might find it rather boring. So, instead, let me tell you about some of the things that happened to me last week. On Monday, I paid a visit to a sausage rehabilitation centre in Wiltshire, and it really was most interesting to see how they make both ends meet. However, on Tuesday, I was invited to stay with a friend of mine in the country. It's a, a charming house, which, to quote the estate agent, was a nice unfair semi debt vill, two-minute tube, three-bed, two-recept, mod kit, k h w h and k <laughs> Actually, it's a, it's a 12-room, Tudor mansion on the main London to Brighton line, and I, I must say it's a magnificent place. In fact, there's only one snag. My friend has to leave the front and back doors open to let the trains go through. <laughs> Still, he's got a copy of the timetable, and everything works out quite well, providing there's no alterations in the schedule. Then it becomes a trifle awkward. For instance, on Thursday morning, just as I started my porridge, the 8.15 came by a little earlier than usual. Eventually, I finished up having my toast and marmalade at Victoria Station. <laughs> However, it did get me to town nice and early, which was just as well, because I had to go and deliver my weekly article, which I'm writing for a woman's magazine. Their offices were somewhere in Fleet Street. I say, excuse me, uh, uh, could you direct me to Fleet Street, please? Yes, yeah, certainly, Governor. Now, let me think, Fleet Street, uh, that's right here somewhere. Cool. Yeah, I don't know where it is. I've worked here long enough. Fleet Street, um, uh, no, I, I think you go down that road. No, 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 wait, I'm a liar. No, you don't, no, uh. Oh, come on, I know London like the back of my hand. Uh, uh, hold on a minute. Now, um, uh, excuse me, please. Uh, I couldn't help overhearing. Fleet Street is down this road and first on the left. Who asked you, bloody <laughs> <little bit> foreigners? <laughs> Stick a bloody nose in everywhere now, then, uh, sir. Fleet Street. Well, uh, quite honestly, if I was you, I'd take a taxi. Yes, I think that's like better. A uh, cab, sir? Just over here, sir. Now then, where to, sir? Uh, Fleet Street. Right, sir. <laughs> I said, driver, where are we now? South Mims, sir. <laughs> South Mims? That's in the middle of Hertfordshire. Yes, sir. Pretty county, isn't it? Yeah, but it's miles away from Fleet Street. I know, sir, but, well, it was such a lovely day. Oh, well, this is preposterous. It's an outrage. Get there as quickly as you can. It's disgusting. I've never heard anything like it. Right to my MP about this, dear Bessie. Oh. <laughs> How, how dare the driver take such liberties? What do we stop for now? Well, sir, I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to leave my cab. Oh, why? Can't stand people talking about me behind my back. <laughs> but, driver, you can't possibly leave me out here right in the middle of the... <laughs> 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 Thank you very much indeed. I can't help that, sir. Now then, how'd you get? Oh, very well. What a nerve. Still, with one consolation, he forgot to collect his fare. That'll be 37 and 6, sir. 
Oh, this is too bad. All right, there you are. No tip? Oh, I don't know. Some people got a burglar's arm on their dust. <laughs> Now what on earth am I going to do? I say, can I give you a lift into town? Oh, that's awfully kind of you. I have rather been left standard. Well, jump in. I say, you don't mind if we have the old wireless on, do you? Well, it's all I should enjoy it. The part of the spirit of Robin Marshes was played by Norman Shelley and not by Shirley Bassey. <laughs> first heard on October the 24th, 1804. <laughs> and now it's time to listen to the delightful voice of Patricia Lancaster. Well, there's a coincidence. I wonder what she's going to sing and if she's thinking of me. I've chosen to sing this week, Love. Oh, good. Mother, when I'm near you and I hear Speak my name softly in my ear. You breathe a flame. Father, when we're dancing, keep on glancing in my eyes. Till love's own entrancing music dies. All of my future is in you. Your every plan I design. Promise you'll always continue. When your tender fears depart Lover, I surrender to my heart Lover, when I need you And I hear you speak my name Softly in my ear you breathe a flame Lover, it's immoral But why quarrel without me? I say the devil is in you, and to resist you I try, but if you didn't continue, I would die. Please be tender when your tender ears depart, lover, I surrender to my heart, I surrender. This is as far as I can take you. Oh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Well, Fleet Street at last. Good heavens, and by some strange coincidence, could only happen on sound radio. I'm right outside the offices I want. Now, this is it. Tittle Tattle. Jolly good name for a woman's magazine. Oh, good morning. I'd like to see the editor, please. I'm a contributor. The name is Kenneth Horn. Uh, the editor is expecting you. Go straight in. Sure. How are you, Mr. Horn? <laughs> oh, well, at last we meet. <laughs> I must say, you don't look a bit like a beauty expert. <laughs> Their appearances are deceptive, aren't they? I mean, I'm a rug of blue. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we are. Anyway, we do appreciate your articles. We all think they are simply scrumptious. And our women readers just love your beauty hints and all those little wrinkles you give them. <laughs> yes, we all went mad about that little gem in last week's article. Oh, really? Which was that? Oh, you know, if you're worried about your crow's feet, wear shoes. <laughs> ah, that is what I call a beauty hint. <laughs> I'm so glad you like them. As a matter of fact, in this article, I've had rather a novel idea for women's hats. Oh, do tell. Well, uh... The idea is to decorate them with real live birds. Oh, what a dreamy notion. What's the idea behind it? Well, it's very simple. If the hats aren't paid for, they fly back to the shop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bliss. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, I, I'll stand here gossiping all day. I've got a magazine to edit. By the way, here's an advanced copy of this week's issue. Thanks for calling. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Well, I'm glad I've a copy of Tickle Tattle. It'll give us something to read on the train. Tickle Tattle. Well, there seems to be something for everyone here. Now, what's this on page three? Here are some old mints for the old Andy man by Timber Bunch. Well... This week, I'm going to show you how to make two orange boxes out of an old wardrobe. <laughs> I'll read that later. Now then, page seven. Knitting. This week, we're going to knit something really exciting. Angora braces. <laughs> and you'll have ample wool for this if you just unravel last week's little failure. <laughs> well, seems reasonable. You know, this magazine is most enlightening. Here's society gossip, for instance. Now, what does it say? While Sir Willoughby and Lady Clamouring were guarding jewellery in their bedroom, thieves broke in downstairs and watched television. <laughs> Page 10, cookery. A lot of my readers find difficulty in telling the difference between mushrooms and toadstools. Well, it's quite easy. You simply cut them up and use them to garnish the steak. Then eat the meal and go to bed and don't worry. If you wake up in the morning, they're mushrooms. <laughs> now, now here's, here's something new to do with pineapple chunks. One evening, if you haven't got much to do and you're rather bored, why not try putting the pieces together again? <laughs> I'm going to try that sometime. Now, now, here's the serial story. And as usual, it starts on page 24, is continued on 62 and 73, part of page 97, and eventually comes to its breathless conclusion at the foot of column 6, just under the corset advertisement. <laughs> the Fitzroy's of Belgravia by Greaves Carton. The story so far. Handsome, bronzed, pipe-smoking Roger Shallowley was trapped in the ornamental garden of a plastic novelty factory in Wembley, <laughs> surrounded by a tribe of man-eating cannibals. You'll be glad to learn he did not escape. Meanwhile, tall, rugged, grim-featured, gum-chewing Cynthia Chuff was taking tea with the Fitzroys at their elegant house in Belgravia. Now, read on. <gasps> oh, Peter, what's happened to us? She murmured with trembling emotion. <laughs> Nothing, darling. He whispered passionately as he grasped the thin, shot silk of her umbrella. Why do you ask? He added. <laughs> Cynthia turned her pale, delicate face towards him. Because you've been seen with another woman. She said accusingly. Peter was unaffected. He'd been to a council school. <laughs> Purposefully, he knocked out his pipe on Lady Dunkley Fitzroy, and taking Cynthia Chuff into his strong, manly arms, he spoke. Darling. He stammered. Sorry. Um. Da -da -da, darling. That's better. <laughs> he stammered. <laughs> I'm so all alone, wouldn't you? Suddenly his past swelled up before him. He remembered he'd been an escaped convict. And for the second time in his life, he didn't finish the sentence. <laughs> Just then, old Soames Fitzroy leapt up from his upper chair. <laughs> he muttered. <laughs> Put a drawing pin on my chair. He continued. <laughs> Was it you, Alicia? No, Grandpapa. She reposted. Nor I. Quipped young, bespectacled Lucas Fitzroy. It was me what done it. Confessed a passing gypsy. <laughs> you ruined my father, Soames Fitzroy. He ejaculated. But now, revenge is mine. And with a crack of the whip, galloped off into the shrubbery. <laughs> Suddenly, the door of the grandfather clock swung open, and out stepped a complete stranger. So you've come at last. Snarled old Soames Fitzroy. And the stranger noticed that he was holding a revolver. What are you going to do? Queried the stranger. <laughs> Answered the revolver. <laughs> 
Grandpapa, what have you done? Piped little Alicia Fitzroy. Old Soames put down the gun, smiled reflectively, and turning to the assembled company, he said proudly, I've just shot the author. <laughs> And not a moment too soon, if you ask me, said burly, broad-shouldered Kenneth Horn as he stepped up to the tall, slim microphone and announced the instrument-playing, song-singing, applause-getting Malcolm Mitchell Trier. Well, the fox went out on a chase one night, prayed to the moon to give him light. He had many a mile to go that night before he reached the town, oh, town, oh, town, oh. Many a mile to go that night before he reached the town, oh. Many a mile to go that night before he reached the town, oh. He ran till he came to a great big pen. The ducks and geese were kept therein. He said, a couple of you gonna grease my chin before I leave this town, oh, town, oh, town, oh. A couple of you gonna grease my chin before I leave this town, oh. A couple of you gonna be smashing before I leave this town, oh. He grabbed the grey goose by the neck, throw the duck across his back, and he didn't mind with the crack, 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 and the legs all dangling down, oh. Down, oh. Down, oh. He didn't mind with the crack, 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 and the legs all dangling down, oh. He didn't mind with the crack, 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 and the legs all dangling down, oh. Old mother flipper flapper jumped out of bed. Out of the window she popped her head, crying, John, John, the the gray goose is gone and the fox is on the town, oh, town, oh, town, oh. John, John, the gray goose is gone and the fox is on the town, oh. John, John, the gray goose is gone and the fox is on the town, oh. The fox, he came to his own den. There were the little ones, eight, nine, ten, crying, Daddy, you better go back again, because it must be a mighty fine town, oh. Town, oh, town, oh. Daddy, you better go back again, because it must be a mighty fine town, oh. Daddy, you better go back again, because it must be a mighty fine town, oh. The fox and his wife, without any strike, cut up the goose with a carving knife, oh. They never had such a supper in the life, and the little ones chewed on the bones, oh. Bones, oh. Bones, oh. They never had such a supper in the life, and the little ones chewed on the bones, oh. They never had such a supper in their lives. And the little ones gobbled up the bones. And now we come to the special Kenneth Horn documentary feature, Hornorama. Yes, each week at this time, Kenneth Horn and his team of investigators bring you a factual report on topics of immediate interest. And tonight, we present a close-up on the English. What are they really like? Do we still lead the world? Are we a first-class part? What of the people? Is the Englishman really reserved? How do we fare today? Can we sell more abroad? Are there too many traditions? What of our national heritage? And is there still time to do this feature? Yes. Good. <laughs> well, now, what is a typical Englishman? There is one quality that's inherent in us all. Imperturbability in the face of the unexpected. Take, for instance, the case of the flying saucer, which landed in the back garden of a typical suburban household. Ada? Yes, sir? Kettle's boiling. <laughs> All right, I'll see to it. Oh, oh, there's something strange in the back garden. What is it? I don't know. It's a peculiar looking thing with a great big shiny dome. Oh, Lord, it's Kenneth Horn again. <laughs> oh, don't be silly. It's one of them things I've been reading about in the papers. The flying saucer. Oh, don't be daft, Aid. Oh, 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 the lift opening. There's a little green man getting out. Hello. Like a cup of tea? <laughs> oh. oh, you must have had a long journey. Boing, boing, boing. Boing, 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 boing. Look, I think he's a foreigner. <laughs> Oh, 
Why do leave me alone? I'm busy. Just fancy, your little lady is probably the first person ever to talk to a man from Mars. Hey, how many times have I got to tell you not to keep worrying me when I'm writing a letter? Now then, where was I? Yes, sir. This morning I heard the first cuckoo. I just put the <laughs> And it isn't only at home that the English remain calm and dignified. Abroad, their behaviour serves as an example to the more excitable foreigner, particularly at the casino. Vingt-un, rouge, ampère. Zut, hello, sacré bleu, I've lost all my money. What am I to do? This is terrible. Why did I not pack the bed? Oh, this is not my night at all. How foolish of me ever to come to this wretched casino. All my money. Whereas the English, I say, Charles. <laughs> yes, what? Were you on the red? Yes. You lost the red? Yes. Much? <laughs> Everything. 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 Bad luck. <laughs> uh, these things happen. What are you going to do? Oh. <laughs> There's a seat there if anyone wants to. <laughs> so much for the English on holiday, but what are the English at work? Let's take a look at that much maligned individual, the British workman. Oh, uh, well, uh, uh, mate, uh, let's have another crack at it. Uh, you... Me, you, me, you, me, you, me. Uh, oh, just once more. Oh, uh, it's got the condensed milk open. Uh, for a nice cup of tea. <laughs> However, after a hard day's work, the Englishman is always glad to return to his loved one. Or even sometimes to go home. <laughs> for it has been truly said that the Englishman's home is his castle. Emily, I'm home. Oh, well, so there you are. Hello, dear. I bought you a nice bunch of flowers. Oh, don't you talk to me. What a day I've had. The kids have been playing up. The laundry hasn't come home. The sink's blocked up. And now to crown it all, you stand there with a bunch of flowers in your hands. You're drunk! <laughs> and, of course, when he is not at home, where does the Englishman seek not at home? Where does the Englishman seek not at home? Where does the Englishman seek not at home? Where does the Englishman seek refuge? Well, in his favourite club. Now, one of the most famous London clubs is, of course, the Agamemnon Club in Pall Mall. And at this very moment, we're going over to join our commentator, Cecil Snaith, who is waiting outside. Yes, I'm standing now on the steps of this ancient and historic club, which, as you may know, was founded in 1711 by a group of distinguished artists, writers, and politicians. Today, it boasts one of the most exclusive memberships of any club in the world. And on almost any evening, one can find gathered together here the most brilliant figures of our time. During the last few minutes, a number of celebrities have arrived, whom we hope to be having a word with in a few moments. And now the time has come to join the great company assembled inside. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Sir, are you a member, sir? Uh, no, I'm from the BBC. that we return you to the studio. (laughs) 
Thank you, Cecil Smith. And now let us turn from clubs to the people who spend a large part of their lives in hotels. Is this your first time at the Majestic? Yes, as a matter of fact, it is. I thought you were new here. Of course, I've been here for many years now. Well, personally, I prefer the Grand. Oh, well, it isn't what it used to be. When I was there, I can remember as many as 50 titled people staying at the same time. But in the last few years, it's come down rather badly. Oh, well, anyway, this place will suit me for the season, and then I think I shall move on. It's all right for you, young fellows. I'm quite happy here. I sort of got used to the old place. Still, I like you, young man. I'm sure we shall get on very well together. Oh, there's the gong for dinner. There it is. I suppose we'd better go in. Is it always as crowded as this? Yes, I'm afraid so, but you'll get used to it. Wait, Paul. Coming, madam. <laughs> yes, what a proud people we are. And in summing up the English, we must undoubtedly point to those outstanding qualities that every Englishman possesses. Dignity and courage in the face of danger. British prisoners... The camp commandants hereby decree that in future all British officers shall work. British officers work? You must be mad. Very well, Colonel. If you do not work, you will be shot. Ah, that's more like it. This is Kenneth Horne saying goodbye for now and leaving you with this thought, which is for all married women. Would you agree that husbands at the breakfast table are generally behind the time? Good night. <laughs>
off and mold and bit of plate, dear. Off and mold coming up. <laughs> Same, same, same again, beautiful. Have one for yourself. Bit noisy in here today. It's the same every day, sir. Those two come in on the dot of 11.30 when we open, and by midday they're all in that state. Oh, you're so sweet, 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 s
That's quite, quite correct. Now, how old would you say it was? Uh, Thirty-five years. <laughs> How old? Thirty-five years. What yes. about trying another? Oh, no, thank you. I've had quite enough. I, I, I think I'd better be running along. Oh, sir, sir. <laughs> just, just before you go... No, could... I can't wait. <laughs> A recent report by the Forestry Commission expressed concern about the possible shortages of wood in the near future. Well, I suppose we're inclined to forget those who toil ceaselessly in the great forests. Those burly, broad-shouldered giants. <laughs> the lumberjacks. Hello, Rodney. Hello, Charles. <laughs> well, it's my turn to shout timber. No, it's not. It's mine. But you shouted timber last time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> whose axe is it? Mm. <laughs> All right. Honestly, we always seem to be at loggerheads. But it's... <laughs> you, Rodican, case of blow you, lumberjack, I'm all right. Well, I'm sorry, Butch. <laughs> no, it's the work. Apology. Well, thank you. It, it's the work. It's the work that's getting me down. Look, it's piling up. You know I dare. So I just can't see the wood for the trees. <laughs> Oh, no, you mustn't get to get you down, Robbers. Be a stout cellar. Cellar? Ah! <laughs> Come on, we'd better fell this next tree. I'll tell you what. <laughs> <laughs> tell you what, I'll let you shout, Tim. Oh! <laughs> oh, thanks a million, Charles. Here goes, then. Mm -hmm. Timber! Look out, Charles! Charles! Ah! Charles! Charles, where are you? Are you, are you all right? Yes, I'm here, Robert. I tell you one thing. What's that? I've been well and truly lumbered. <laughs> Brings us to our panel of experts who are waiting to discuss this week's searching question. Top of the table, the man to whom a funny thing happened, Hanky Flower. Yes, oh, you say that again, eh? No, no, very nasty it was too. No, you see, I was on the way here as usual, you see, on the way here as usual. I just got off a bike and this car, no, this car, you see, came, came whizzing along, you know. No, it did, you see. No, here. Yes, nearly knocked me flying. Oh, no, only just missed me, you know. And the driver didn't stop. Oh, did you get his number? No, but I'd know that laugh anywhere. <laughs> All right, now, next our... Next our pop star who has set off a new wave of livid mania, Ricky Livid. Hello, I'm now. <laughs> uh, happy to tell you I've just recorded a follow-up number to I Want to Hold Your Hand. What's it called? You want to hold your nose. <laughs> and I'm sure it'll sell to high heaven. All right, sir. <laughs> Once again, we meet the lady with the overloaded pantry, Fanny Haddock. Hello again, my darlings. And I found yet another thing to do with fish. <laughs> I got these gorgeous bits of fish, smothered them in a sort of pancake batter, poured whiskey over them, and set them alight. And the result was delicious. I call them crepe soles. <laughs> and finally, our rustic philosopher, Arthur Fallowfield. Well, I don't mind telling you, I'm very lucky to be here this week. I am. Um, the other day, I was trotting round the farm on my prize horse, Sir Galarad, when, when suddenly he shied and threw me off, and I landed right on the mango wurzels. Well, yes, thank you very much, Arthur. Come on out. That's our panel of experts, and this week's searching question from a listener is, would the team rather have lived in the olden days or the present time? Hanky Flower. Ah, well, I don't think there's any doubt about it. No, I mean, you can't beat the elegance and charm of yesteryear. No, I mean, when the ladies wore crinolines and frills and furbelows. Most of them furbelow where they should be. <laughs> <laughs> and... 
And what do you think Ricky Livy? Uh, yeah, well, <clears throat> I, I think I'll go for the modern days. I mean, you, you look at all the wonderful things we got now, what I didn't have then. Cars, electricity, television, me. <laughs> uh, and what about all them songs they had? Come into the garden mold. And somewhere my love lies sleeping. I mean, you, you, you couldn't do the shake to that, could you? <laughs> and what about the gear the birds used to wear in them days? Well, I mean... You didn't know what you was getting. <laughs> yeah, all them bustles. <laughs> no, I didn't like the backing. Now, Fanny Haddock, what's your opinion? Oh, oh, my darling, give me the old days every time. Well, you should remember them anyway. <laughs> Mind. Would you let me continue, dear Kenneth? I mean, food was really food then. A great big boar. Uh, mind you, I got... <laughs> mind you, I've got one of those at home now. A brace of pheasants, <laughs> game pie, haunch, venison, sucking pig, roast goose, plum pudding, and good English ale. You couldn't have a finer breakfast. <laughs> And with meals like that, you could have any number of courses. I should have think you'd have had to let them out. Courses, not courses. <laughs> all right now, all right now, Fallowfield. Well, oh, as a matter of fact, no, seriously, I do agree with Fanny. I mean, give me the good old lusty, rum days. Look at Henry VIII. I mean, he had the right idea. Always chopping and changing he was. <laughs> and I make no bones about it. I'm looking for someone to love. I mean, you know, somewhere there must be someone right for me. I mean, I'm not bad looking. No. <laughs> I mean, I'm clean around the house. <laughs> I'm not frightened of hard work. I'm quite a good conversationalist. And, of course, when it comes yes, thank to... thank you very much. <laughs> Well, that's all for now, and here's one good reason for living in the present day, the Fraser Hayes Fall. We've got something to tell you, so please don't give it a miss. We're going to tell you what's on our mind, what we really want to say is this. It's a lovely day today, so what have you got to do? You got a lovely day to do it in that sea. And I hope whatever you've got to do is something that to be done by two. For I really like to stay. It's a lovely day today. So whatever you've got to do, I'd be so happy to be doing it with you. But if you've got something that must be done, and it can So to our drama of the week, and this week we bring you a true story more fantastic than any science fiction. A story so horrific that if any children are listening, we suggest they send their parents out of the room. <laughs> Here then is the terrifying story of... <laughs> the Horrible Thing on the Isle of Wight. <laughs> I have to tell you, it was pretty ghastly. 
My name, by the way, is Sir Hector Garstairs Thunkerton. That's pretty ghastly for a start. The story began one day last summer when an urgent telephone call was put through to Whitehall. It was Saturday. However, on Monday morning, a picture postcard was received from the Isle of Wight. It said... Savage sea monster threatening island. Wish you was here. <laughs> it was signed Proudfoot Public Relations Officer. Immediately, the defensive forces swung into action. The Admiralty said... Nothing to do with us, old boy. The War Office said... Sorry, it's not our pigeon. And the Home Office said... What a disgusting picture postcard. <laughs> Eventually, it was decided that the sea monster came within my province. I'm Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries, scientific advisor. And I'm Sir Hector's assistant, Muriel Carr. Right. Sir Hector is an eminent authority on fish and is author of such books as The Hake's Progress, <laughs> A Place in the Sun, <laughs> and The Prawn Came Up Like Thunder. Good old Muriel. Whenever there was an important assignment, we went together. And so the two of us packed our bags and headed for the Isle of Wight. <laughs> Sir Hector, thank heavens you arrived. I'm Mervyn Proudfoot, P-R-O. All right, you don't know how to spell it. <laughs> this is my assistant, Muriel Cartwright. How do you do? How do you do? <laughs> Sir Hector, was this wise to bring a woman? That's my business. Now, um, <laughs> who's this other chap? Uh, I'm Inspector Townsend, if I can be of any assistance. Good, now let's get down to the facts about this strange monster. Yes, tell me, what's this thing like? Well, it's just one of those things. <laughs> we have got the chap outside who actually saw it. Quite hideous and horrible, I suppose. Yes, he is rather snug. Get him in. Potter! Potter! Come in, will you? Oh, it was horrible! 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 I seen it with my own eyes! Oh, scaly and horrible! With six heads and thirty-two eyes! Great horrible fangs! Slimy, groping tentacles! A dirty, great spit stacking! And fire was coming steaming out of his nostrils! Yes. Did you notice anything unusual about it? I was floating along on me rubber tire. And, and it rose up out the sea. Rose up out the sea. I tell you, like some prehistoric monster. It gave me a, it gave me a nasty turn. For a moment, I thought it was the wife. I... I swam for the shore and then it followed. Oh, it's terrible. To think that horrible thing is at large on the island. <laughs> What's going to happen? What's now, happen? now, don't panic, Mr. Potter. We've got the matter in hand. Just to return quietly to your digs and have tea. No, no, no. no don't, don't ask me to do that. Not today. I can't. I can't. Why ever not? It's Kipper's tea today. <laughs> now, come along. There's a good chap. You'll be all right. <sighs> I must say. Now, Mr. Proudfoot, have you any idea of where the thing might be? Yes, it's down the corridor, second on... Oh! <laughs> oh. What? Yes, I, I see what you mean. Well, yes. Well, the last report we had, it was seen heading for the end of the promenade. What? Then it must be making for the pier. You don't think uh, that... No, don't worry, sir. It won't get on the pier. No animals allowed. <laughs> well, wherever it is, we must act quickly. Sir Hector, what's the time? Four o'clock. Oh, tea time. Oh, <laughs> really, Muriel, this is no time for tea. But all right, now, Inspector, we'd better get busy. Muriel, I shan't need you. Oh, well, perhaps Miss Cartwright would care to join me for afternoon tea. How about the uh, palm court? Yes, that'd be nice. <laughs> Proudfoot. 
Thank you, yes. It's a pretty fascinating job you must have. I enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I must tell you about the beast from Virginia, Walter. Oh, dear. It was sickening. The green, hairy, two-headed thing. Mm. It was made of some strange, gray, greasy, vegetable matter. Mm. I say, you're not eating your tea cake. <laughs> Actually, I'm full up. I think I have too many crumpets. <laughs> My dear, you don't know what you're missing. These tea cakes are delicious. <laughs> I beg your pardon. <laughs> These tea cakes are delicious. Yes, you seem to be enjoying them. <laughs> what was that? Ah! Look, look there, peering through the palms. It's the monster. What? <gasps> Miss Cartwright, whatever shall we do? Now, we should like to play for you a selection from Salad Day. Good heavens, it's run away. I'm not surprised. Anyway, come on, we must tell Sir Hector. Right. Hello, yes, yes, this is Sir Hector. What's that? Oh, I... Sorry, it's out of the question. I, I don't care which film company you are. You can't have this monster. <laughs> Goodbye. I'm sorry about that, Inspector. You were saying? Uh, well, sir, our chaps are doing what they can. We very nearly managed to get him when he sat down outside the town hall, but unfortunately it is an official parking area. <laughs> well, I think it's... Uh... Sir Hector! Sir Hector, I've just seen it. It's pretty ghastly. Proudfoot, uh, would you care to explain? The monster, sir. We've just seen it. Heard a thing. That hideous creature should have come to the beautiful Isle of Wight. Sir Hector, isn't it time something was actually done to destroy this creature? Good heavens, Inspector, I'm doing all I can. Normal weapons are useless. In cases like this, we have to try and find some vegetable substance to which the creature is allergic. Now, wait a minute. Yes. I think I've got it. What do you associate with dead fish? Chips? <laughs> Precisely. Of course. Why didn't we think of it before? A chip gun. <gasps> <laughs> We designed and built our chip gun overnight and assembled on the beach at 0800 hours next morning. Everything's ready, Sir Hector. Good. Now, Inspector, did you bring the ammunition? Oh, yes, sir. I got six pennyworth of chips. <laughs> With vinegar, of course. <laughs> Good. Well, all we can do is... In... Look. What's that over there? Behind the deck chairs. That's the monster. We must be sure. Yes. Yes, it is the monster. Oh, it's hideous. Oh, you filthy monster, you. No, don't be lying. <laughs> Look at that slimy black tail. Oh, don't you like it? That's <laughs> very me, really, I think. You evil creature. Where on earth do you come from? Oh, from Stowe. <laughs> Here, I'll say, do you think... Uh... No, 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 keep away. Huh? No, stop messing about. <laughs> Here, what kind of funny thing you've got there? It's a police inspector. No, I mean that thing. <laughs> it's a chip gun, and if you take one more step, we'll open fire. And you can't scare me. All right, inspector, stand by. Put the chip belt into the gun. No. Now, stay where you are, monster. I shall breathe all over you. <laughs> Look at the smoke coming out my nostrils. That's a good trick, isn't it? <laughs> and what do you think of my groping tentacles? They're revolting. Yeah, but they're so useful. <laughs> you see me getting a pickled onion out of a jar. <laughs> For the last time... Stay away. As do as I like. Here I come. All right, Inspector. Fire. Oh, oh you got me. Oh. 
Well done, sir. He's had his chips. <laughs> Come along, Sir Hector. We'd better be getting back. No, no, don't go yet, sir. There's more trouble heading this way. What is it now? Look there. Look there. Four strange, unearthly creatures covered in air. <gasps> Look out. Here they come. So until next week, this is Kenneth Horne saying goodbye for now and leaving you with this thought from a listener in Tring, Hertfordshire. If a cat had eight kittens, would they be octopuses? <laughs> you might have been listening to All of Just Missed, Beyond Our Ken, a sort of recorded radio show, in which you heard Kenneth Horne not to mention Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Betty Marsden, Bill Pertwee, the Fraser Hayes Four, and the BBC Variety Orchestra, conducted by Paul Fennelly. Eric Meniman wrote the script, your announcer was Douglas Smith, and the show was produced by John Simmons. <laughs> This is the BBC Light Programme. Yeah, I love it. Oh, I do wish you wouldn't creep up on me like that. What's the matter? Don't you like surprises? No, I don't. Here, I bought you a present. No, I'd rather not. Oh, go on. Take it. It's a symbol of our friendship. Oh, all right. What on earth is it? It's an X-ray photograph of my chest. <laughs> What are you giving me this for? Well, it's just to show you my heart's in the right place. <laughs> well, it's about time somebody saw through you. Oh, well, if that's the way you feel, you better make the announcement, and you honestly, sometimes you offer your friends you to people. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, whatever happens during the next 30 minutes will certainly be beyond our care. Among those taking part are Sir Roger Cantaloupe, Ebony Figment, Miss Cordelia Lullington Cove, Edward Smith... Who? Edward Smith. Oh, somebody's got a very vivid imagination. <laughs> To continue, Francis Camembert, J.P., Pandit Bert Higgins, and, of course, Mr. Kenneth Horne, who prefers to remain anonymous. Ladies and gentlemen, Kenneth Horne. <laughs> Hello, good evening, and first of all, here's a special message to all New Zealand cricketers. Don't cast a clout till May is out. <laughs> Well, now, tonight I was going to talk to you about the excavations on Salisbury Plain, but I'm afraid I just don't dig that sort of thing. So, um, instead, let me tell you about some of the things that happened to me last week. On Monday, I went to Bisley for the Large Boar and Small Arms Championship, which I won, being unanimously adjudged the biggest boar with the smallest arms. <laughs> on Tuesday, I was going to Stoke Newington, but uh, somebody had already stoked him. <laughs> So I stayed at home and washed my hair. <laughs> As usual, I gave it a shampoo. I couldn't get a real poo. <laughs> and I set it with the new miracle spray marketed by Max Rubinley. Well, now I know their slogan is accurate when it says, it comes out a treat. <laughs> However, I put it back with a new preparation called Sticker Hair On, so all was well in the end. Or the sides, anyhow. However, <laughs> Thursday was really a momentous day. I remember it was a glorious morning, and I decided to have my breakfast in the garden. Oh, Auntie has gone down the drain pipe. Everything's going out. Toast, marmalade, and wasp. How pleasant it is breakfasting out in the open air. I've always felt that communing with nature does something to a man. Oh, oh, prudence, prudence. Oh, oh, Lord, good gracious, sir, whatever's the matter? I think I've been stung on the ear by a wasp. Oh, dear, sir, which one? I don't know, all these wasps look alike to me. <laughs> Come now, sir, let's have a look. Oh, uh, there's nothing here, sir. Must have been a blue bottle. Anyway, I don't know why you can't have your breakfast like any other decent, respectable person in bed. Well, 
I like it out here, Prudence, just sitting back listening to the droning of the lazy bees as they as they put up that scaffolding over there. <laughs> oh, and, uh, and and by the way, Prudence. Yes. Put out my tweeds, will you? They've been smouldering in the wardrobe for weeks. Very good, sir. Oh, look, there's a helicopter. Good good heavens, it's coming down. Ahoy there, permission to land. Well, you can't land in my garden. There isn't room. And we can make it, sir. This machine can land on a postage stamp. Oh, oh, Prudence, bring my album, will you? <laughs> I don't bother, sir. I'm coming in now. Oh, jolly well done, sir. You've taken the top off my boiled egg. <laughs> well, now, uh, what can I do for you? Well, sir, allow me to introduce myself. Captain Marshbanks of the Whirlybird, sir. Air ferry service. Oh, fancy that. There's a ferry at the bottom of my gun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, that's very good, isn't it? Now, um... What, what do you want? Well, sir, it's, it's like this, you see. I'm looking for an urm, sir. An urm? Yes, sir, an urm. An urm. Well, well, you won't find one here at this time of the morning. Oh, I don't know, sir. We have a saying in the service, the whirly bird catches the urm. <laughs> oh, well, uh, what exactly is an urm? Well, it's only just been invented. What's it used for? Oh, lots of things, but principally for cracking jokes about the whirly bird catching the urm. I see. <laughs> Oh, well, sir, I must be off now. Well, it's been awfully nice meeting you. I say, uh, are you going anywhere near the West End? Well, as a matter of fact, I am. Oh, good. Perhaps you'll give me a lift. Delighted, sir. Hop in. Thank you. Over the West End now, sir. Oh, fine. Oh, look, there it is. That, that's the flat down there. Oh, a friend of yours, sir? Yes. Oh, a friend of nowhere to land. Well, never mind. I'll jump. Well, cheerio, and thanks for the lift. <laughs> Hello, it's Pat Lancaster. Ken, what are you doing? Well, nothing. I just happened to be passing, so I thought I'd drop in. <laughs> well, you startled me. I was just rehearsing my song for the show. Well, what a coincidence. Perhaps you'd like to sing it for me now. I, I hope it's about me again. What's it called? It's a wonderful thing to be loved. Oh. It's a wonderful thing to be loved It's a feeling that's simply divine Nothing sets you aflame like the sound of your name When it's followed by darling be mine It's a wonderful thing to be told That you're thrilled in the hand that you hold While the lips that you share from his say will be there As long as the heavens above you Like the sound of your name When it's followed by darling divine It's a wonderful thing to be told That you're thrilled in the hand that you hold Nice, Pat. You know, that's the first time I've heard you sing in A flat. <laughs> oh, dear, the whirly bird catches the air. I like it very much. Yeah, I'll tell my furrier sometime. Anyhow, Pat, it's a jolly nice place you've got here. Yes, I like it here in the Muse. Oh, Muse. So that's where you get your inspiration from, is it? Well, you'll never believe this, Ken, but these Muse flats were converted from stables. Really? How interesting. My name is Lancaster. Come along, Dobbin, up the stairs. <laughs> They, um, they weren't very well converted, were they? 
Oh, I've got used to it by now. Especially old Dobbin. He's harmless enough. Except that he hates the sight of Spurs. Probably a Chelsea supporter. <laughs> Ken, would you like a cup of coffee? Yes, I'd love one. Would you answer the door, Ken? That'll be the chimney sweep. I've been expecting him. Right, Hal. Oh, hello, Sooty. Oh, I beg your pardon, madam. <laughs> Good morning. It's a flag day and I'm making a collection. Oh, well, just a minute. Now, uh, there you are. There's two flags for you. Oh, oh dear. Thank you. Ken? Silly of me, I forgot to ask. <laughs> I'll get it. Uh, easy, clean vacuum chimney sweeps at your service. Good morning. Oh, good heavens, you look absolutely spotless. Oh, of course, sir. Surely you've heard of a clean sweep. <laughs> yes. Our motto is absolutely no mess in the room, no muck on the carpets, and no soot in the hall. Well, extraordinary. What happens to it? We leave it all up the chimney. <laughs> I see. Well, now, how's business? Well, sir, things have been pretty black just lately. But I'm happy to say the business is looking up. Now, where is this chimney? Well, I, I think it's by the fireplace. By Jove! You're right! <laughs> okay, Fred, bring in the equipment. I'll just nip up and have a deco. That old black magic got me in its spell. That old black magic. Blimey, it's dark in here. Fred? Hello? Let's have the torture. Coming up. Ah. Oh. Ah. Ah. I say, you're all right up there. Oh, yes, thank you, sir. Just a touch of the flu. <laughs> oh. 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 Been on the cold side up here. Hold on, Governor. I'll light a fire. You, <laughs> you stupid dunderhead. Light a fire. You're a bright spark, I must say. <laughs> now then, let's have the number five iron up here. <laughs> right. I'll just poke around a bit. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> what have we got here? Oh, uh -huh. it's interesting. I'm coming down. <whistles> Madam, there's a stalk up your chimney. <laughs> oh, no. Are you sure? Positive. Well, how to be off. Well, you can't just go like that. Oh, no, no, of course not, no. Where can I wash my hands? Wash your hands? What are we going to do about this stalk's nest? It's no concern of ours. I'd rather fire a brigade if I were you. All right, Pat, don't worry. Leave this to me. Fire station, please. Hello there, Piccadilly Fire Brigade. Oh, I wonder if you can help me. We've got a stalk up the chimney. Is it on fire? <laughs> no, of course not. Oh, got its head stuck between the wheelings? No. Is it flooded? No. Sorry, can't help. <laughs> Dear, what am I going to do? Now, don't worry, Pat. Everything's got to be... Hello. Look here, did you say a stalk? Yes, that's right. Extraordinary thing. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello. Oh, bother. Well, well, I'll be off now, madam. Thanks for the use of the bathroom. I hope you don't mind, but Fred and me took the liberty of having a bath. <laughs> Uh, I had the sharp end and he had the tax. <laughs> uh, we'd like to congratulate you on your lovely sunken bathtub. But I haven't got a sunken bathtub. You have now. Good morning. <laughs> now then, I've got it. I'll try the post office. They're usually quite helpful on these sort of things. Hello? Just hang on a moment. I'm on the other phone. Now look, madam. I can't help it if it was marked fragile and it went to Rhodesia. We've told you enough times. Post early for Christmas. All right, madam. Right to the postmaster. See if I care. And you. <laughs> Hello, sir. Mount Pleasant. <laughs> oh, good morning. Uh, can you tell me what I should do about a stalk up the chimney? 
Well, sir, when was it posted? It, it wasn't posted. It's a bird I'm talking about. A what, sir? A bird. I'm sorry, sir, I can't hear you. I've got a bird up the chimney. Oh, have you? What's the matter? An old man come home suddenly? Oh, what's the use? Well, we've tried almost everybody now. The police, the water board, Peter Scott. Never mind. Perhaps the League of Feathered Friends will send someone round. They seemed interested. Yes, they did. So I'm going to have one last try. Hello, uh, electricity board? Hello. Hang on a minute, sir. I'll just switch this thing off. Oh, that's better. You have to hurry up, sir. I've got half London blacked out. <laughs> Right, now, well, it's to do with a stalk up the chimney. AC or DC? I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm afraid I don't know it's sex. <laughs> we, we haven't actually seen it. Yeah. yeah. Whatever induced you to phone up the electricity board about a stalk up the chimney? Well, I don't, I don't know, really. I, I suppose it was, um, well, it gave us a bit of a shock, I suppose. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, can you help? No, I'm afraid I can't, sir. Not if you've got to crack jokes like that. <laughs> I'm as much in the dark here as you are. Oh, that reminds me. Now, Ken, don't worry about it anymore. Have another cup of tea. Well, thanks, I will. Tea? It was coffee before. Oh, I see. It denotes the passing of time. <laughs> Oh, oh, good afternoon. I'm from the League of Feathered Friends. The name is Ethel Crow. <laughs> Just a coincidence. <laughs> well, well, now, a little bird told me that you've got a stalk up your chimney. <laughs> well, I just had to come, so I suppose you might say the stalk brought me. Uh, 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 Excuse me, uh, uh, madam, were you laughing? <laughs> yes, but, uh, but I'll let you into a secret. It's also the mating call of the duck bill, the platypus. Uh, 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 of course, you know, it, it is a bit embarrassing at times, as you can well imagine. Yes, yes, I can imagine. But look, now, what about this stalk? Oh, yes, yes. The chimney. Oh, all right, I'll just pop up and have a peek. Yes, and then pop out again. All right. But now... <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Miss Crow. Right, now, up you go. I'll help you. Now, now, where the about is it? Oh, 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 I say, I can't move. I'm stuck. Oh, oh, oh dear, now we've got to stalk and a crow up the chimney. <laughs> well, here we go again. Fire station, please. <laughs> Well, we got it sorted out in the end. Eventually, a representative from the zoo came round and removed them both. The stork's nest was taken to safety, and if anybody wants to see Miss Crow, well, just pop along to the zoo, the birdhouse, of course. <laughs> and while you're there, pass on to another interesting exhibit, a little number labelled The Chivalrous Shark, kindly donated by the Malcolm Mitchell Trio. <laughs> Most chivalrous fish of the ocean To the ladies for bearing a mile Though his record be dark The man-eating shark Will eat neither woman nor child Will eat neither woman nor child A doctor, a lawyer, a preacher He'll gobble one any fine day But the ladies bless him He'll only address him Politely and go on his way Politely and go on his way I can readily cite you an instance Where a lovely young lady of free who was tender and sweet and delicious to eat Fell into the bay with a scream Ow! Fell into the bay with a scream She struggled and flounced in the water And signaled in vain for her bark She'd surely been drowned if she hadn't been found By a chivalrous man-eating shark By a chivalrous man-eating shark He bowed in a manner most polished Thus soothing her impulses wild don't be frightened, he said, I've been properly bred And will eat neither woman nor child And will eat neither woman nor child Then he proffered his thin and she took it 
such gallantry none can dispute. While the passengers cheered as the vessel they neared, and a broadside was fired in salute. And a broadside was fired in salute. And they soon stood alongside the vessel when a life-saving dinghy was lowered. With the pick of the crew and her relatives too, the mate and the skipper aboard. And the mate and the skipper aboard. So they took her aboard in a jiffy, and the shark stood attention the while. Then he raised on his flipper and ate up the skipper and went on his way with a smile. And went on his way with a smile. This shows that the prince of the ocean to the ladies for bearing a mile, though his record be dark, the man-eating shark. Will eat neither woman nor child. And now we come to the special Kenneth Horn documentary feature, Hornorama. Yes, each week at this time, Kenneth Horne and his team of investigators bring you a factual report on topics of immediate interest. And tonight, we present a close-up on sport. Does it interfere with smoking and drinking? <laughs> Another question we might ask is, how does Great Britain stand in the field of athletics? On your marks, get set! And that's another victory for Australia. <laughs> Hetherington, where on earth have you been? The others finished ages ago. Oh, it was such a lovely day, I decided to walk. <laughs> However, we are not without our successes. I have much pleasure in presenting you as winner of the women's hundred yards with this gold medal. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> so much for athletics. Now let's turn to the noble art of boxing, one of the many sports that has increased in popularity since more time has been devoted to it on television. My lords, ladies and gentlemen, in the red corner at 456 pounds, Unbeaten in 230 contests, the terror of the ring, the Brixton Mangler himself, Killer McGee. <laughs> and in the green corner, no one. <laughs> In, uh, in every sport, of course, champions emerge who seem to be unbeatable. Take rowing, for instance. We're going to have a word now with Mr. Desmond Crumble, who has actually won the Diamond Skulls for the last 22 years running. Uh, no, no, no. Rowing. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, of course. Now, now uh, tell us briefly, Mr. Crumble, just how do you manage to do it? Oh, well, it's just one of those things, I suppose. I keep in perfect physical condition. I've had a tremendous amount of experience. Then there's my knowledge of the course, my specially designed boat, and this cunningly concealed outboard motor. Football. Every year when the new season starts, interest centres around the star players for whom the clubs have often paid substantial transfer fees. Such a player is Ambrose Jaeger of Chocolate Athletic. Oh, dear. He is, in fact, their new soft center forward. <laughs> and Jaeger has got the ball now. He's trapped it beautifully, and he's fairly streaking down the left wing. He passes one man and another, and a lovely slope to the right to stick him in the penalty area. He's got a wonderful chance now. The goalkeeper comes out, but it's too late. Jaeger shoots, and it's a goal! Well, that's Jaeger's fourth goal of the match. And I really think we ought to have a word with the team manager who is sitting beside me now. Well, Mr. Waring, what have you got to say about this boy of yours? If I've told him once, I've told him a hundred times. We change ends at half time. <laughs> Now, 
now. Oh, dear, it's the soft centre forward I like so much. <laughs> and now to the quieter, more sedate indoor sport of snooker. Our reporter, Cecil Snaith, is at the moment waiting to report on the All England Snooker Tournament at the Leicester Square Hall. So over to Cecil Snaith. And I'm sitting here now in the hushed atmosphere of this tense contest. And away in the distance, I can see a myriad of multicoloured snooker balls delicately framed against the vast green expanse of the table. All around me are grouped well-known snooker players. In fact, there are queues everywhere. <laughs> and uh, at this point, the champion, Joe Briggs, seems to be rather undecided about his next shot. I say, Joe, why don't you take a long rest? And why don't you belt up, Baldy? seems to have made up his mind now. Yes, he's, he's going to attempt a very difficult shot. And to get a better view of this, I'll just lean over the table. Yes, if he brings this off, it certainly will be a remarkable stroke. And here he goes. Mm. <laughs> and this is Cecil Snaith from the top right-hand pocket returning you to the studio. And thank you, Cecil Snaith. Another sport that is capturing wider audiences is all in wrestling. So let's drop in now at the Albert Hall. <laughs> oh, sorry, wrong night. <laughs> Well, instead, let's visit the all-in wrestling at the De Montfort Hall Paddington and eavesdrop on a typical clash of giants. Between Bert Maserati, the Cleethorpes Crusher, <laughs> and Fred Fernanza, the Terrible Turk. Hello, Bert. Hello, Fred. <laughs> How's the wife? <laughs> Lovely, thank you. Oh, your nipper's getting on. <coughs> They're fine. Growing all the time, of course. <coughs> yeah, we haven't been on the bill together for a long time, have we? No, we haven't. <coughs> Here, I'm not hurting you, am I? No, 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 of course not. That was just one for the crowd. <laughs> Here, tried any good locks lately? Oh, yes. You remember my Aunt Nelson interlocking vice grip? Uh, yes. I've got a new twist on it. Oh, have you? Come on, then. Show us. All right. Uh, oh. Oh. oh, so that's how it is, is it? Well, two can play at that game. Oh! Steady, Bert. My, my son, Bert. <laughs> oh, you'd forgotten that one, hadn't you? Yeah, yeah. remember this one? No! Oh! oh, dear. I can't bear to look. They must be hurting each other. Oh, no, not a bit of it. It's all a put-up job. Oh! Now we pass on to another traditional sport. For what could be more British than hunting and shooting? Now, first is shooting. Yes, to some people, there's nothing more exhilarating than a day at their favourite shooting lodge. I say, Carstairs, is my husband back yet? Yes, madam. Oh, good. Then I've shot a stag. <laughs> and finally, hunting. Yikes, Rodner. Tally hair, child. As if it's terribly good of you to invite me to my first, very first hunt. Not at all, my dear child. The pleasure. But tell me something. Anything, Rodney, what? Charles, why are you dressed like that? Well, you told me I should wear a red coat. Yes, but I didn't say anything about a white beard and a sack of toys. <laughs>
Well, there you are. There'll be another Hornorama next week when the subject will be Ballet Masters, Are They Rotten to the Core? <laughs> Also, in next week's programme, we'll be giving you an excerpt from the new film starring Gina Lotta Brigida and Sophia Loren, which is called The Elsie and Doris Water Story. <laughs> and Sir Bernard Docker will be reading a few extracts from his checkbook. <laughs> so, until next week, then, this is Kenneth Horne saying goodbye for now and leaving you with this thought. If a watchmaker died and left 4,000 clocks, would it take long to wind up the estate? Good night. <laughs> You have either been listening to or have just missed Beyond Our Ken, a sort of recorded radio show which gave employment to Kenneth Horne and also to Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Betty Marsden, Ron Moody, Patricia Lancaster, the Malcolm Mitchell Trio and the BBC Variety Orchestra conducted by Paul Fennelly. The script, believe it or not, was written and letters of complaint should be sent to Eric Merriman and Barry Took. However, the onus must inevitably fall on our producer, Jake's Brown. <laughs> This is the BBC. Yeah, hold on. BBC, that's advertising. You mustn't advertise. I suppose you'd cut the BBC. Why not? They cut me often enough. <laughs> uh, just because I speak better than what they do. They're jealous. Well, go on, try it, cutting out the BBC. Oh, very well. This is... Yes, but this is what? Oh, it could be anything. It could be this is Henry Hall. Or it could be this is your life. I could oh, this is ridiculous. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's right. You see? It could be anything. You see? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> there. Take out the is. Oh, dear. This. That's much better. But I still think it's a bit too long. I know. Take out the this. Yes, yeah. right. Off you go. All right. <laughs> There you are, you see. That's more like it. After all, anyone can say this is a BBC-like programme. That's not clever. But when you can step up to a microphone and say... <laughs> oh, that's saying something. <laughs> well, what are you waiting for, then? Go on, announce it. Go on, announce the programme. May I? No, yes, really? Oh, yes, thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Go on. Ladies and gentlemen, whatever happens during the next 30 minutes will certainly be beyond our ken. Among those taking part are Captain Artemis Nightingale, Miss Clotilda Thuggerborn, Kai Brown, Letitia Medlicott. Yeah, what was that Christian name? Letitia. Bless you. <laughs> Lady Diana Blenchworthy, Customs Officer Mervyn Smuggle, and of course Mr. Kenneth Horn, who prefers to remain anonymous. Ladies and gentlemen, Kenneth Horn. <laughs> Hello, good evening. First of all, here's a special message to all our listeners of long standing. Sit down. <laughs> well, now, tonight I was going to talk to you about mirrors and looking glasses, but on reflection I decided against it. So, um, instead, let me tell you some of the things that happened to me last week. On Monday, I was sitting in the office quietly minding my own secretary, <laughs> when suddenly there was a... <laughs> and I noticed that a stone had been thrown through the window. What's more, there was a note attached to it which said, Fred Fudge. Windows repaired, ten and six. <laughs> Which uh, I thought at the time was rather amusing. <laughs> I've gone off it since, there it is. <laughs> However, on Tuesday, I was supposed to attend the Kensington and District Working Man's Hunt Ball. And my tailor had promised, my tailor had promised faithfully to have my new evening suit ready for the occasion. But as it happened, he only delivered the jacket. Well, naturally, I decided to sue him for promise of breaches... <laughs> and so I popped in to see my solicitor and he said that as far as the trousers were concerned I should drop the whole thing <laughs> on the grounds of course that one pair of trousers doesn't constitute a lawsuit <laughs> Friday I decided to get away from it all and spend a few days in Paris so early in the morning Prudence and I got busy with the packing <laughs> There we are, sir. Oh, I do envy you, sir. Going to all them lovely French places, the pig alley, the champs useless. And you know, that famous historical place where they signed the treaty. You know, 
The Palace of Varieties. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> well, cheerio, sir. Have a good time. Thank you, Prudence. I'll send you a first card. Oh, sir. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, Prudence. Yes, sir? Pass on more of this here, sir. We. Oui. Yes, rather. <laughs> Oh, dear, it's, it's very crowded here on the quayside. Oh, I'm terribly sorry, sir. It was my umbrella. Oh, heavens, it's horn. Oh, dear, Humphrey Borum Stiff. Are you going across on the SS Maldemar? Yes, and I think we're in for a bit of a rough passage. Oh, why do you say that? Well, I'm not certain, but if it's anything to go by, I hear the captain of the ship is flying. <laughs> is he by Joe? No, by place. I don't wish to know that. <laughs> Kindly leave the landing stage. Has anybody here seen Calais? Sierra, yes. Has anybody here seen Calais? Yeah. Oh, the fog's clearing. There, there it is. Oh, Calais, yes. Hello, hello, hello. We are approaching Calais now. The ship will dock at key number three. through all this rigmarole of the customs. I don't mind it at all. I treat it as a sort of game. A game? What do you mean? Well, when they finally put a chalk mark on your luggage, it means you've won. I see, yes. <laughs> anyway, the queue seems to be moving quite quickly. Uh, Bonjour, monsieur. Have you anything to declare? Nothing. Then put your case up here on the table. Oh, very well. <laughs> Are you sure you have no clocks or watches to declare? Quite sure. Then I shall have to see for myself. <laughs> my apologies, monsieur. <laughs> Next, please. Well, here's my luggage. Eh bien, monsieur, anything to declare? Well, I see now. I've got a quarter of a pound of tea, a, a Union Jack. Oh, yes, and six bottles of parsnip wine. Pardon, monsieur, you are bringing wine into France? Yes, that's the reason I came. A friend of mine said to me, if you enjoy a glass of wine, the only place to drink it is in France. <laughs> My uh, apologies, monsieur. Next, please. Right. Ça va? Hello, hello, hello. The train for Paris will leave from platform number three. Oh, I'm not taking any notice of him again. Besides, the train is here on platform two. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. Have you ever had one of those days when nothing seems to go right? Never even touched the bars, did it? <laughs> ah, Paris at last. I can't wait to try out my French on someone. Oh, look, there's a rather tray jolly mademoiselle looking into that shop window. Uh, Excuse me, mademoiselle, she was just Why, wondering... Why, Sacre bleu, it's Pat Lancaster. <laughs> what are you doing here, Pat? Well, I just fancied a gay, exciting little holiday, and after all, isn't that what makes Paris, Paris? Well, there's a cue for a chanson if I jamais heard of. <laughs> your hotel, the view is swell, but here's the rub, there is no tub, you'll wash with perfume and agree, that's what makes Paris Paris, each man is geared to sport a beard, who are those guys, they're XGI, to look correct, wear a goatee. 
That's what makes Paris Paris The gay cafe, the Eiffel Tower The mayonnaise, the Eiffel Tower The Marseille, the Eiffel Tower The organ starting on the time, Eiffel Tower You cannot speak, your French is weak Just use your hand, he understands And pretty soon it's mon cher That's what makes Paris Paris You try to grab a taxi cab The light is red, he goes ahead And knocks you down quite cheerfully That's what makes Paris Paris The horse-drawn cart, the Eiffel Tower The butcher's mart, the Eiffel Tower The search for art, the Eiffel Tower The Eiffel, Eiffel, awful, awful Eiffel Tower You're half alive, you're 85 The snow too short, you're the moon Then all at once you're 23 That's what we call Bella That's what makes Paris Paris And Paris is home to me Anyway, Pat, how are you spending the day? Well, I'm going to see all the sights. This guide is taking me round. Oh, well, have a good time. Ready, madam? Yes. Good. Now, over here, we have the Empire State Building, and that tall, spindly-looking thing, that's the Leaning Tower of Pizza. So if you'll just come with me up Oxford Street. <laughs> well, I... I... I think I'll find my own way about Paris. I say, would you like a guide? Good heavens, it's a guide, mistress. <laughs> well, I, I just thought, well, after all, I, I've got all the troop over here. Yes. And, well, we're having a jamboree. Ah, oh, here come the girls now. <laughs> Jamboree? Yes, it's jazz jamboree. Oh, I see. <laughs> now, are we all here? Anthea, come away from those Frenchmen. You'll smell of onions all day. <laughs> right. Alligator Patrol. <laughs> Forward. <laughs> Now, where am I going to stay? I'll just ask this passing Frenchman if he can recommend a good hotel. Now, there's my phrase book. Now, then. Uh, uh, Guten Tag, mein Herr. Ich habe, ich habe nicht ein Platz und der Zeitung hast nicht willkommen. Uh, pardon, monsieur. What does that mean? It means I brought the wrong phrase book with me. <laughs> However, I wonder if you could recommend a good hotel. Uh, certainly, monsieur. Try the Hotel Magnifique. It is, how you say, very discreet. Oh, how do you mean? Even the manager's name is Smith. Is it? I see. <laughs> well, now, how much is it going to cost me? Oh, about uh, 80,000 francs a day. 80,000 francs. How much is that in English money? Two and seven pence. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's reasonable enough. And uh, many thanks, monsieur. As a token of my esteem, I'd like you to have this. Ah, merci bien, monsieur. I have always wanted a German phrase book. <laughs> well, now, that takes care of the hotel problem. Now, where shall I go first? Oh, I know, the Latin quarter. I'd better pop in and get a Latin phrase book. So this is Bohemian Paris, eh? Well, certainly plenty going on. Hello. Seems to be a bit of an argument going on here. Take that, Alphonse. You are the cause of all my worries. I challenge you to a duel. Good heavens. Hello, monsieur. Mm. Oh, I say, whatever is that for? Nothing, it's just one of our little customs. Well, it's the first time I've enjoyed going through the customs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear, dear, I like that, don't worry. <laughs> well, I'm beginning to feel quite at home now. It's getting more like Chalfonts and Giles all the time. Oh, who is this coming towards me now? It's a dirty, filthy, bearded Frenchman. Hello? Do I detect the mother tongue? Oh, oh good gracious. I, I beg your pardon. I thought you were a dirty, filthy, bearded Frenchman. Oh, well, we all make mistakes. As it happens, I'm a dirty, filthy, bearded Englishman. 
Well, then I should have thought you could have told that by my rolled umbrella. <laughs> yes, how silly of me. What are you doing in Paris? Oh, me and my band are playing over here in one of the nightclubs. Perhaps you've heard of us. The Quintet de Hot Club de Kidderminster. <laughs> oh, of course, yes. You must be the Duke of Leighton Buzzard. Yes, I have that honour. And what is this nightclub of yours? It's called the Golden Sewer. What a <laughs> fashionable little cellar in the place de la Discord. Why not come along this evening? Just mention my name. Oh, thanks very much. I will. <laughs> Ah, here it is. Hello? The Duke of Leighton Buzzard sent me. Oh, come in, sir. Any friend of old Jangle Box is a friend of ours. Good gracious, this is a proper sink of iniquity. Maybe, but just look at some of those dishes in the sink. <laughs> what the hell? Just sit down and make yourself at home. I'll send the waiter over. Thank you. Uh, well, now, monsieur, what can I get for you? I'll have a pot of tea and a plate of buttered crumpets, please. <laughs> uh, beg your pardon, monsieur. I said uh, a buttered crumpet. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, les crumpets au beurre. I'm sorry, monsieur, but you'll have to have what everyone else is having. Oh, what's that? Toasted tea cakes. <laughs> and right now it is cabaret time at the Golden Sewer. Ladies and gentlemen, we present the greatest cabaret artist of all time, Maurice Chandelier. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And here's a little song with which I've been associated for many years. Ping, thank you. <laughs> ping, why do my boots go ping? It happens every spring, for that's when my boots go ping. Ping, always my boots go ping. It makes the birdies sing when they hear my boots go ping. As I stroll along the boulevards, my boots go clipping, clipping. Accompanied by the voices of les compagnons de la chanson. Ping, why do my boots go ping? It rhymes with everything, and that's why my boots go ping, ping. It's really quite fantastic, the way the elastic stretches as I walk along. And whenever I take them off, the ping becomes a pong. And at that point, I left. Of course, I did have a very enjoyable time in Paris, but I must admit that when it comes to entertainment, you can't beat home produce. And so listen to a number by the Malcolm Mitchell Trio. <laughs> a number which I've always believed to be called Met Corbus in un petit tennis and big fromage, <laughs> but which Malcolm says is really marching through Georgia. Bring the good old bugle, boys, we'll sing another song. Sing it with a spirit that will start the world along. Sing it as we used to sing it, 50,000 strong, while we were marching through Georgia. Hurrah, hurrah, we bring the jubilee. Hurrah, hurrah, the flag that made you free. So we sang the chorus from Atlanta to the sea, while we were marching through Georgia. How the darkies shouted when they heard the joyful sound How the turkeys gobbled which our commissary found How the sweet potatoes even started from the ground While we were marching through Georgia Hurrah, hurrah, we bring the jubilee Hurrah, hurrah, the flag that made you free So we sang the chorus from Atlanta to the sea While we were marching through Georgia We made a thoroughfare for freedom and her train. Sixty miles in latitude, three hundred to the main. Trees and fled before us, for resistance was in vain. While we were marching through Georgia. Hurrah, hurrah, we bring the jubilee. Hurrah, hurrah, the flag that made you 
free. So we sang the chorus from Atlanta to the sea while we were marching through Georgia. And so we come to the special Kenneth Horne documentary feature, Hornorama. Yes, at this time, Kenneth Horne and his team of investigators bring you a factual report on topics of immediate interest. And we present a close-up on motoring. What of the future? And motorists, what are they driving at? Now, first of all, here are some statistics. A new law has been passed which states that every car travelling over 60 miles an hour must have a driver. <laughs> Did you know that if all the motorists in Great Britain were laid end to end, it would look just like Kingston Bypass on a Sunday? <laughs> yes, the big problem is traffic jams. We asked a cross-section of motorists what they thought about the problem. Ten percent said... With all these new cars on the road, one must expect traffic jams. Fifteen percent said... With all these old cars on the road, one must expect traffic jams. And seventy-five percent said... <laughs> well, that was a very cross-section, really. However, uh, it is unfortunately a fact that uh, only a small proportion of motorists can really be called safe drivers. Not at all. I'm a safe driver. Well, congratulations. You must be very happy. Not really. There's no fun in driving a safe. <laughs> Probably doesn't know the combination, I suppose. Well, <laughs> a great aid to road safety is, of course, the driving test. And standing beside me now is a typical candidate, Miss Angela Tipton Thorker. Now, tell me, Miss Thorker, have you ever been tested before? No, lots of times, but never in a motor car. <laughs> I see. Well, I expect you're looking forward to this test. Oh, yes, rather. You see, I've got a dog license, a radio license, and a television license, and now I only need this one to complete the set. <laughs> Yes, she's forgotten the license to sell tobacco, hasn't she? Never mind. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Talker, and good luck to you. Now then, uh, many unfair things, you know, are said about lady drivers, and they're not true. Honestly, they're not. So sometimes these lady drivers are quite skillful. After all, it isn't easier to get a car into a garage sideways. <laughs> now, let's ask a motorist his opinion of the modern car. It is no good asking me. It's just burst. Burst? Yes, it's a bubble car. <laughs> well, now, what are the motor car manufacturers planning for us next? Here's an expert on the subject, Mr. Patrick J. Flaherty. Flaherty. I suppose, sir, it's a common sight for you to see thousands of new cars rolling off the assembly lines. That is that. And that's the trouble. We're trying to keep them on the assembly line. <laughs> And what, sir, uh, what, uh, can you tell us about your new model? Well, sir, our very latest prototype is the Flaherty Mark 12. It starts the journey as a car. Then if you want to fly, you press a button and it becomes a helicopter. And if you want to cross water, you press another button and it turns into a boat. We're anticipating a very big demand in Manchester. Yes, yes. <laughs> and what happens if you run out of petrol? Well, you simply press another button and it turns into a telephone box and you can call a taxi. I uh, see. <laughs> And then you take out a jackknife and cut up a side street. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> oh, exactly. You've got yes, the same. Yes. Well, mind you, there's just one trifling mechanical detail that prevents the full-scale production of the Flaherty Mark 12. What's that? It won't work. Oh. <laughs> but it doesn't deter us. We're still going to put it on the market. And we've got our advertising slogan already. Oh, uh, what is it? Flaherty gets you nowhere. <laughs> Flaherty gets you nowhere. Drives you up the wall, doesn't it? There. <laughs> well, motoring is a fascinating subject, and wherever men get together, you can be sure the talk will be of cars. For there's nothing like the thrill and joy of showing off your new car to a close friend. Well, old man, what do you think of it? Well, it's great. What a splendid little car. You must be very proud of it. Oh, I am. Terribly. What do you think of the colour scheme? Well, I just adore the yellow bodywork. Yes. <laughs> it is rather unusual. And the red mudguard. It's simply heavenly. 
Well, thank you very much for the little ride. I must be off now. All right, old man. Goodbye, Noddy. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, big ears. <laughs> Ah, the joys of motoring. Well, that's the price the motorist has to pay, not including purchase tax, of course. Not only uh, can you get nowhere, but when you get there, there's nowhere to park. By the way, I hope you're taking notes. I shall be asking questions afterwards. <laughs> yes, parking is indeed a problem, but wherever he goes, the motorist can rely on the courtesy, tact and helpfulness of the London policeman. Hello, having a bit of trouble, sir? Yes, officer, I'm afraid it is rather a small space. Oh, well, if I was you, I'd pull out and reverse in again. That's it. Now, hard down on your right hand lock. Bring it right round, right round. That, that's it, sir. Oh, uh, just hang on a minute. I'll move this barrel a bit. Oh, there we are. That's better. Right, oh, in you come. Steady, steady. Other lock, other lock, other lock. Back, back a bit. Right. right. Uh, that ought to do you. Thank you very much, officer. Oh, that's all right, sir. Now then, I'm afraid you can't park here. <laughs> Can I see your license? You can't have this in this <laughs> Well, well, that's how it is. I can remember the time when the only difficult thing about parking was getting a girl to agree to it, but there we go. <laughs> Still, let's, uh, let's turn now to driving on the continent. Every year, thousands of English motorists venture abroad with their cars where they had to be prepared to face the excitable and often bad-tempered foreign drivers. Felicity. Yes, Chambre. Isn't it pretty here? Oh, oh. Get out of it, you road dog. Oh, reckless fools. He was in rather a happy, wasn't he? Oh, they make me sick. No courtesy at all. Oh, look out. Look out. Here comes another one. Oh, oh. What's he on about? Oh, a foreign idiot. Oh, they're just about the worst drivers you've ever seen. They, they shouldn't be allowed out. Ambrose. Yes, Felicity. Shouldn't we be driving on the right-hand side? Oh, 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 oh. Well, it's a good thing that all British drivers aren't like that, particularly those who take part in that most exciting event of the motoring year, the Monte Carlo Rally. So over now to our commentator, Cecil Snaith, in France. Yes, I'm standing now on a stretch of road just outside Monte Carlo, where the contestants come sweeping round this rather sharp and dangerous bend. Uh, I needn't tell you that the weather is much warmer here than it is in Britain. I'm in a very good position here to see the race, and I'm waiting now for the first cars to arrive. And as I stand here on this glorious midsummer day, let me tell you something about the Monte Carlo Rally. As you know, it is held each year in February. And... Oh. <laughs> With that, we return you to the studio. <laughs> Thank you, Cecil Snaith. And now to end this survey of motoring, here's a special word of advice to all motorists who happen to be driving in London at this very minute. Be extra careful. My wife has got the car. So I shall have to borrow Kenneth Williams' car and drive myself to distraction, I think. There we go. <laughs> this is Kenneth Horn saying goodbye for now and leaving you with this thought. Is a depressed Dutchman cheesed off? Good night. <laughs> You have either been listening to or have just missed Beyond Our Ken, a sort of recorded radio show which gave employment to Kenneth Horn and also to Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Betty Marsden, Ron Moody, Patricia Lancaster, the Malcolm Mitchell Trio and the BBC Variety Orchestra conducted by Paul Fennelly. The script, believe it or not, was written and letters of complaint should be sent to Eric Merriman and Barry Took. However, the onus must inevitably fall on our producer, Jakes Brown. <laughs> The 
this is the last time I pose for a soldier. Well, how much longer are you going to be, practically? The arms are getting tired. You can rest now. There, finished at last. Well, Socrates, what do you think? It's a magnificent, the most beautiful piece of sculpture I've ever seen. Yes, it's a good likeness, isn't it? Be quiet, Amy. But what are you going to call it? I shall call it the Venus de Milo. Yes, it's a catchy title. But there's one thing you've overlooked. How on earth are you going to get it through the door? Ah, I never thought of that. <laughs> I'm afraid you'll have to chip some of it off. Oh, dear. After all the work I've put in on her extremity. <laughs> oh, I'm loath to do it. So I suppose it's the only way. Oh, well. Here goes. That was an excerpt from A Farewell to Arne. <laughs> Another of the books we recommended to read, especially during the next half hour. Meanwhile, for those who can't read, here's a sort of radio show which is beyond our ken. Among those taking part are Jelly Deal magnate Gordon Mylender, Lolita Patita Juanita Macmillan, <laughs> Ben Gunn and his musical cheeses, the House of Lords ice hockey team, <laughs> Leslie Campdown, Miss Amelia Birdwatcher. I bet she'd do anything for a lark. <laughs> to continue. Fenella Valmouth, Gypsy Rose Featherston Hall, and of course Mr. Kenneth Horn, who prefers to remain anonymous. Ladies and gentlemen, Kenneth Hall. Hello, good evening. Welcome to Beyond Our Ken, the only show that dares to bring you Beyond Our Ken. <laughs> Matter of fact, we received a telegram the other day from the head of Variety, which read uh, Heard your show was soft. <laughs> Which we all appreciated very much. However, let me, as usual, tell you what I did last week. On Monday, I went to the fun fair at Battersea, spent all my time on the rifle range. I shot two glass ashtrays, a plaster Alsatian, and a cuddly teddy bear, for which I won six clay pipes. <laughs> Tuesday, uh, uh, Tuesday, I didn't have much on, so I got into the bath. <laughs> it wasn't a complete waste of time because I managed to catch up on some of my correspondence with my new pen that writes underwater. As a matter of fact, I had a reply to one of my letters this morning, which said, Dear Sir, in reply to your foggy mess of the 15th, <laughs> I note that you have now gone into liquidation. <laughs> Wednesday, I decided to get rid of a few items of furniture, and the second-hand dealer turned out to be a rather attractive young lady. Well, we didn't get very far, unfortunately, because, as she said... I'm sorry, Mr. Horn, but I'm afraid I can't allow anything on the couch. <laughs> However, on, on Thursday I spent a quiet day at home Working away with my knitting needles and a roll of flex I'm knitting an electric blanket <laughs> Cable stitch, of course <laughs> And I just completed a row of one pearl, two plain and three amps When, when prudence swept into the room <laughs> Sweep it out again. Oh, but, sir, I was just trying to brush it under the carpet. Well, you always do, Prudence. This is the only carpet in Kensington with a pile underneath. <laughs> you know, you know, I have to walk uphill to the piano. Now, Prudence, answer the doorbell. But it isn't ringing, sir. Now, what's your excuse? <laughs> oh, here I go again. The people that call at this house... Who is it, Burns? Well, I don't really know, sir. He looks like a cross between a Canadian Mountie and a Swiss Yodeler. He's got flags in his socks, a feather in his hat, and his tie is stuck in a serviette ring. <laughs> Madam, I'm a scout. <laughs> well, now, are you? But well, you won't find any Indians here. All right, all right, Burns. Leave this to me. Oh, good gracious, the Boy Scout. Come in, sir, won't you? Take it out. All right, chap, take the trick cart to HQ. I'll walk back. I say, uh, don't you blokes usually carry a pole around? Yes, but you know what it is these days? You can't get the staff. <laughs> 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 well, 
As you look here, my name's Peter Chisholm. All chaps call me Chisholm. I'm the uh, scout master of the seventh Kensington Gorsuch. Oh, jolly good. Come into the lab. Oh, I say, sir, what a sitting log fire. You know, the smell of wood smoke really does something to our chap. Really? Not oh, there. What? Makes us cough. <laughs> I bet it took a good few matches to get that fire going. Didn't use one. Good for you, sir. You, you rub two sticks together. No. You didn't do it with a magnifying glass in the sun, did you? No. Well, then how? I turned it on into an electric fire. <laughs> Well, those logs are just real epic. Still, a bit of a cheat, isn't it? Oh, I mean, we in scouting like to rough it a bit. Nothing like the good old simple down-to-earth, fresh, wholesome sort of life. Care for a drink? Dry martini, please. <laughs> <laughs> now, sir, the point is, we'd like you to join our mob. Me? A scout? Yes. We think you'd be a great asset to us. We've often spotted you helping old ladies across the street. Oh. Uh, and young ladies, too. Oh. <laughs> and what more, sir, we also saw you trying to give ten shillings to an old tramp on the corner. That was my bookmaker. Uh. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, perhaps you'd like to come down to our scout hut and see us in action. Oh, well, I don't mind. Tell me, how do I get there? Uh, now, this is where the practical side of scouting things into action. <laughs> According to my compass, it's uh, north or east. The wind is blowing from the south. The sun sets in the west. We are on north degrees longitude. So, allowing for a slight margin of error and taking into consideration the distance factor, I'd say that... Yes, I've got it. Well, where is it? Next door but one. <laughs> ah, this must be it. Uh, excuse me, is this the Boy Scout? No, now where the girl died. Oh, good gracious, it's a man. <laughs> that girl's back. I saw him first. Well, actually, I was looking for the count. Oh, that over there, the other side of the barbed wire. Yes. Oh, well, thank you. I'll just... Uh, no, 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 please don't run along. <laughs> oh, come in. We're just about to have a sing-song round the campfire. <laughs> That's right. Pull up a toad door. Now, girls, we're going to be entertained by Tawny Owl. Tawny Owl, to which a woo! To which a woo! Oh, I'd recognize that. To which to which to anywhere. Good heavens, it's Pat Lancaster. Hello, Ken. So, Pat, you're a girl guide this week, eh? Yes. I think the writers are trying to get me a good name. Well, you, you do your good deed for the day and sing that. It's a grand night for singing The moon is flying high And somewhere a bird who is bound to be heard Is throwing his father to It's a grand night for singing The stars are bright above Yes, is a glow, and to add to the show, I think I am falling
Jolly nice, Pat. And, and thank you, guide Captain. Not at all. Oh, do come and see us again. Yes, yes. Well, goodbye. To Whitsawoo! Now, then, the scout hunt must be this one. Oh, there's someone peering through the window at me. I think I... Look, it's a full moon. <laughs> I've never seen it this close before. <laughs> Here, Jane. Has the man in the moon got a carnation in his buttonhole? What's going on, Gibbly? I say it, Mr. Horn. Quick, let him in, someone. Ah, oh, there you are, Chisholm. Jolly decent of you to look in on us. <laughs> I say, chap, this is Kenneth Horn. We yeah, are saying you really, Kenneth Horn. <laughs> yes. Kenneth Horn is on the radio every week. Yes, that's right. In that over beyond our cave. Yes. Right. Get him, chap. <laughs> That's enough. Let him go now. Oh. You're in luck, sir. They like you. <laughs> uh, by the way, sir, this is patrol leader Jeremy Arbuthnot. How do you do? I'm the Pee Wit. <laughs> yeah. I say, would you like a glass of wine? A glass of wine? Yes, we make it ourselves. It's Chateau Neuf de Tewit. <laughs> All right, yes, I'll try some. Good. Hey, <laughs> get the grapes out. Start treading. <laughs> now, Mr. Horn, would you like white wine or red wine? Oh, I, I think red, please. Right. Paddy, <laughs> put your red socks on. <laughs> Mr. Horn, are you learning about our little tube? I certainly am. Look, um, <coughs> this uh, fellow, our bus not, he seems rather advanced. Oh, yes, well, he hasn't been with us for very long. He's typical of so many of the modern generation, you know, growing up with a chip on his shoulder. Oh, I thought that was his head. <laughs> uh, actually, there's rather an interesting story about Arbus not. You see, only a short time ago, he was a somewhat flashly dressed youth with long, greasy hair rubbing the pile off his velvet collar. Mm -hmm. He was the ringleader of all the Kensington Gaul thereabouts. Uh, they used to meet in that Welsh coffee bar, the, the two I said for them. Well, <laughs> you can just picture it all. Ah, oh, Taluna. <laughs> you are the most. Oh. Thanks, Rocky. Well, the music's not you're real cool. I love the way you just stand there and go, oh, I dig you like crazy. <laughs> Rocky, you're so poetic. Even Shakespeare never said things like that. You haven't been seeing him again. <laughs> oh, no. That was ever so long ago. How about another drink, Ted? No, no, Rocky, you've had enough. Who cares? Let's live a little. Happy, two frothy coffees. Two. Great <laughs> Two frothy coffees coming up. There you are. Oh, thanks. Well, he is mad in your eyes. <laughs> Rocky, mind where you're blowing your throat. Yeah, be a did you. <laughs> oh, you're a wild one. Mm. They'll never tame you. Oh, you're all right. I've got a devil in me tonight. Let's do something violent. What? Let's go down the dancing school in cha-cha during the Valita lesson. <laughs> Rocky, have you taken leave of your senses? You keep out of this, Packy. I'll feel strange to know it. I'm not surprised you're feeling strange. In the last hour, you've had 34 cups of coffee, 15 lemon teas, three cheese rolls, five tubs of ice cream, and a lob for mayonnaise. Leave him alone. He's all mixed up inside. <laughs> Oh, thanks, dear. I'm proud you're my girl. With your mohair sweater and your long beads. I know I can always count on you. Oh, Rocky, you're not so bad yourself. Oh. How handsome you are in your fluorescent jeans. Your sway creepers. 
And your black leather jacket with Alma Cogan stenciled on the back. Yeah, and I think my dad wants me to join the Scouts. They won't get me into that dove uniform. Oh, Tallulah, why can't I be a, a great rock and roll singer? But you could be. It's no use. <laughs> oh, I tried. Thank you turning me down. It's all because I can't snap me fingers. <laughs> Personally, I don't think they were ever ready for the first one. <laughs> look out, look out, Rocky. Here comes your father. I thought I'd find you here, you little perisher. I thought I told you to go to the scout meeting. Oh, I'm not joining no scout. So oh, you still defy me, do you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't want to have to do this to you, son, but you forced me. Tanula, thank you, other kids. Yes. I've got something to tell you about this boy. <laughs> You all know him as Rocky Steel. No, Dad, no, no, no. 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 <laughs> that is not his right name. Dad, you can't do it. Oh, yes, ah. I can. <laughs> now, listen, everyone. His real name is Jeremy Arbuthnot. <laughs> oh, Nazi God, Nazi God. Where's the medical, Jeremy? Oh, Dad, how could you? Oh, you've disgraced me in front of my mates. Oh, I'll never be able to hold up my head again. Well, goodbye to Lula. Don't you speak to me. Oh, it was fun well enough. Goodbye, all. Come along, son. The scouts is waiting. <laughs> So that's the story, eh? Yes, Mr. Horn, and once he's had a taste of this life, he completely changed. After reading Scouting for Boys, he wasn't interested in Scouting for Girls. <laughs> well, it's really remarkable. Yes, just goes to show that we can reform even the most degenerate layabout. Well, in that case, I've got some more recruits for you. A good show. Who? Well, there's Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Bill Pertwee, Paul Fennelay, James... <laughs> And from Scouts, we turn to another group who've been out scouting the songs. This week, we've tracked down one called Round Her Neck, She Wore a Golden Locket. So be prepared, it's the Fraser Hayes Fall.
So to the Kenneth Horn documentary feature, Horn of Armour. <laughs> yes, once again, Kenneth Horn and his team of investigators bring you our factual reports on topics of immediate interest. <laughs> and tonight, we present a close up on show business. Are there no people like the people in the theatre? Or are there just no people in the theatre? <laughs> well, first, let's get one or two opinions from people in show business. You, sir. Now, now what do you do? Uh, yes, well, I perform one of the most difficult feats in show business. Uh, first, I lock myself inside a glass case, and uh, my assistant fills the case with gas. Uh, and then I strike two matches. Yes. Yeah. What's so difficult about that? Striking the second match. <laughs> And finally, let's have a word with a film actor. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Now, <laughs> what was your best role? Well, my favorite part was in the Barrett of Wimpole Street. That marvelous scene where I had to chase the parlor maid upstairs. Oh, I, I don't remember that scene. Well, the center cut it out. <laughs> Why was that? I caught her. <laughs> Let's now turn to another aspect of show business, the relationship of performer and audience. And naturally, every artist thrives on the warmth and applause of those who he seeks to entertain. How disheartening, then, when the efforts of a gifted company are greeted with indifference. Justin, I've never seen such a terrible display in all my life. Here in world, throw some of these. Oh, rotten tomatoes. What a good idea. Here, take that. Good shot, Andrew. Right on the nose. Give us another one. Oh, you yeah. rotten lot. Take that. And uh, yeah, where are those eggs? They've thrown them all. Oh. I've only got the cabbage left. Oh, that'll do. Now, watch this. There. Yeah. That'll teach him for being such a rotten audience. From the serious theatre, we now consider the variety stage, and of the many different kinds of variety acts, one that always fascinates us is the magician. And one of the most mystifying tricks in the magician's bag has always been sawing a woman in half. Now, what's the secret of this illusion? We sent our commentator, Cecil Smith, to investigate. Well, listeners, I'm speaking to you from the stage of the Croyne Theatre, having volunteered to assist the great Colvini in his world-famous trick of sawing someone in half. And that is his signal for the famous box we brought on. Uh, this is an exciting moment. Of course, although I, I know that in the hands of the great Colvini, nothing can go wrong. Why, in a box, Mike! <laughs> well, that was the great Colvini himself. <laughs> Now, listeners, I'm getting into the box. It's, uh, it's very quite comfortable. And uh, we're just closing it down. Not the theatre, the box. <laughs> <laughs> now, the magician has taken a saw in his hand and is about to begin this amazing illusion. In a few moments, I hope to be telling you exactly how it's done. <laughs> Good old Cecil Smith, still doing things by heart. Well, now, <laughs> one of the most disturbing features of show business today is the fact that so many variety theatres being closed down to make way for blocks of offices. We wonder, however, whether the spirit of the theatre still lingers on in these premises. Take, for instance, the case of Hodgkinson and Butler Limited, whose new office was once the old Empire Theatre. Let's join them at one of their shareholders' meetings. Hello, shareholders. How do? Well, we're ready with another spot of only fun from the boardroom. And first, here's a report on the company affairs given to us by the share gazers. There's no business. And for a further comment... <laughs> Let's listen now to the sales manager and his assistant. 
No sails in the sunset. No sails in the north. We're beginning to wish that. Classic by the substitute industrial press moldings had never been born. And now the moment you've been waiting for. Direct from his unsuccessful tour of the bank. <laughs> Our chairman, Sir Henry Toby Judge Hodgkinson. <laughs> Music, we've heard it before, right? Well, I won't take the cigar out of the mouth, I'm not stopping. <laughs> I was just coming here today, a fella came up to me, a shareholder he was. He said, I want to know how we stand. I said, I don't know, it's a miracle. <laughs> That's it, lady, loosen them up. But seriously, though. <laughs> but seriously, though, boys and girls, I'm going to ask you out all join me in singing the comedy song. All together now. Oh, we ain't got a barrel of money. Maybe we're ragging and fighting, but we travel along, singing our song. Bye, bye, bye. This is Kenneth Horne saying goodbye for now and leaving you with this thought. When a garage attendant goes dancing, does he wear petrol pumps? Good night. <laughs> you have either been listening to All of Just Myths, Beyond Our Ken, a sort of recorded radio show which gave employment to Kenneth Horne, and also to Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Betty Marsden, Bill Pertwee, Patricia Lancaster, the Fraser Hayes Four, and the BBC Variety Orchestra conducted by Paul Federle. The script, believe it or not, was written, and letters of complaint should be sent to Eric Merriman and Barry Chook. However, the onus must inevitably fall on our producer, Jake Brown. <laughs> Sophia Crockett, the Maudlin Goddard Shovehead team, 
Mr. J. Nolan Friends and Friends. Miss Kitty Bonbon. Oh, I bet she's a cracker. <laughs> to continue, Bernie King, Siegfried von Hausenblatt, Mary Jewel Lumley, and of course, Mr. Kenneth Horn, who prefers to remain anonymous. Ladies and gentlemen, Kenneth Horn. <laughs> Oh, good evening. Welcome to Beyond Our Ken, the show where you start laughing at the very first joke and don't stop until the second. Well, now, as usual, I've had a hectic week. On Monday, the air ministry told me they were having a big RAF march pass, and they asked me to lead the parade. Apparently, the goat was sick. <laughs> However, I couldn't go because I'd already arranged a visit to Hull. It was the BBC's idea, actually. They said to me, Horn, why don't you go to Hull? And... <laughs> So I did. I visited one factory out there, and I had a special escort of two motorcycles all the way through the town. It created quite an impression, but, oh, you know, one feels a bit embarrassed running along between two motorcycles. <laughs> On Wednesday, I eventually decided to sack my secretary. For, for a long time, I'd noticed that she was going home earlier and earlier, so finally, I just had to say to her, look, uh, don't you know when it's time to stop? And she said, of course, when we hear someone coming. So, so you see, she had to go And on Thursday, my wife insisted on choosing my new secretary Very nice chap, too, he was <laughs> Nevertheless, on Friday Friday, well, it was quite a day Prudence had gone to the pictures And when I went to make the tea I discovered there was no water So naturally, I sent for the plumber <laughs> Ah, then, yeah, now you must be the plumber. I have that honor, yes. Uh, the name's Arthur Figley, and this is my son, Edward. Oh, yes. Well, come in, won't you? Thank you. Our card. Now, what's this? Arthur Figley and son builders, decorators, plumbers, electrical engineers, and flower arrangements. Mm. Flower arrangements? That is correct. Edward here, he's known as the constant spry of Ladbrook Grove. <laughs> Let's go, Edward. Yes, that's right, sir. I won first prize for my floral clock. Well, I thought he looked a bit seedy. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, but you should see him in July. He's a proper picture. I, I believe you wanted to see us, though, a professional yes, 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 yes. I yes, mean, you yes. Yes. Quite, I, I'm afraid I've got no water. Oh, well, we'll have to have it neat. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> no, you look, you don't understand. I mean, there's no water coming through the tent. Ah, well, I've been having a look at him. Uh, let's just turn the tap on and make sure. Well, there you are. Just a couple of drips. Oh, thank you. Not be personal. <laughs> now then, I'll just get these floorboards up and check on the main water supply. <laughs> what are you doing, Figley? The main water pipes aren't under the floorboards? Now he tells me. <laughs> Hello, what's this? Mr. Orn? Do you come here a minute? Yes, what's the trouble? Just put your finger down here. You mean here? Oh! As I thought, a short circuit. <laughs> Edward, just unravel these wires while I go upstairs. Okay, Dad. I'll come with you. Right. Nice place you've got here. Lovely pictures on the wall. And... Oh, I must just stop and admire this. Bigly, you're looking in the mirror. I know. <laughs> oh, handsome devil and I. Come on, Bigly, now. Here's the trap door to the loft. Right. Give us a leg oh, out. Okay. Oh. Are you all right? Uh, uh, well, it's a trifle dark. You'll find the tank up there somewhere. <laughs> Don't worry, sir. I found it. <laughs> What 
you doing in the bar? I didn't get out of the tank fast enough. <laughs> anyway, pick a my too. Oh, come on, get out of that. Oh, here's a towel. I'm going down to see what your son's up to. Well, there you are, sir. He's all back to normal. Right, well, I'll try the cold water tap. What on earth have you done? I don't know, Mr. Warren, but if I was you, I wouldn't turn the radio on or you'll flood the place. <laughs> Bigley, Bigley, here. Oh, no, no, it's what's up now. Well, it's possible. It's disgraceful. Just listen to this. I'll turn the tap on. Well, I suppose some people like it. Yes, but, uh, but... <laughs> so we come to the end of today's over 60 class. Nice time for songs for swinging plumbers. And here is your resident vocalist. Good afternoon. Good heavens, it's Pat Lancaster. <laughs> oh, well, I suppose it's quite a nice idea to have Pat Lancaster on tap. Make me laugh, make me grin, make me keep the mood that I'm in. Make me laugh. Have a try Make me laugh so hard that I cry Make me glow Make me smile Make me feel that life is worthwhile I could never stand peace and quiet Put that laughter back in my diet And honey, don't be an angry young man I want to be happy as long as I can So don't go taking the mickey going to do? There's only one thing you can do, sir. You better get a license for that tax. Good afternoon. Oh, dear. I suppose I'll have to get on to the waterworks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they've arrived, too. Prudence, Prudence, whatever's the matter? Oh, sir. It was a film, sir. <laughs> it was lovely. Yes. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. There, Prudence. Come now and sit down. Tell me all about it, if you think it will help. Oh, well, sir, it was called A Woman in Curlers. Got your anchor ready? Yes. Good. Well, you see, there was this woman, and she was losing her husband's affection because she'd been letting herself go. Every morning it was the same. He'd come down to breakfast. <laughs> Smart breakfast. Oh, where is it in the coal cover? <laughs> What's this? Underdone bacon, burnt toast, broken egg, and a cup of hot water. Things are looking up. Oh, thank you, Ted. I made a special effort this morning. Why? Don't you remember? It's our anniversary. Oh, is it? Honestly, Frida, look at this place. Call it home. Dirty crocks on the piano, weeks washing on the picture rail. No bicycle in the armchair. <laughs> and look at that old junk heap in the corner. Hey, that's no way to speak of our lodger. Oh, sorry, Perth. Oh, what was it, Ted? Oh, it's a Pilkington. You've grown a dear. No, I haven't. It's your cat. <laughs> Call him off, will you? I've stuffed him in my pipe twice. <laughs> Here's another thing. 
That perishing cat of yours, you scruffy old thing. No, it's not, because black cats are lucky. Yes, but he was white when we bought him. <laughs> I tell you, Reed, I, I, I can't live in this hole much longer. Look at you. Woman I'm married. Flopping around in that filthy old dressing gown with your hair in curlers, still wearing last week's makeup. Oh, Ted, thank you. Who are you thanking me for? Well, Mr. Pilkington, a woman likes to be noticed. Well, I'm off. Goodbye, all. Here, Ted. What is it? Well, you know that Mr. Argley's next door. He always kisses his wife goodbye every morning. Oh, I wish you would. Don't be daft. I hardly know the woman. <laughs> By the way, I shan't be home tonight. Working late. What, again? Every night for the past six months you've been out at night? Working like you say. But let me tell you, Ted Ogmore, a woman has an intuition about these things. It's getting more difficult to believe that you're really working late. What makes you say that? You're unemployed. <laughs> oh. Is that all? One horrible moment, I thought you'd found out about Phyllis. <laughs> or by all. Oh, 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 that's it. My husband and another woman. What shall I do, Mr. Pilkinson? Well, uh, I shall find out who the other woman is and go and speak to her. No, I know what I'll do. I've made up my mind. I'm going straight down to the Citizens' Vice Bureau. <laughs> And uh, so if you take my advice, you'll, you'll find a good man, marry him, and settle down. Gee, that's swell. Thanks a lot. Not at all. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> next, 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 please. No, yes. My name's Mrs. Ogmore. Yes, well, you could change it by default, couldn't you? <laughs> And is that what you've come to see me about? Oh, no, no. It's, it's about my husband. Well, now, just a minute. Before we begin, tell me, do you always wear a dressing gown? Yes. Well, it's good enough for Noel Coward. It's good enough for me. <laughs> well, now, what is your problem? You see, my husband. My husband, he doesn't find me glamorous anymore. And he's gone off with another woman. What can I do? Well, I'm simple. You must make yourself attractive again. So, I tell you what. Go to a beauty parlor. Have a... Thorough beauty treatment. Get your hair done in a new style. Have a manicure, a new cord for your dressing gown. <laughs> yes, make yourself a wonderful, glamorous person, like a film star. And when your husband comes home tonight, think of the surprise he'll... Freedom, out! Free! Where are you? Who are you? It's me, Ted. Me. Darling, what have you done to yourself? It's for you, Ted. I wanted to make myself look like a film star. Yes, but you're Brunner. <laughs> Work. Well, then, there's only one other thing you can do. Make him jealous. Let him see you with another man. But I don't know any other man except the milk... That's it. The milkman. Good idea. Good idea. Leave him a note. Oh, I hope it works. Morning. Is a milkman... I got you on note. Yeah, now don't muck about. <laughs> what do you want to see me for? Well, Milkman, I want you to make love to me. Oh. <laughs> You've been having too much yogurt lately. <laughs> now, listen. Listen. My husband will be home at any minute. Put your arms down, me. Well, I'm here. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot to put the bottles down. <laughs> there, that's better, that's better. Now, when he comes in, I want you to kiss me. But I'm halfway through my milk round. Oh, no, please, please. I want to make my husband jealous. Well, what about my horse? No, he wouldn't be jealous of him. Quick, quick, 
Yes, here he comes. Act passionate. Freedom, I don't... Mm. Oh, my darling. Even though I'm only an half-pint, my love... My love for you is great, eh? Oh, let me hold you to my jersey and run my fingers through your gold top. You're the cream in my coffee. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, Milkman. You're very cooperative this morning. (laughs) Now then, put my wife down and get out. All right. I'm going. Yes, go. Never leave milk on my doorstep again. I lose more customers this way. Ted, Ted, I do believe you're jealous. Of course I'm jealous. Oh, Freed, I've been a fool. Oh. I was weak, but I realise now that a man shouldn't stop loving his wife just because she'd like to live in filthy, dirty squalor. <laughs> oh, Ted, that's the nicest thing you ever said to me. Freed, Freed, things are going to be different from now on. We're going to get away from this place. I've, I've got a job. You haven't! Yeah. <laughs> It's a job for both of us. It'll be a whole new life we're going to live in as caretakers. Oh, Ted, where? The Institute of IG. <laughs> and now it's time once again to meet our vocal and instrumental group whose latest record has just gone straight to the top of the Brixton rubbish dump. This week they've been out hunting for songs and eventually they ran to earth one called Jaquen John Seal. So, yoik, tell me hell, it's the Fraser Hayes Hall. Getting the message. 
Well, first, let's have a brief look at the history of communication. The first important method of communication over long distances was the runner, who sometimes had to travel many hundreds of miles to deliver his message. My lord, I bring a message from the great Atticus, 300 leagues of Iran, over the Iconicus, down the plains of Olympus, through the snowy wastes of Sabina, and across the arid deserts of the Xerxes, and it swim the boiling waters of the Helles Pond. And what message do you bring from my lord, Atticus? He wants to have you to spare half a cup of sugar. <laughs> However, communications were improved considerably with the introduction of postal services. At first, the mail was sent by stagecoach. And tonight, we have with us one of the original coachmen, Mr. Arthur Tantip. Good evening. Now, would you, sir, uh, like to tell us about your life on the mail coach? Yes. It was a hard and dangerous life. Carrying all those valuables on the London to York Road. I remember the last time I done that run. We was held up by highwaymen. Oh, well, when was that? Yesterday. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Santivy. We'll have a, a whip round later. <laughs> yes, the postal service has gradually expanded, and today it's a vast and complicated organization. The stagecoach has, of course, been replaced by the express train. Over now to Chiddingfold Station for a report from Cecil Snape. When I'm standing now on the far end of this platform at Chiddingfold Station, the express is due at any moment, so let me tell you exactly how the mail is collected. I am standing by a long steel arm on which is hung a large mail bag. And as the train goes through the station at something like 60 miles an hour, a steel-framed net swings from the train, scoops up the mail bag, and drops it into the sorting office aboard the train. Well, I, I think I can hear the express coming now. Yes, it's a fascinating operation for those who haven't seen it. And it won't be long now before I can describe the action <laughs> from a pigeonhole on the flying spot returning in the studio. Poor old Cecil, he's been posted. <laughs> well now, of all the modern methods of communication, the one most widely used is radio. What a thrilling moment, that very first discovery of the wireless. Anger. Yes, yes. You really shouldn't work so hard, oh, dear. No, 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 no. You'll kill yourself at the rate you're going. Look at you, all worn and haggard. You can talk. <laughs> anyway, it's worth it. This will be the greatest invention of them all. I, I shall call it the wireless. And, uh, dear, you've been working like this for years now. Oh, I must go on. Oh, Don't you understand? I feel I'm nearly there. If only I could just discover the secret of the thermionic valve. And, well, darling, you uh, must relax uh, for a little while. Uh, Why don't you uh, sit down with me and watch the television? <laughs> Yes, radio plays many parts in this modern age. For instance, in the fight against crime, high-powered police cars patrol our roads, controlled from headquarters by the latest electronic equipment. Calling car 32. Calling car 32. Come in, car 32. Your time is up. <laughs> well, not only on the ground, but also in the air, radio serves mankind. Consider now the vital contact between pilot and airfield control. Hello, Arthur Rodney. Arthur Rodney, are you receiving me? Over. Hello, Peter Charles. <laughs> receiving you loud and clear. Over. Hello, Arthur. Now, listen carefully. My undercarriage is jammed, my petrol gauge is resident zero, and my joystick is terribly wobbly. Over. <laughs> Hello, Charles. You are in a pickle, aren't you? <laughs> Over. Yes, I am. Can you help me? Yes, of course, that's what we're here for. You'll have to give me your position. I repeat, Steve Charlie, what is your position? Charles, can you hear me? Charles, where are you? I mean, Miss Hannah. (laughs) 
Finally, let's turn to a more domestic form of communication, the telephone. Just recently in Great Britain, the post office has instructed its telephone operators to show politeness, courtesy, and above all, friendliness to subscribers. Hello, sir. I'd like to tell you your number. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Perkins, you're not in casting. Perkins, yes. Perkins, this is J.G. You stupid, blundering, blaring idiot. Where are my lips? Flanges. They're not ready. We didn't promise delivery until the 25th. I don't want to hear your asinine excuses, you fat fool. No, 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 gentlemen. That's no way to talk to each other. Well, the devil's there. Ah, shouting myself. I want my lip flanges. <laughs> Later. 
However, on Friday, I was driving to the BBC when my car developed a mechanical defect. So naturally, I drove into the nearest garage. <laughs> Good morning. I, I wonder if you could help me. Yes, certainly, sir. The scrap metal yard is in the next street. <laughs> Don't be rude about my car. I just want a little attention, that's all. Well, I'm afraid I'm not familiar with that model. I've only been in the trade since 1927. <laughs> I'd better call the governor. Uh, Mr. Larksmore. Come in, Charlie. Now then, what is the bit Hello? Here, Charlie, nip inside and ring the police. <laughs> that car's been stolen from the Victorian Albert Museum. <laughs> No, it hasn't. There it is. An old crook. Close the car. <laughs> Morning, sir. You're a bit off course, aren't you? The others will be in Brighton by now. I'm not on the London to Brighton run now, then. You kindly find out what's wrong with it. I think it's something to do with the clutch. Every time I change gear, the chain flies off the racket. <laughs> All right, Charlie, let's have a bonnet up. Larksmore. Just look at the engine. I bet that burns a lot of coke. <laughs> Hello, what's this? You've got a leak in your radiator. A leak? Oh, yes, I know. I was touring Wales the other week. They gave it me as a souvenir. <laughs> hey, just a minute. I think I found something. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes, there's a fault here in the ignition system. And what is it? The candle's gone out. <laughs> What did you say? Oh, I said this. Quiet, you fool. We're not here for our help. Well, sir, I'm afraid this is rather serious. There's definite signs of a major deterioration in the suction intake output, causing severe reverberation in the crankshaft casing. Oh, what does all that mean? About 50 pounds. <laughs> 50 pounds? I've been offered that for the car. Well, I'm afraid that's our price, sir. Look, sir, I'll tell you what I'll do. For the same money, I'll trim the wicks on your headlamp and give you a free 900,000 mile service. No. Mr. Larkmore... Could I make a suggestion? If it's an expensive one, yes. Well, I was going to suggest the gentleman might buy a new car. Sure. This is your finest hour. You've justified all my faith in you. I knew I did the right thing when I stood bail for you. <laughs> Charlie boy, pop and get a couple of brochures for the gentleman. Oh, yeah. Right on, Mr. Lump. All right. Look, look, I don't want a new car. This one's perfectly sound. Begging your pardon, and with all due respect, but... If you were to give that car a good kick like so... Well, the old thing will fall to pieces. <laughs> Hasn't it? <laughs> well, well. Yes, you know, that doesn't prove anything. I mean, look at this new super deluxe car. If I gave this a good kick... Like so. <laughs> you see, sir? <laughs> oh, just a lucky kick, sir. <laughs> Probably a faulty one, but you just try and do the same to one of these others. All right. to every model we've got in stock. Just look at the debris. <laughs> oh, Mr. Larkmore, I've, I've got the brooches. Uh, Lummy. Have you had a lady driver in here? <laughs> Charlie, you any good at jigsaws? Well, I think I'd better be getting along now. I'll pick up my car later. <laughs> No taxes, no buses in sight. Like a lift in? Good heavens, it's Pat Lancaster. <laughs> What's a coincidence? Where are you going? I'm going to the BBC. Well, there's another coincidence, so am I. Well, jump in. Well, that's a fact. I've 
just been rehearsing my number in the car. In the car? What about the orchestra? Well, it's got a very large boot. <laughs> like to hear it now? Well, this show is full of coincidences. Sing, Pat. Isn't this morning one wonderful morning? It's just like a morning in May. And yes, I see. I won't want to love today. Look at that sunshine, that wonderful sunshine. Just what makes the sunshine that way? Who knows? Who cares? I won't fall in love today. Only yesterday I was pure and bolder than most. Yesterday I matured. Wonderfully grown up, but more I feel grown up today. Who cares? Who cares? I won't fall in love today. Only yesterday I was pure and bolder than most. Yet today I'm mature and colder than yesterday's soul. I feel so grown up, so wonderfully grown up. Well, I thought they might train him to do 
do the housework. Well, you know what they say, a new broom sweeps clean. <laughs> you just get that animated art rug out of there. We're overcrowded as it is. What with the children, the actors, and that old walrus in the corner. That's Uncle Ted. <laughs> well, it's about time you went. We can't turn him out just because he's getting a bit long in the tooth. But he never moved from that spot. Anybody'd think he was frozen to it. He probably is. <laughs> anyway, if anyone's going, it's all good to... Look at him. <coughs> you leave him alone. Leave him alone. He's my seal of merit. <laughs> yes, he was. He was given to me by the Institute of Good Igloo Keeping. They said I had the best pop rose in Greenland. Hello? Who's that coming this hour of the year? Oh, well, that'll be Rosemary's boyfriend, that nice young Mountie. Oh, they call him, yeah. <laughs> Rosemary? Yes, Mark? Nelson's here. Nelson, she won't be a minute. Hello, Mr. and Mrs. Nanook. It's a nice little igloo you've got here. Yes. Ours is an ice house, ours is. Oh, <laughs> yeah. well, all right, Nelson, take your polar ice cap off and make yourself at home. Yes, uh, have a good journey. No, here. Yeah. What do you think? What? Well, I got the dog team on this up, and when I said, gee up, they just laughed in his face. <laughs> You should have said mush. Oh, right, they laughed at me mush. <laughs> Hello, Nelson. Oh, Rosemary, I love you. Come, let me put my arm around your Arctic waist. <laughs> Give us a kiss. Oh, you're no cold. <laughs> well, Nelson, dear, how have you been and the truth, I ain't been too good. Oh, well. I went to Dr. Iceberg about it, and you know, I've got one of the rarest complaints in the Arctic Circle. Oh, but it's painful for you. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it's not messing about. <laughs> he, he told me he'd never come across it before. Oh, Nelson, whatever is it? Prickly ink. No, here. Come on. Rosemary, what do we do? Let's go up to the west end of the ice floe and watch the northern lights. That's mm. right, Rosemary. Show him the aurora borealis. Oh, I can hardly wait. <laughs> There you are, dear. Going fishing? No, I'm going down to the whale at anchor. We've got a dance match on. Bye, Jan. Oh, by the way, bring some candles home with you tonight. Okay. We've got nothing for supper. <laughs> oh, well, I must get on with your glue work. Oh, well, that's got the bed, mate. Now, I'd better just... Good morning, uh, Mrs. Nanook. Yes. Of 23 Glacier Avenue, Icebridge. That's right. Well, I am from the news of the Eskimo world. Oh. Oh. Oh, oh, sit down, won't you? Uh, uh, like a cup of blubber and a pemmican sandwich. Oh, no, thank you. Well, Mrs. Nanook, it's my pleasant duty to tell you that you've won first prize in our Guess How Much of the Iceberg is Underwater contest. Oh. Oh, that really? Yes, yes. Oh, oh what is the prize? Well, well, it's something that no heart life to be without. I therefore have pleasure in presenting you with this. Oh. Oh, I say. Oh, what is, what is it? A refrigerator. <laughs> Now here are four other people who were once asked to do their act on ice, but it fell through. Anyhow, I'm sure that uh, so that you'll melt too when you hear the Fraser Hayes Ball. i 
one and four, so we have a deuce of a time sometimes. Yes. Well, tell us something about your career. Certainly. Well, after when I was eight years old, the painter used to play tennis with me every day. And why did he stop playing with you when you were eight? I don't know. He probably thought it would be easier to use a racket. <laughs> ah, I see, but that, uh... <laughs> Didn't that uh, deter you? Oh, no. No, no, no. Good gracious, no. <laughs> Oh, I do. It took me off a bit. Anyway, Mr. Van Gogh, one last question. How do you think you'll do in this year's championship? Well, I think I can safely say I shall positively terrify my competitors with my very unusual forehand to drive. So what's so unusual about it? I use all forehand. <laughs> Thank you, and good luck to the Sandport. Well, now, rare though it may be, if we do get a really hot summer, one thing you can be sure of, the national press will be full of stories of pavement hot enough to fry eggs on. But has it ever actually been done? We sent Cecil Snape to find out. Oh, well, listeners, I'm standing now in German Street in London's fashionable clubland. Sun is beating down from a cloudless sky, providing absolutely ideal frying conditions. <laughs> I'm now going to break the egg onto the pavement. Uh, now, not only am I frying an egg, but I've also brought along some rashes of bacon, a sausage, and a rather nice piece of lefar. Quite a little feast. Oh. But it seems to be working. They're all cooking nicely on the pavement, and the smell is delicious. In fact, I'm really looking forward to... Uh, excuse me, sir, but what exactly is going on here? Oh, hello, Constable. I, I, I'm just cooking a little... Yes, so I see. Uh, what do you think this is, an open-air cafeteria? <laughs> now, come on, come on, my lad, you're coming with me. Oh, just a minute, you don't understand. I'm from the BBC. Yes, we've heard all that before. Better. Now, come on, into the van. This is Cecil Snape from behind a mixed grill in Bow Street. <laughs> Thank you, Cecil Snow, for that guide on eating out in London. To most people, however, the summer means the seaside, and at any of our popular coastal resorts, the visitor can always find his treasures on the seafront. Any more for a skylark? Any more for a skylark? I say, excuse me, miss, but don't you mean any more for these skylarks? I know what I mean. <laughs> When you're finished, how about coming with me to the petting green? Surely you mean putting green. I know what I mean. <laughs> or, on the other hand, many people nowadays find considerable enjoyment in taking out one of those little pedal boats for the afternoon. Ambrose. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Cool, this is our service tea. Mm. Just drifting along mm. aimlessly from way to way. Uh, shut up and pedal. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ambrose. But I'm getting rather tired. Oh, what's the matter with you? We've only been out for six hours. Look, Ambrose. There's another of those big. Oh, I do wish I wouldn't come so close. Oh, get out of it. Is there a right of way? Yes. Oh, 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 I'm broke. Oh. I'm getting frightened. Let's go in now, dear. Oh, fine, Daly, you are. Oh, really? oh I just spoiled it. I'm sorry. Oh, I was really enjoying it. Lying back here under the parasol with me hand trailing in the cool water. Never mind, it's always tomorrow. Oh, look, look, Andrew. There's the man on the beach waving to us. All yes. right, mister, we're yes. coming in. Yes. We know our time's up. That's right. Come on, 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 Tennis on saying goodbye for now and leaving you with this thought. Does a tongue twister get your tang all tangled up? 
Martin. Good guy. You might have been listening to one of Gus Smith's Beyond Our Ken, a sort of recorded radio show which gave employment to Kenneth Horne and also to Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Betty Marsden, Bill Pertwee, Patricia Lancaster, the Fraser Hayes Four, and the BBC Variety Orchestra, conducted by Paul Fennelly. The script, believe it or not, was written, and letters of complaint should be sent to Eric Merriman and Barry Took. However, the onus must inevitably fall on our producer, Jake Brown. <laughs> Well, Bert, our own little place at last. Yes, we was lucky to get a new house on the estate. Funny, it only seems like yesterday when we first put our names down for one. These 14 years have passed very quickly, though. <laughs> oh, don't you just love this room? Yes, very tasteful. Nice dark brown paint and floral decor. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of the sweet tea, sweet? Lovely, darling. Oh, I can see we're going to be really cosy in here. I can just picture us sitting together on a cold winter's evening in front of a nice roaring... Hello. Here, eh? Yes, sir. You noticed anything wrong? No, what? They forgot the fire plate. <laughs> Don't worry about that. They're delivering it tomorrow. And what's more, Bert, it's a brand new model. Yes, it is, you know, the very latest thing. It is? Yes. Well, I can hardly wait to see this wonderful new fart plate. That is an excerpt from Great Expectation. <laughs> the last of the books we recommend you to read during the next half hour, and perhaps the most contrived. <laughs> Meanwhile, for those who can't read, here is a sort of radio show which is beyond our ken. Among those taking part are leaf flight expert Ernie Tutt, Millicent Craneworthy, Perrin Quinn Albright, scrap merchant, Lady Agnes Amelia Fitzcuntington Sauceburn. Oh, what a handle. <laughs> to continue, Ram Golightly, the singing strings of the tennis racket manufacturers, Carlton Scroop, and, of course, Mr. Kenneth Horne, who prefers to remain anonymous. Ladies and gentlemen, Kenneth Horne. Thank you, thank you. And I think you ought to know that our announcer of the series was Douglas Smith. And if you, if you want to know what he looks like, well, you can see his picture on the cover of this week's issue of the, uh, the Police Gazette. <laughs> well, it's nice to know I'm wanted. <laughs> Thank you, and goodbye, Douglas Smith. Well, yes, here we are, the last program in the present series. <laughs> yes, thank you. Well, I'm not laughing. I've seen the script. <laughs> Actually, I really ought to say something about our two script writers, but I, I'm afraid I'm at a loss for words. How about degenerate? Deplorable. <laughs> Decadent, revolting, nauseating, pitiable, repulsive, insufferable, odious, and old. Oh, come now, it's not fair. They're not old. <laughs> well, I feel we should also pay tribute here to the Variety Orchestra. I know I've said some rather unkind things about them, so I'd like to, to make amends now and give them a little present. It's something I know they haven't got. A tuning fork. <laughs> Well, now, a much neglected member of our team is the sound effects man. Really efficient chap who opens a lot of doors for us. So, so give us thought every time you hear this. Every time you hear this. I can't, it's stuck! <laughs> well, fire a gun, then. Oh, I forgot to bring it. Oh, never mind. Now, what was I saying? Oh, it's a really efficient... Uh, well, yes. Now, let's turn to our, our musical advisor, Eddie Brayton, who... Not only has been responsible for some very nice arrangements, also made some very excellent records. The best of which was from here to the pub in ten seconds flat. <laughs> I would also like to. <laughs> yes. I've got the gun now. Oh, good. Well, give it to me, will you? <laughs> well, nobody is indispensable. <laughs> Oh, 
Well, uh, naturally, when a show like this is on the air, it prompts a lot of letters. So let's examine our correspondence more closely and take a look at the Beyond Our Ken postbag. And the first letter picked at random after six months' intensive research reads... Dear Kenneth Hall, I always listen to your show, and one of the things I really enjoy is your list of names at the beginning. They always give me a good laugh, and honestly, I don't know how you think of such funny names. Yours truly, Mrs. Begonia Gratchley Hopkirk. <laughs> oh. Well, here's another one, all the way from Scotland. Dear Mr. Horton, I'm just writing to say that if the standard of your show does not improve... I won't bother to go next door and listen. <laughs> that's, uh, that's signed Angus McTusser Press. <laughs> I must introduce him to Begonia Gretchen Hopkirk one day. It'd be rather fun. Now, here's another letter which comes from uh, Mr. Herbert Peasmore. Uh, dear Kenneth Hall, this morning on the way to work, the chain come off my bike, and I come a pearl on the tarmac. At lunchtime, I discovered to my horror that I had inadvertently mislaid my sandwiches. It was cottage cheese day, too. <laughs> In the afternoon, my fountain pen developed a leak and left ink all over my zip dry braces. Coming home on the bus in the evening, you'll remember that my bicycle caught out of commission, a big fat man trod right on my foot, scarring my Italian brogues and bruising my big toe. I'm sitting at home now and have just heard your show. Have you ever had one of those days when nothing seems to go right? <laughs> And passing on, we come to another letter. Oh, this one's perfume. Darling, it seems so long since we last met. Yes, yes, well, I, 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 I don't... I don't quite know. I don't know how that one got in, I'm sure. Let's find another one. Of course, one or two listeners have even sought our advice on their little personal worries. Dear Mr. Horn, I'm a young man on the threshold of life. I've saved up a... <laughs> Well, it's worth trying, you know, really. <laughs> Say it again, Bill. <laughs> Dear Mr. Horn, I'm a young man on the threshold of life. I've saved up a fair sum of money, but I'm not sure whether to get married or open up a garage. What do you suggest? Well, I should open up a garage. You can always back out of that. <laughs> Dear Mr. Horn, I have a problem. I blush very easily. Every time I sit down to think I blush... What should I do? Think about something else. <laughs> Who's next? Dear Mr. Horn, my husband was home very late last night, and when I looked in his car this morning, I found half a bottle of gin and half a bottle of vermouth. What do you make of that? Dry martinis, you say. <laughs> and here's a rather pathetic letter. Yeah, Mr. Horn. Oh, uh, yeah, me to five years, please. And this is my problem. I'm always chasing a girl. And the trouble is, I can't remember why. <laughs> well, that brings us to the end of our post bag. And just, just a minute, Ken. There's something I've been trying to find out about Kenneth Williams. What is it? That's what I've been trying to find out. <laughs> Oh, Ken. Yes. We decided to give you something. Something we know you'll appreciate. Oh, it's very kind of you. Well, what is it? Well, it's... it's... <laughs> Good heavens, it's Pat Lancaster. Hello, Ken. Hello, Pat. Is this true, really? No. The boys were pulling your leg. Oh, no. Hmm. But as this is the last show, I'd like to do my song especially for you. Well, what's it called? Thou swell, thou witty, thou sweet, thou grand, would kiss me pretty, would hold my hand, both thine eyes are cute too, but they do to me, hear me holler, I choose a sweet lollipalooza in sea, I feel so rich, ah, uh, and for two, two rooms and kitchens, I'm sure would do. Give me just a plot of, not a lot of land. And thou swell, thou witty, thou grand. Ah, for two. 
jolly nice time. Thank you very much. By the way, what are you going to do now the show is over? Well, first, I'm going to take a holiday. Uh -huh. I'm going to Ireland. Well, bring me back a stick of shamrock, will you? And watch out for the leprechaun. Oh, Ken, you don't believe in them, do you? Well, I didn't. But then I saw a film called Seamus Tool and the Wee Folk. <laughs> Shall I tell you about it? All right. Well, I'm glad you said that. Well, it's all about the little village of Ballynus. <laughs> it was a typical Irish village of post office, a general store, and 18 pubs. <laughs> Our story starts in one of Of the tune. Here's an old traditional song called You Can Look in the Heart of a Shamrock, but you won't find Flanagan there. <laughs> oh, no fucking shame. A few more cheers for the eyes of me potatoes. Sure, and you deserve a pat on the back. Oh, pat, get off me back. <laughs> now then, Pat, tell us one of your little poems. All right. There was a young woman of Elen. Quite enough of that, Peter. <laughs> Sure, he's always coming up with them terrible poems. Well, what to expect? He's a Limerick man. Listen, you tell us one of your stories about the little people. Oh, well, wait a minute now. I can't tell you the story on an empty glass. What do you have, Scotch? <laughs> You're a traitor. Give him a glass of stout. Well, now, if he wants to see the little people, go up to the top of the mountain at night, and when the moon breaks through the clouds, you can see them. Oh, that's all moonshine. It is not, I'm telling you. <laughs> the wee folk live at the bottom of the big well. There they spend their time drinking and talking and laughing and never a stroke of work to don't, do. Don't tell me they've been nationalized. <laughs> the last time I was there, I met the king of the leprechauns himself, King O'Fred. <laughs> what is the look like? Well, what with his red hair, his yellow waistcoat and his green shoes, he looks just like a traffic light. <laughs> And he says to me, Seamus, he says, tis three wishes I'll be after grafting you. My first wish was for Bridget. Oh, little Bridget O'Leary. No, Bridget Vato. Oh. <laughs> and did he grant it? He did that, that he did, he did. <laughs> Twas lovely she looked. I couldn't help wishing I was ten years younger. So bang went the second wish. <laughs> What was your third wish? It was for the crock of gold. <laughs> and then the king tricked me into a fourth wish. Oh, that means you lose the other three. It does that. You see, I wished for the same all over again. Oh, then it was your own fault. It was. But what can you expect? I'm a Dublin man. <laughs> I don't believe a word of that. It's true, true, it is, it's true. Father, Father, come quickly, something terrible's happened. Well, what is it, Kathleen? It's the Lord of the Manor, Lord Sean Horn of Valley Newton. <laughs> He's brought in a new man to look after the estate. Father, we've been thrown out of our own home. Oh, don't worry, you pretty little head. I'll talk him out of it. Come, I'll take you home again, Kathleen. <laughs> So there you are, O'Toole, too, drinking again. Thank you kindly, sir. Drop a whiskey. <laughs> That's the trouble with this village. Everybody drinks too much. Look at the state of this estate. And the manor house is a disgrace. Pigs in the drawing room, chickens in the dining room. What's that in the smoking room? Smoke, sir. Good heavens, it's not on fire? No, sir. That's the room we use for drying peas. He's forever fallen in the river, sir. <laughs> Well, it's a wonder he doesn't get drowned. Oh, he'd never do that. Why sir. not? Well, you see, sir, he's a cork man. <laughs> ah, here comes my new man, Cassidy. Well, hi there, folks, and I'm mighty pleased to be making your acquaintance. I calculate as how I'm going to be real happy riding the herd on this little old ranch. And what kind of Irishman is that? 
I thought you said your name was Cassidy. It is. Hop along, Cassidy. <laughs> All right, Cassidy. Now, first thing I want to do is to find the poacher. But I think we're going to have eggs for tea. <laughs> and, then, and then you better find the chap who's feeding the cattle. Ooh, you're bothered by wrestlers, eh? What do you know about these old timers? Who, me? Nothing. Nothing, of course. Nothing at all, at all. Nothing. Nothing. Are you sure you don't wrestle? No. Only when I wear taffeta. <laughs> all right, now, Cassidy. Cassidy, get started. Get the house cleaned up. I want to live in the manner to which I'm accustomed. But you can't turn us out. What will we do? Never mind, daughter. Leave it to me. I'll go and have a word with the king of the leprechauns. He'll help us. <laughs> People. Yeah, watch your step. I don't want you treading on my leprechaun. <laughs> yeah, I see you bought your fiddle. Come on, give us a tune. Give us a bit of that sham rock and roll. <laughs> all right. But first you must grant me my three wishes and no tricks this time. Well, all right, I won't mess about. What are your wishes? Well, first, I wish I had my old job back. Mm, granted. Secondly, I wish my daughter would marry that lord of the manor. <laughs> Granted. And my third wish is a wish for all of us. Well, what is it? I wish to goodness we could find a way to end this sketch. Uh. Granted. <laughs> well, that's it. A, a, a real leprechaun ending, if I may say so. And now, four little people who we've never actually seen... But we do believe in the fine singing and playing of the Fraser Hayes of Four. London Bridge is falling down, falling down, falling down. London Bridge is falling down, my fair lady. London Bridge is falling, 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 falling down. London Bridge is falling, falling, my fair lady. Documentary feature, Hornorama. <laughs> yes, once again, Kenneth Horn and his team of investigators bring you a factual report on topics of immediate interest. <laughs> and tonight, we present a close-up on the film industry. Is the cinema winning the race to attract young couples? Or is it just neck and neck? <laughs> Here is a very famous star of yesteryear. 
very glad to have you with us, sir. It's a pleasure. Stanley Birkinshaw, isn't it? Uh, that is so, yes. But uh, I was, of course, known on the silver screen as Sa- uh, Stanley Birkinshaw. The great lover. Uh, yes, that was me. Perhaps you'll remember some of my classic successes. <laughs> Such films as Desert Passion, The Seek of the Sahara, and Seven Deadly Sins. Yes, a silent picture. Oh, yes, I'm afraid so. <laughs> when the sound came in, they said I wasn't suitable. Oh. Why was that? Well, search me. It's, it's always been something of a mystery to me. Still, I, I, expect, I expect you made a lot of money and are now a rich man. Alas, no, I'm penniless. It's my own silly fault. Oh, you, you, you lost your money? Why? Well, I was always splashing it about. <laughs> Finally, let's go over and have a word with somebody outside a famous cinema in the West End. Oh, good evening, sir. Uh, good evening. It's cold, very cold now. Oh, good evening. Yes, yes, cold it is. Very cold here yeah, indeed, yes. Very cold. Yes. Well, now, would you, would you like to tell us about yourself? Yes, certainly. I've been standing outside the cinema in Leicester Square for something like 35 years. 35 years? Yes, 35. 35. Yes. Good gracious, yes. <laughs> And, uh, tell me, sir, I... I... Without... <laughs> without introducing you in any way, you are... You are the, the, the commissioner? Oh, no, no, I'm just an ordinary picture-goer. I'm not... I, I see. All, and, and you've oh. been... Uh, <laughs> you've been waiting outside the cinema for 35 years. Uh, Why? Nobody will take me in. <laughs> it's terribly sad, that, isn't it? I don't know what... Uh, still one of the... Still one of the most popular forms of cinema going is the newsreel theatre, where at any time of the day one can see newsreels from all over the world and how very familiar they have become. This is the Fino Barbitone News. <laughs> Jim Haggerty reporting. A freak storm hit Chicago early Saturday. Thick snow brought traffic to a standstill. Mayor Riley said in all his years of administration, the city had never experienced such a blizzard since August last year. <laughs> in Wichita, Kansas, a Mr. Henry Brackenbury has invented this unique flying bedstead. Now, says Mr. Brackenbury, it may not revolutionize flying, but it will certainly revolutionize sleep. <laughs> Let us now turn to the cinemas themselves. All the time, improvements are being made to increase the enjoyment of the patrons. And so we sent Cecil Snaith to investigate at one of the new luxury cinemas. Well, listeners, I'm looking now at the very first film to be shown on the new panoramic screen together with supersonic sound. The film is, in fact, the first to be made in the new process of gigantoscope. I wonder what the picture girls themselves think of it. I'll just take the microphone to the stalls and ask for one or two opinions. Uh, excuse me, sir. What do you think of uh, Gigantoscope? Lovely. <laughs> uh, now I'm moving down to the two and three. Ah, you, madam. I'm sorry, this seat's taken. Uh, no, no, I, I just wanted to ask what you think of the new film. How can I tell with you standing there naturally? Why don't you go and sit down? Sorry. <laughs> Well, listeners, perhaps I'd better wait until it's over. Ah, there, there's a vacant seat in the front. I'll just sit here and tell you something about the film. Now, where's the ashtray? It never seems to be in front. Ah, here it is. I'd better just press my cigarette out. Oh. 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 And this is Cecil Snaith at the organ of the Granville Cooper in the turn of the studio. Well, now, what 
makes a film personality? Talent? Looks? Oh, perhaps it's that indefinable something that makes everybody sit up and take notice. And wherever there is a film personality, that too will be an ardent fan. Hello, Rodney. Hello, Charles. <laughs> I saw you in your latest film last night. You were superb. <laughs> Thank you. You really liked it. Like I was in France. Honestly, <laughs> Charles, when you came on, the whole screen lit up. <laughs> Come, now, just very small feet. But even so, take it from me. You're the one they'll remember afterwards. Oh, Rodgers, how kind you are. Did I, did I really look all right? Yes, and this what a striking figure you were. Thank you. I just love the way you hit that gong. <laughs> Finally, let us pay tribute to those ever faithful stalwarts of the film world, the regular picture girls, those couples who managed to get such enjoyment from a visit to their local cinema. I'm very, very oh, crazily along. Yes, very yes, very Another tomato, yes. Good evening. You finished the sausage roll already? Oh, sorry. I'm only halfway through me big strutter. <laughs> There's no more sandwiches left. You have a hard boiled egg. No, no, oh, and not yet. I'm not yet. My saving is to have with my banana. Oh, <laughs> well, I'm ready for me second cup of tea. Where's the no, thermos? No, wait a minute, Andrew. Oh, dear. Quiet now. Here's the ice cream girl. Me, me, a two bags of popcorn, two packets of salt. I uh, know, I never double ice cream. Here, <laughs> yeah, one of Chris, three dogs, Chris. Look, 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 look over there, there Ambrose, mm. that young couple. Oh, yes. Oh. Mm. <laughs> Kissing and cuddling. Oh, dear. Oh. Uh, said he's great. Yes, it is, Ambrose. Mm. I sometimes wonder what people come to the cinema for. Yeah. <laughs> well, there you are. That brings us to the end of this series of Beyond Our Canon. Until we meet again, this is Kenneth Hall on behalf of us all saying goodbye for now. Good night. <laughs> You're very interesting to all of just business. Uh, just a moment. I thought I fired you earlier on. Yes, but I've got a contract, oh, you know. I see. As I was saying, why the just miss sort of been listening to Beyond Our Ken, a sort of recorded radio show which gave employment to Kenneth Horne and also to Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Betty Marsden, Bill Pertwee, Patricia Lancaster, the Fraser Hayes Four, and the BBC Variety Orchestra conducted by Paul Fenelet. The script, believe it or not, was written, and letters of complaint should be sent to Eric Merriman and Barry Took. However, the owners must inevitably fall on our producer, Jake Brown. Tonight, the BBC takes a random dip into its seasonal bram tub and comes up with... Oh, look what we've got. A Beyond Our Ken musical extravaganza. Oh, well, you can't be lucky every time. Beyond Our Ken proudly presents Island Treasure, breathtaking spectacle in glorious horner color. Hear it on the new wide microphone. It took eight years to make. I was just a child when it started. <laughs> 
Neither was I. <laughs> Island pressure is packed with excitement. See Kenneth Williams fight the giant anaconda. Mm, no, don't mention a bell. <laughs> See Hugh Paddock as the villainous Long John Silver. I wouldn't leave my little wooden leg for you. <laughs> See Betty Marsden is the only woman alone on board a ship full of men. They're so demanding. <laughs> I've never danced so many socks in my life. See the new Kenneth Horn, the gay, romantic Kenneth Horn. Yes, all this and 20 new hit songs from the pen of Irving Creek Whistle. <laughs> well, that's just a foretaste of what's in store. This production of Island Treasure is having its world premiere tonight at the Corn Exchange Kitchen. And the BBC has made arrangements to bring you this show. You'd think they'd have something better to do. Oh, well, first of all, we're going over to the Squire to meet some of the celebrities attending this glittering first night. So over now to our commentator, Cecil Smith. Hello, listeners. This is Cecil Smith speaking to you from the Corn Exchange, Titchfield. What a throng of gay, sophisticated first nighters there are here. Get away! God, truth! Ah. Over there, I just spotted a very well-known BBC personality, a fellow commentator of mine. I say, uh, glad to see you made it. Uh, did you have a good journey down? Well, the going was very hard, and I got away to a good start, and for the first few miles it was neck and neck with a bubble car. But I, I managed to hold off a challenge from a fast sports car, then coming into the home stretch down the Titchfield High Road, across the headed traffic lights, and another, a lady cyclist coming up on the inside, very fast indeed, 250 yards to go. A wrong voice making his effort on the near side, now 150 yards to go. And at the post office, it was a clear win for me by two lengths with a bubble car second and a Rolls Royce third. <laughs> Well done, and nice to see you again, Audrey Russell. <laughs> and uh, here's a regular first-nighter. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, well, now, what do you think this show will be like? Heaven knows, I shan't bother to watch the rest of the thing. I'll be in the bar, oh boy. I might pop in for half an hour or so for a nap, but that's all. Oh, well, then why did you come in the first place? Well, I have to, old boy. I'm a dramatic critic. <laughs> Well, now, most of the celebrities have gone in now, so it's time for me to join them inside. Tickets, please, sir. <laughs> Just be silly. I don't need a ticket. You do to get in here. No one gets in without a ticket. But I'm from the BBC. That's your problem. <laughs> I'm afraid you couldn't get in here if you were Cecil Snape himself. But I am Cecil Snape. Oh, there you are, sir. I've just told you. <laughs> you can't get in. But you don't understand the BBC are broadcasting this show. All right, then I'll compromise. Your microphone can go in, but you can't. But how shall I know what's going on? Well, if I were you, I'd listen to it on the wireless. All right, I say, now look here, my well, man. You'd better hurry, too. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. And on behalf of the cast, may I welcome you to our show. I would like to thank the Dagenham Girl Pipers for their cooperation. Uh, nothing to do with the show, but they have been most cooperative. <laughs> The costumes for the show were provided by the well-known lady costumier, Miss Fitz of Hackney. With the exception of the Long John Silver outfit, which was kind of lent to us by Miss Alma Coulton. <laughs> I should point out that we've done a long tour with Island Treasure, and there's been a certain amount of rewriting. To give you an idea of how much, well, uh, when we started this production, it was cat on a hot tin roof. <laughs> However, providing there haven't been any further rewrites while I've been speaking to you, you're now going to be treated to our production of Island Treasure, which, need I say, is a backward version of Treasure Island. Mr. Fennelly, over to please. <laughs> is our favorite uh, desert island ship. Oh, we're sailing off into the blue with a right crowd of Charlie's as crew. When we fly, we'll give a joyous cry. We'll be there on the fabulous island. Oh, Squire Caloni, 
you say you have a map showing the exact whereabouts of Captain Flint's treasure, and you want my ship, the Hispaniola, to take you there. Show me, is that the plot? Well, yes, you've outlined it very well. <laughs> Actually, the map belongs to young Jim Hawkins. Jim Hawkins? Yes, we couldn't afford Jack Hawkins. <laughs> Jim's coming along as cabin boy. What about his education? I'll take care of that. I'll be a sort of gym teacher. <laughs> oh, he's a good lad. Keen to learn about the sea. I left him practicing dropping the anchor. Ah! Whoa! 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 <laughs> oh, I wonder who he's dropped it on this time. Jim, Jim, come here a minute. Come in, Squires. Oh, hello, Captain. What a nice ship you've got. I've just been up at the front. The front? Bow, boy, bow. Well, why should I? I'm getting the applause. <laughs> yeah, I've been trying to get off with that lady sitting in the front of the ship. Oh, Jim, that's the figurehead. It's made of wood. Oh, no wonder she wasn't very talkative. <laughs> I thought she was just playing hard to get. Well, Hawkins, what have you been doing on board? Oh, nothing much. I just popped into the poop, had a peep, and popped out again. <laughs> Well, Squire, I've got a sign on the crew. All right, over here, line up. Uh, Name? Cutthroat Fred, first mate. Bloodthirsty Sam, second mate. Murderous all, but third mate. Flat is Rimbled, everybody's mate. <laughs> oh, very able-bodied, I must say. A woman? We can't have a woman on a treasure cruise. I thought it was a pleasure cruise. <laughs> it probably will be. <laughs> I say she can't go on board. I forbid it. I get it. Now, nip off and disguise yourself as a man. Then you can sign on as bloodthirsty Gladys Rumble. Next. Evil George. Next. Chipati Clapham. <laughs> Next. Good heavens, it's Pat Lancaster. I'm uh, afraid you can't sign on, Pat. No, I've only come down to see you on your way. Well, pity you can't sing us on our way. Oh, but I can. Look, there's the Variety Orchestra all lined up on the key. Oh, well, it'll be the first time they've ever been on key. Sing, Pat. <laughs> I've always found it easy to say no to some over-anxious Joe. In my time, I've turned any amount down. But with you, I can't resist. Because before we've even my heart begins to start the countdown. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Bang! I'm cool, calm, and collected. There I see your face. My control is projected into outer space. To be loved by you Bring out the beast in me Baby, do May feel drowsy and lazy Till you ring my bell Then for action I'm crazy Baby, can't you tell I light up at the sight of you Bring out the beast Baby, do love is basic, needs no subtle overtures. Love may vary, but I'm just crazy over yours. When you do to my system, no one's done before. Take my arm, baby, twist them if you want some more. I respond to on you, bring out the beast in me, baby, do, love is basic, needs no subtle overture, love may vary, but I'm just crazy over yours when the battle commences. Let's have no hold back. Drive me out of my senses. 
the beat in me. Baby, bring out the beat. Oh, well, back in character. Uh, Captain, aren't all the crew assembled? We're still waiting for Long John Silver. Ah, uh, there he is. Hi ho, Silver! Hold on there, Mickey. I'm coming as quick as I can. Oh. 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 Curse it, I'm stuck in a great deal. <laughs> Give us a leg up, young un. Where are you? <laughs> Thank you, matey. Don't he be afraid of poor old Long John. I'd be just a harmless, bloodthirsty cutthroat. He yeah, ain't no, he's got a pirate on his shoulders. Oh, so he has. Does he speak, Long John? Ah, he do that. He speaks right proper. He do, don't he, Polly? I certainly do. <laughs> and let's face it, Silver, I speak a jolly fat better than you do. You see? He's a real scholarly bird. I wanted to have an education I never had. He went to a public public school, you know. <laughs> Even not recently, no. <laughs> mm, that's a very old joke. I happen to be a very old bird. <laughs> well, now, Long John. Long John, you ought to be our cook, then. I, I am that. Uh, I hope your ship be well stocked with beef. Yes, it is. Good. Then I'll be a happy man. I'll get below with the two things I like most in the world. Boil beef and parrot. Boil beef and parrot. Well, Jim, come on. We'd better get aboard. Oh, look, the sails are opening. Oh, good. We may be able to pick up a couple of cheap laughs. Captain, we've been at sea for three weeks now. I must say the crew seem to be settling down well. I wouldn't be too sure. I don't trust that Long John Silver. There's something evil brewing. Yes, he calls it shepherd's pie. I don't mean that. It's the men. There's something going on. Everywhere I look, there are strange little groups of them whispering, plotting. Just look at those two bloodthirsty specimens on the upper deck. Yes, I wonder what they're saying. Hello, Rodney. Hello, Charles. <laughs> I say, what do you think of my tit for? <laughs> it knocks mine into a cocked hat. Oh, oh, oh. oh, I don't know. The silk scarf and earrings are very becoming. <laughs> yes, but everyone, see everyone on board wearing them. Most yes. disconcerting. If I'd known, I just wouldn't have come on this cruise. <laughs> Here, after all, the food's not bad. No, I suppose the cook does his best. But let's face it, Rogers, this Long John Silver is no bon viveur. Oh. <laughs> I, I must say, one gets a little tired of salt beef every day. Oh. Come on, you two lazy lovers. Jump to it or you're going to taste to the rope then. Oh, that'll make a change from salt beef. <laughs> <laughs> you see, Trelawney, their insolence is growing. I tell you, there's something very peculiar going on board this ship. Another thing, there's one of the crew that keeps going into the powder room. Well, what's so unusual about that? With a handbag. <laughs> Look, there he goes again. Oh, it's all right, Captain. I'll deal with this. He must have got on board, all right. I say, hello, Gladys. What did he call me, Squire? <laughs> oh, sorry. I thought it was somebody else. Were well, you looking for me, Squire? Oh, there you are. What's the meaning of this? I thought I said no women aboard. All right, Captain. I'll take the responsibility of Miss Rumbold. She can help with the navigation. I'm sure she'd be willing to show us our longitude. Of course. And I hope a certain amount of latitude, too. <laughs> Come, Gladys. Join me in a drink. Here's my cabin. Now, then, what about a spot of rum? Rum? Oh, no, I never drink that stuff. You know what they say? You can't get a man with a rum. Oh, don't, don't you believe it? Rum for two 
and two for rum. Well, I'm your pal, and I'm your chum. Cause having rum is so much fun together. It's lovely snogging when you've got a noggin. It always enhances those ships or the romances. We, we won't, won't have, have it known, no, dear, that we've got a keg down here. We can have a private three. A top for you and a top for me. Oh, oh can't you see how tiddly we will be? Come in, come in. Oh, you're in. Good. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I overheard everything. Oh, well, look, uh, here's a doubloon. You keep quiet. No, I wasn't listening outside this door. I've been inside a barrel of apples. Good heavens, why? I was just polishing off a few pippins. <laughs> but guess what I heard? They are planning a mutiny. But who are the apples? No, no. The crew. It's Long John Silver. He's planning to grab the treasure for himself. Well done, Tim Hawkins. This is valuable information. Mm. How fortunate you were hiding in that barrel of apples. Well, you know me. I'd do anything for the cause. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's really scraping the bottom of the barrel. Come on, Jim. Come on, Jim. We must tell the captain. <laughs> Captain, that's how it is. Now you know the whole story. Well, I didn't hear all of it because of that blasted music link. <laughs> but you say Long John plans to take the treasure when we get ashore? Well, that's true. But how far are we from Treasure Island? Well, we're a long way from the original version. <laughs> we should be in sight of land soon. I'll ask the lookout. Hey there, you up there in the crow's nest, what can you see? Hold on, sir, I'll have a shook you through my spyglass. <laughs> Oh, yes. I spy with my little eyes something beginning with S. Oh, yes, yes. I can distinctly see her name. It's the SS Paniola. Oh, that's us, you fool. Oh, yes. There it is. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. I've got my spy glass upside down. Can't you see any land, eh? Sorry, I can't see a thing. Why not? I'm blinded by the spray. <laughs> oh, what a lookout. I shall have to get rid of him if he doesn't mind his P's and Q's. <laughs> it is S's you want to worry about. <laughs> Listen, there's murmurings coming from the forecastle. Oh, it's only some of the men singing. What are they singing? It sounds like the folks who live on the hill. <laughs> no, it's not. Come on, let's get closer and we can listen. Johnny, come down to high low. Shiver, my timbers, it's the... Raise a haze for. I haven't seen the mic since I was born when an old sea captain with a sea boot club said, Johnny, come down to Hilo. Poor old man. Oh, waiter. Oh, shaker. Oh, wait, that girl with the blue dress from when Johnny comes down to Hilo. Poor old man. I love a little girl across the sea. She's a baby in beauty and she says to me, Oh, Johnny, come down to Hilo. Well, 
they don't fight shanties like that nowadays. Land ahoy! Land ahoy! How close are we to land? <laughs> Does that answer your question? on deck, prepare to disembark at last. We're at Treasure Island. Tim Hawkins, come here a minute, matey. Why is it, Long John? We'll be Squire Trelawney and that Miss Rumbold. They've gone off to explore the island. <laughs> likely story. <laughs> now, Jim, that map you have showing where the treasure's buried, give it to me, mate. No, I won't. No, no. Stop messing about. Oh, no, you. you don't hand it over, I'll slit your gizzard. What about a fellow you are, Silver? Melt up, Polly. I'll slit your gizzard and all. Now, Jim, listen to old Long John. I'll do a swap with you. You give me that map and you can have this new shiny pistol of mine. Ooh, no, here's the map. Thank you. Here's the pistol. Oh, thank you. Now stick them out. Come on, give me back my map. <laughs> you cunning little devil. Oh, here's your map back. Uh, now, give me back my pistol. Yeah. That's it. Stick them up. <laughs> now, hand over the map. Only if you give me my pistol. All right, here it is. <laughs> Oh, dear. Here we go again. <laughs> now, now, carefully, Gladys, mind where you said this is a dangerous stretch of swamp. Now, carefully, carefully, that's it. Now, steady. Right. You can put me down now. <laughs> I'm frightened, Squire. You never know who might be about on this island. I have a feeling we're being watched. Well, we're not doing anything we shouldn't. Oh, no, of course, it was cut out, wasn't it? <laughs> anyway, I doubt if there's anyone living on this island. I doubt that you think you're sure. <laughs> what was that, Gladys? I said, I said, don't you be too sure. Oh! Oh, good gracious. No, down you, a dirty old man. <laughs> oh, hello, Jake Brown. I haven't... Oh, Oh, no, 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 no. No, 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 Ben Gunn. Ben Gunn, but who ben, are you? Ben, uh, I'm the only man on the island. <laughs> and how long have you been here, Mr. Gunn? Ever since Captain Flint fired me. <laughs> I've been here alone now for 65 years. I've never seen a woman in all that time. I don't even remember... What one looks like. Well, I'm one. Well, I'm Miss Macabre. <laughs> <laughs> did you uh, did you say you were with Captain Flint? Yes, I was one of his lighter men. <laughs> well, we have a map showing Flint's buried, buried treasure. No, it's no good. I've moved it. I'm the only one who knows where it is. Well, would you be prepared to lead us to the treasure, Ben Gunn? Oh, I will, I will, I will, I will if I get a share of it. Oh, of course. One more thing, mister. You take me back to England with you. I left home 65 years ago. Well, then you must be anxious to get back. Yes, I have a funny feeling I left the cash on. Follow <laughs> me. Follow me. <laughs> Meanwhile, back at the camp. Now, I'll give you the map if you give me the pistol back. Oh, all right, here you are, then. Right, stick them up. Hand over that map. All right, Long John. Stand right where you are. Cash is followed again. Well, it's your own fault, Silver. You really are the stupidest old buccaneer I've ever seen. <laughs> I may be, but I'm still a good cook. And boiled parrot on the menu. Come here, Polly. Or oh, slit your keys from here. No, no, you mustn't. No, no. Well, well, now, that's got rid of Long John Silver. <laughs> right has come to breathe it. And as for the treasure, well, there's enough here for everyone. <laughs> come on, let's get the treasure back to England. Oh, hooray. 
Just a minute. Who are you? The Chancellor of the Exchequer. Oh. Oh. Good gracious, who shot the Chancellor in his Exchequer? <laughs> That is why. Well, after all, we should have our end. Oh, yeah. Our show has run its charted course. Quite clever, if not good. We've all learned something from it. Next year, Robin Hood. <laughs> been listening to War of Just Myths, Beyond Our Ken's seasonal offering, Island Treasure. The various parts were played by a versatile cast, including Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Betty Marsden, Bill Pertwee, and Kenneth Hall. Patricia Lancaster, the Fraser Hayes Four, and the BBC Variety Orchestra, conducted by Paul Fennelay, provided a welcome relief from the script, which was, of course, written by those two pirates, Eric Merriman and Barry Took. Your announcer was Douglas Smith, and the whole ghastly business was produced by bloodthirsty Jake Brown. <laughs> Come here, Mama, darling. Yes, Philip. What is it? You have been at the wine again, haven't you? What do you mean? I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, yes, you do. You are drinking far too much wine lately. Don't think I haven't noticed. You've been spying on me. Uh, I hardly need to do that. Look, there on the table. I bought that liter of Beaujolais less than an hour ago. A whole liter of wine. And now just look at it. There's hardly any left. an excerpt from Lolita. <laughs> and now in our series, a film worth remembering, which is more than could be said for the next half hour. However, for the more tolerant listener, here is a sort of radio show which is beyond our ken. Among those taking part are Sally Forth, 
the Right Honourable <laughs> M.T. Bottles, the Dagenham Daily Pipers, <laughs> Lady Deborah Donkey... I'll get a kick out of her. <laughs> to continue, Duane Heifetz, <laughs> Mervyn Pod and his Hawaiian wherefores, <laughs> and, of course, Mr. Kenneth Hall, the man who is without a doubt. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Kenneth Hall. Welcome to Beyond Our Ken, the show that's really put radio back about ten years. <laughs> well, now, let me bring you up to date on some of the happenings of the week. On Monday, I was driving back from the north, and I stopped at a good pull-up on the Great North Road. I went in, had a cup of cha, stirred with a spoon on a chain, of course, ate a couple of cheesecakes, and as I was leaving, I couldn't help noticing some of the other people there. Sir Alec Guinness, Sir Michael Redgrave, <laughs> Sir Ralph Richardson, Sir Laurence Olivier, and then it suddenly dawned on me. It was an all-night cafe. Tuesday, I attended the annual plumber's dinner. I must say, for a change, the speeches were pleasantly short. If any speaker tended to overdo it, everyone shouted out, Stopcock! <laughs> Wednesday, I had dinner with Fanny Haddock. Very exciting. Things soon warmed up, and as she leaned over me to serve the first course, I felt her hot broth down my neck. <laughs> Thursday, I paid a visit to my old school, dear old St. Kaminix. <laughs> and I shall never forget my old games mistress, Miss Poopworthy. I learnt an awful lot from Miss Poopworthy. <laughs> In fact, we were expelled together. <laughs> Still, you know, there's something fascinating about school days, and over the years, we've had many stirring public school stories. Mind you, they're all the same. The sensitive new boy, the beastly bully, the understanding headmaster... So, stand by now as we bring you yet another glimpse of life in an English public school. We present Goodbye, Mr. Chips, with everything. <laughs> or, I say, chaps, this isn't rugby. My name is Richard Watts Brown. A delicate, highly strung schoolboy who has just arrived at that awkward age. Too old for Miss Muffet and too young for Miss Blandish. <laughs> I'm Flashman, the school bully. All right, chaps, get him. Prendergast, grab a leg. Cope, Willoughby, you grab an arm. Have we all got something, chaps? Right. Everybody twist. <laughs> and uh, I'm Arnold Fish, the stern but lovable headmaster. I say, you there, Parkinson, are you smoking, boy? Uh, yes, sir. Well, give us a light, will you? <laughs> and I am the headmaster's daughter, Millie. Father forbids me to mingle with the boys, but I do so like to mingle with the boys, especially Richard. I've loved him since we first met on a nature ramble. We went further than any of the rest of the class. <laughs> So then, to our gripping human story, which will interest anyone who has ever gripped a human. <laughs> I'll never forget that first day when I set off for Kenthorne Abbey. The coach took me away, and while the coachman sat on the box, I was snug inside. It was great fun, because I'd never travelled in a box before. <laughs> then at last we arrived at the main gates, and the headmaster was there to greet us. Hello, coachman. Hello there, Mr. Fisher. Good gracious, you're not Arthur Worsley, are you? Oh, no, sir. That boy in the box is real. How do you do, sir? Ah, so you're the new boy. Uh, brown, isn't it? Oh, sir, don't just say brown. Say what's brown. <laughs> Yes, now, well, come in, lad, and welcome to Kenthorne Abbey. Founded by the late Henrietta Pigsfoot, a well-loved teacher. Plenty of class, no principal. <laughs> over there, over there, boy, stands the famous spa, stretching up... Who put that thing up there? I'll thrash him within an inch of his life. Oh, sir, do you have the cane here? Oh, yes, but only in moderation. Don't worry, lad, you'll get your fair whack. <laughs> now you'd better meet your roommate. His name is Flashman. Is that Flashman over there, sir? That ruddy-faced boy with a smile. Yes, and I'll soon take the smile off his ruddy face. Flashman! <laughs> Did I see you throw away a cigarette? Uh, yes, sir, but it's no good to you, so I trod on it. <laughs> oh, sir, is this the new boy, sir? Can I take him away and screw his head round? No, you cannot. Flashman, I've warned you about bullying before. 
picking on some poor little chap who's no position to defend himself. You're wrong, sir, to think I'm a bully. I wouldn't lay a finger on anyone, not for all the tea in China. Oh, what an ignoramus you are, Flatron. There is no tea in China. It's spelled C H I N E R. Now, just show what's brown round the school while I nip off and start looking over some homework. Yes, yeah, that means he's going to see Matron. I said, <laughs> Old Fish is quite decent. Well, I suppose we could have a worse head. Why do you call him the head? Isn't it obvious? Oh, <laughs> oh I see. Come no, I on, said... Weedy. <laughs> It's dash decent of you, Flashman. How many houses do you have? Oh, we've got two houses here, 6.30 and 8.15. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Flashers. Hello, Parky. This is the new boy. What's Brown? This is Pinky Parkinson. He's the rugger captain, the cricket captain, cross-country captain and vice chairman. Oh, is there some of that here, too? Oh, jolly good. <laughs> Old Parky here is a bit of a devil, always getting into trouble. That's mm. true. I get the cane so much they call me the bottom of the class. Uh. <laughs> What's Brown? Here we are in front of the well-known cloisters. You know why they're called cloisters? Yes, Lashman, because they're close to the gate and close to the dormitory and close... All right, Parky, come on. <laughs> Let's crack him. No, stop it, please. Come no. On, Watts Brown settled down at school, but I wasn't happy about his association with Flashman. I had an idea he was still bullying him. Nothing definite. I just noticed that occasionally Watts Brown came into form with an ear missing or <laughs> one foot pointing the other way. <laughs> and then one day when Watts Brown told me what was happening, I sent for Flashman. Oh, please, sir, gosh. Don't give me the birch, sir. You can't, sir. I'm sitting for a trick next week. You'll be standing for it now. <laughs> Bend over that chair. Right, now, one, uh, two, uh, three. Uh. I couldn't stand seeing Flashman being beaten, so I ran from the room. That night I slept badly, and I was still uneasy when I got to the classroom next morning. 23,644. Uh. 23,645. Uh. All right, that'll do. I don't believe in excessive punishment. <laughs> Back to your seat, Flashman. I'm going out for a moment, boys. Carry on swatting up some English grammar like what we done yesterday. <laughs> ah, he's gone. Now, Brown, you're going to get it. Yes, you beastly little sneak. Come on, chaps, let's hold him in front of the fire. Oh, no, no, you rotten. Come on, come on, that's it. Hold him there. Oh, oh, I say oh, steady on, Flash, when that fire's pretty hot. Let me go, let me go. Uh, <laughs> let me out, chaps, uh, head. Oh, oh, head. Well, boys, uh, I've just come back. Brown, what are you doing in the fireplace? I'd rather not say so. Oh, come on, who did it? <laughs> come on, Brown, have you nothing to say? No, sir, not unless I'm allowed to ad lib. <laughs> I can't risk that. All right, I want the boy who did this to own up. Come on, who done Brown till he was done Brown? <laughs> Nobody, eh? Very well, the whole school will miss the annual treat. Oh, sir, no visit to the windmill this year. Certainly not. Now, all of you except what's Brown, dismiss. You wanted to speak to me, sir? Yes, boy, I'm very worried about you. I, I notice your work is deteriorating. There's something on your mind. Now, what is it? It's very simple, sir. I know, but what's on it? No, sir. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sir, I, I can't get on with my Latin prep because, well, well, sir, I, I begin to think about girls. <laughs> you what's wrong? I'm afraid so, sir. You see... When we played that match against the old Plutonians, I met a girl around the back of the cricket pavilion. Oh, misguided youth. <laughs> You're wrecking your future. Follow the cherished traditions of Kenthorne Abbey, and your path will lead to honour, fame, and glory. Fail to follow the cherished traditions of Kenthorne Abbey, and where will you end up? Around the back of the cricket pavilion. <laughs> Enough. Now, who is this miserable and wretched female? Your daughter, sir. What? <laughs> you blackguard what's round. Matron, come here. You shall be locked in the sanatorium and fed on bread and water till you come to your senses. <gasps> Corks, that's torn it. Saturday is the big match against St. Swithin's, and I'm silly mid-on. Matron, uh, lock this boy in the sand and stay with him every minute. No, no, no. You can't make me go. Come along. There's a good boy. Coming. <laughs> Four days I've been locked up in this sand, and that matron keeps giving me big sums for keeping my mouth shut about her and the geography master. Oh, oh, Richard, I still 
stole the key and came to see you. Nelly. Oh, Richard, all the boys say the stinks class isn't the same without you. Oh, Nelly, when I told your pater about us, he went livid, vivid livid. He won't let me play in the match tomorrow. It's jolly hard cheese on a chap. Oh, do you think you did this for me, Richard? Look, look, I brought you some pink blancmange. <laughs> yes, I have. I, I carried it all the way over in the leg of my bloomers. <laughs> Oh, scrumptious. <laughs> they won't make me give in. Oh, oh, I'll stick by you, Richard. Oh, no. <laughs> no, Richard, I've had a pash on you ever since the day you brought me that wonderful present. <laughs> you know something? I've never had a frog of my own before. Oh, Millie, I want... What's this? Jezebel, go to your room. Daddy, Daddy... And as for you, Watts Brown, I have decided to give you a chance to redeem yourself. Now, you shall play in the match tomorrow, and if we win, you shall be forgiven. Oh. But if we lose, you shall be mercilessly flogged and then expelled with ignominy. Well, has he been round the back of the pavilion, too? Enough. <laughs> All depends on the match tomorrow. Oh, well played, Cobalt Miner. Run, man, run, yes, yes, no back, get back, get back. Oh. oh, next man in. What's wrong? Have you got your pads on yet? You're in after this. Now, remember what I told you about those quick glances to legs? Oh, yes, sir. I haven't looked at her since. <laughs> Poke at it like that, Shelley. Hit it. Flashman, do you think if I take up a stance like this, middle and off? Yes, but you'll find it easier if you hold the bat by the narrow end. <laughs> Go on, Shelley. You can make it. Three, run up. Now make it four. Faster. Five. Now. Uh, Ooh. Now you're in now, Watts Brown. We need one run to win. Good, Good luck, luck, Watts Brown. Good luck, Good, Good luck, Richard. Oh, father, what a fine figure he makes striding up to the wicket. But why is he hopping like that? Oh, the knit. He's got one pad buck around both legs. <laughs> He's at the wicket now. I hope he follows my instructions. I told him to pat down the crease. Not the one on your trousers. Hey, look, look, the bowler's ready. Oh, he's taking a long run. Here he comes. He bowls. What's he blubbing for? <laughs> Look, he's appealing to the umpire. What's he saying? He said he didn't realise they were playing with a hard ball. <laughs> Play up, Watts Brown. It's for the honour of the school. Here's the next ball. Hit it, man. <laughs> he's got it. A boundary. The bat is wow. A spiffy. Now, here he comes. Oh, oh well played. Oh, well played. Oh, well played, Watts Brown. Thank you. Uh, thank you, chair. I'll never bully you again. Well, now, Watts Brown, from now on, you may meet my little daughter whenever you wish. Thank you, sir, but while I was out there on the pitch, I realised something. I realised, sir, that associating with your daughter will do me no good. Hereafter, I shall concentrate on something more worthwhile. Good lad. You're going to carry on with your Latin. No, I'm going to carry on with the matron. <laughs> Carry on the Fraser Hayes Four. By the Adriatic waters, Venetian sons and daughters are strumming a new tune upon their guitars. It was written by a Latin, a gondolier who sat in his hometown in Brooklyn and gazed at the stars. He sent his melody across the sea to Italy. And we know they wrote some words to fit that catchy bit and christened it the Piccolino. And we know that it's the reason why everyone this season 
is humming and strumming a new melody. Come to the casino and hear them play the piccolino. Dance with your bambino to the strains of the catchy piccolino. Drink your glass of vino. And when you've had your play of scallopino, play the play of piccolino, the catchy piccolino, and dance to the strains of that new melody. That new melody, the catchy piccolino. And so to the Kenneth Horn documentary feature, Hornorama. Yes, once again, Kenneth Horn and his team of investigators bring you a factual report on topics of immediate interest. And this week, we present a close-up on Beyond Our Ken. Well, now, this is where we let you into one or two of our secrets. It's a lie. <laughs> First of all, let's meet some of the people behind the scenes that you don't normally meet. Now, this uh, gentleman, for instance, now, will you tell us something about yourself? Uh, yes, most certainly, with utmost pleasure. Well, as listeners may not realise, that with any show, there are several personalities backstage. They may not be seen, but they're absolutely necessary. In fact, I suppose you might say indispensable. <laughs> now, you say it. <laughs> I, you say. Yes. Inexpensible. Thank you, yes. <laughs> Had already expressed it. <laughs> yes. You did it much better than I did, too. Now, what exactly is your job, sir? Uh, sound effect. <laughs> you might have guessed. Uh, I'm uh, responsible for all those doors opening and closing, gunshots, horses' hooves, co uh, coconut shells to you, and Coconut shells to you, too. <laughs> Dorsey, then a fun... <laughs> Of course, there's a whole host of other effects in which I specialise, thunderstorms, etc., etc. So you're kept pretty busy? Oh, well, very, of course. Sometimes there's only a few simple effects, and sometimes I'm absolutely swamped. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know how you must feel. Now, <laughs> tell us, what is the secret of a good effects man? Cleanliness. <laughs> yes, it, it's vital that the various props, such as revolvers, motor horns, cymbals, hooters, etc., are kept in first-class condition. Now, see, that's your considered opinion. Oh, yes, you can't beat a bit of spit and polish. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we'd like to say a special word now for those who contribute so much to the friendly atmosphere of the show, our studio audience. Let's ask... Uh, one of them to come up here, shall we? How about you, sir? Oh, just thank you very much. <laughs> oh, it's very nice of you to ask me up here well, on the platform. Very, very nice of you to come very up nice. here, sir, too. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, be, uh, well, it's, uh, it's been uh, nice looking down and watching you yes. laugh so heartily throughout the show. Oh, 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 yes, yes, indeed I was, but not at your jokes. Oh. No. <laughs> there was a woman with a feather hat tickling me behind. <laughs> Behind me in the seat. Yeah, I see. <laughs> but obviously uh, you enjoy us or you wouldn't be here. That's not true, neither. No, oh. I was walking down the road, minding my own business, when a hand came out of a doorway, <laughs> grabbed me by the collar and whipped me down here. Well, sir. Grabbed hold of me. They did, yes. Grabbed hold of me. And whipped you in here. Whipped well, me in here. Yes. Well, now, sir. Well, say, you know what I will, I'm saying? I will tell you. <laughs> I'll tell you where you are, then. You are in a BBC studio, and this is a microphone. Oh, you mean I'm on the speaking wireless? Yes, you are now. Oh. Yes, now perhaps you'd like to send a little message oh. to someone special. Oh, yes, thank you. Hello, Celia, Brenda, Susan, and Roseanne, and all the girls in 201. That's the number of my flat. I see. <laughs> Well, now, may we ask if you... May we ask you, sir, if you listen to Beyond Our Ken regularly? Uh, yeah, I've heard it on and off. How do you like it? Off. Oh. <laughs> anyway, you see, 
No, I see what I mean is I don't listen much to the radio. I only have it on as a background for what I'm doing. Well, there doesn't seem much point in that. No, you don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Finally, we turn to our panel of experts in Hornorama who are waiting to discuss a random question on this week's topic. Top of the table, great Scott himself, Rife Hobbitson. Good evening. And a special word to my wee friend known as Aberdeen Angus. Bully for you. <laughs> next, uh, next, the young man responsible for more disc brakes than the entire motor industry, Ricky Livid. Hello, now. Uh, <laughs> I like to say I'm having a big success with my latest, The Night as a Thousand Heroes. <laughs> well, you can all the stuff cotton wool in them, can't you? And now here she is, one of the merry wives of Brown Windsor, Fanny Haddock. Hello again. <laughs> oh, I'm very happy and bright this week, and full of haddico beans. <laughs> Last day is someone who's been wandering around all morning singing Everything is Coming Up, Brussels Sprouts, Arthur Fallowfield. Well, I've been having trouble with Mrs. Forrester again. Honestly, that woman gets the wrong end of the stick every time. <laughs> and yet she does. Now, she took umbrage and led off at me something shocking, and all I said to her, trying to be helpful, was, Would you like me to replant your early bloomers? <laughs> Thank you very much, Arthur. Thank, Thank you. Well, that's our team of experts, and so to this week's question, which comes from... Uh, Dagnall Dean. Dagnall Dean? Ah, oh, yes, a very old English family, rather fallen into decay, I believe. That's right, I'm one of the rotting deans, actually. <laughs> and I should like to ask members of the panel what their plans are when Beyond Our Ken is off the air. Thank you, sir. Now, all right, what are you going to do, uh, Rive Hobbitson? Well, I don't know, really. I suppose I might have a little holiday. No definite plans. I'll probably just go where my fancy takes me. Where's that? It depends where she wants to go. <laughs> Bonnie will as she is, but of course that could all be prevented by the Loch Ness Monster. That's your next feature? No, that's my wife. Now, what about you, Ricky Livid? Uh, yeah, well, there's uh, recordings and that, and uh, one-night concerts, uh, sort of uh, evening with Ricky Livid. And then there's my big musical in the West End. That's uh, all about a pop singer. And what's it called? Art to succeed in show business without really singing. <laughs> All right, now, Fanny Haddock. Yes, well, I'm going to be very busy cooking up lots of things. There's my new book, A Thousand and One Things to Do with Sausages. <laughs> And then a whole series of dinner parties with 15 courses to a meal, following which I'm taking part in a local amateur dramatic society's production of Gone with the Wind. <laughs> but my most immediate plans include a television interview to talk about my experiences in the kitchen. I've never had an experience in the kitchen. Oh, go boil your onions. <laughs> you know, my darlings, I shall never forget one most dramatic moment last year. I was peeling away in the sink when, my dear, suddenly the gas cooker blew right up. Oh, my darlings, it was quite a shock. And what was the result? Smoked haddock. <laughs> All right, then. Now, then, Arthur Fallowfield, what are you going to be doing? Wow. Yeah, well, yes. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> I haven't said anything yet. You don't have to, we know. Well, I like that. Yes, we know you do. <laughs> no, 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 you're being very unfair, Mr. Horn. I mean, you're giving the impression that I'm likely to say something improper. Well, I mean, I'm not that sort of a bloke. I like everything correct and proper. Take last Tuesday, I escorted young Mavis Pickering home from the whist drive. And as we got near the quiet part of the lane, I said... That'll be five bob for seeing you home. Good gracious, you mean you demanded money from the girl? Well, of course, I didn't put it quite like that. My actual words were, look here, I haven't bought you all this way for nothing. <laughs> Well, that's all for this week. This is Kenneth Horne saying goodbye for now and leaving you with this thought from a listener in Slough Bucks. Do people go to nudist camps to air their differences?
You might have been listening to What I've Just Missed, Beyond Our Ken, a sort of recorded radio show. Those who were beyond Kenneth Horne were Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Betty Marsden, Phil Pertwee, the Fraser Hayes Four, and the BBC Variety Orchestra, conducted by Paul Fennelly. Eric Merriman wrote the script, and the show is produced by John Simmons. <laughs> Two more at five shillings. That's all, thank you. Oh, Mum, how much longer before we get into the picture? It won't be long now, Edie. We're nearly at the front of the queue. Oh, I'm fed up. Now, don't you fidget. There's a good girl. Oh, good. Here comes the butter. Here, Mum, look at him. What? Ah! Oh, Edie, turn your head round this minute. It's a positive disgrace. I've never seen anything like it in all my life. Don't you look at it. Oh. <laughs> That was an excerpt from Nude with Violin. <laughs> yes, it's another in our series of Play to Remember, which may also help you to forget the next half hour. Meanwhile, for those with a strong disposition, here is a sort of radio show which is beyond our ken. Among those taking part are Abigail Drift and Cranston Sedgwick, who, of course, appear by kind permission of Thaxley Maltepot. Miss Tattered Trilby. She's a bit old, eh? <laughs> to continue. Dame Ronwyn Thomas and her one-stringed harp. <laughs> and, of course, Mr. Kenneth Horne, who prefers to remain anonymous. Ladies and gentlemen, Kenneth Horne. <laughs> Hello, good ladies, evening and gentlemen. <laughs> now, it's no good. I should have to rehearse everything. <laughs> Well, now, let me, as usual, tell you some of the things that have happened since last week. On Tuesday, I was on my way into town when a chap stopped me and asked for a lift. Well, unfortunately, I didn't have one on me. <laughs> so I just pressed on and kept a luncheon appointment, which was with a well-known leather manufacturer. During lunch, I asked him if he exported any of his leather, and he replied... Oh, yes, my thong goes round the world. <laughs> Which actually wasn't bad for a tanner, really, was it? <laughs> well, I wouldn't have paid more for a joke like that. Anyhow, Wednesday, I attended the old East Country Festival of Choir Tasting. It's quite novel, actually. You sit behind a screen in the local village hall and metaphorically taste the choir. Of course, it doesn't appeal to everybody because it's a more or less an acquired taste. <laughs> However... <laughs> thank you. However, on Thursday, I was invited to a meeting of the Society for the Promotion of British Wine. The secretary in his address recommended an excellent and very reasonable red wine and summed up the feelings of all when he said, Buy British red wine and to hell with Urgency. <laughs> I might add that this particular wine society was formed by an ad hoc committee. <laughs> Then again, I might not. Now then, where, where was I? Oh, yes, Friday. Friday? Well, I didn't have much on, so I got dressed. <laughs> I went out for lunch, popped into a news theatre, and got back home round about tea time. Is that you, sir? Yes, Prudence. Ah, I see. I'm just in time for tea. Oh, I'm glad you're back, sir. The wireless has gone all peculiar. Listen, I'll turn it up a bit. <laughs> See, that's all I've got out of it for the last ten minutes. There's something wrong with it. Oh, Prudence, don't be silly. Listen again. It, it's Frankie Howard. <laughs> oh, yes. No, I just went to the Ah, yes. Ooh. Switch it off and pour you some tea. Good. Have a good day, sir. Well, I've only been to the news theatre. I saw a few cartoons and a couple of newsreels. Have a good laugh. Oh, yes, rather. They made me laugh all the time. And the cartoons were quite funny, too. <laughs> I suppose you've been busy doing other rooms? Uh, no, sir. Doing the washing? No, sir. Mending? No, sir. Well, then, Prudence, you, you, you haven't. Yes, 
Peter, I'm afraid I have. Well, not again, Prudence. I'm afraid, Pastor, yes. But you're always at it. I'm sorry, sir. I can't help it. You just can't leave it alone, can you? <laughs> no, sir. Well, Prudence, I, I think I'd have to get rid of the television. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no, don't do that, sir. They have such good old films on in the afternoon. Oh, you missed a lovely one today. Oh, it was real exciting. Would you like to hear all about it? No, not really, no. Good. Here's your tea. Now, listen. It was called Incident in Macau. You know, one of these adventure stories set in a port of mystery and intrigue. I know, international crooks. Sinister police chief knives being thrown in dark alleyways. Oh, then you've seen it, sir. No, they're all the same, Prudence. Go on. Oh, well, the hero. Oh, he was nice. Was yes, he was. He was tall and broad-shouldered. A cigarette hanging from his lips, you know, drooping eyely. Well, perhaps the smoke was getting in his eyes. <laughs> Don't interrupt, sir. Now, what else? Oh, yes. He wore an old school tie and he had a carnation in his buttonhole. You can tell I'm going to play that part, can't you? <laughs> Anyway, the whole thing started with a, a map of China, and then there was this exciting music. Macau, with its seething millions. Explosive, dangerous Macau, where thieves, murderers, and smugglers combine to make this a truly picturesque oriental port. Macau, hot spot of the East. Macau. Now oh, get on with it. <laughs> Macau. Watch it, Mac. <laughs> Our story starts when a young Englishman sailed into this teeming port and stepped ashore. <laughs> Couldn't you get any nearer? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Cartwright. Here, grab my hand. Right. Oh. 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 There we are, sir. Uh. Oh, well, so this is Macau. <laughs> Did you see that, sir? He got a knife in his back. Good morning, gentlemen. I am sorry you have to witness this rather unpleasant scene. I am the commissioner of police, and that was the Hu Yatan too long. Well, what had he, uh, what had he done, commissioner? He parked his rickshaw in the pink zone. <laughs> now, please, your passport, gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm uh, Hugh Cartwright, and this is my colleague, Chalky Simpson. Mr. Carteright, your passport photo is a little unusual. Why are you surrounded by a fishing net, a basket, oyster shells, and a bunch of grapes? Well, he was an imaginative photographer, that's all. <laughs> Quite a famous chap, actually. Well, uh... <laughs> well, perhaps not, no. Uh, tell me, what is the purpose of your visit? Do you mean to say you haven't heard of you, Carteright? Author of such bestsellers as Blonde Mean Business? Murder in Mink and Lady Please Turn Round? <laughs> ah, I see. You are in search of background material. Then I suggest you stay at the Hotel Peking. There is always something of interest going on there. Hmm, Peking. Yes, there's quite a bit of that as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Cartwright, I wish you a pleasant stay in Macau. Yeah, thank you. Well, now, Chalky. <laughs> Chalky. Oh, there you are. Chalky, you'll stay on the boat and look after things. <laughs> and look after things. I'll get down to the hotel now. Rickshaw! So we are the hotel picking. Two dollars, please. Very quick, eh? Yes, yes, very quick. But uh, shouldn't you have pulled me? <laughs> Sorry, no understand. Oh, never mind, never mind. Excuse me, excuse me, please. Could you tell me where manager is? The manager. Oh, yes, old boy, there we are. Oh, thank you. 
Uh, are you are you the manager? Uh, yes. Quang Chao Wong, greeting. I'd, uh, I'd like a room, please. Room? Certainly. We will send things up. You just in time for lunch and cabaret. <laughs> cabaret at lunch, eh? Yes, very good singer, this lady here. Good heavens, it's Pratt Lancaster. <laughs> Pat, what on earth are you doing in Macau? Appearing in the new English musical out here. It's called The World of Susan Fothergill. Yes, of course. <laughs> I should have known, shouldn't I? And you're also in cabaret. Well, go ahead and sing, Pat. <laughs> It's a wonderful night full of mystery and adventure. Something out of the ordinary really ought to happen tonight. It's a dynamite night full of mystery and adventure. We can do our investigating while there's not a soul inside. Desperados love the quiet round about 12 o'clock. And if there's action, we might secret nook on the ferry boat dock. It's a wonderful night full of mystery and adventure. There'll be thrills and excitement with a jack-o'-lantern moon above. Desperados love the quiet round about twelve o'clock. And if there's action, we might buy it from a secret nook on the ferry boat dock. Nice, Pat. Oh, what a charming girl she is. Yes, Confucius, he says. Yes, we know, all know the things he says, yes. Now, what about food? Um, I'll have chop suey. No chop suey. What? Yeah, in China, we, we would not touch it. No. Not for all the tea in Whitehall. <laughs> but, mister, may I suggest Chuan Chu Fu Ling Nam? What's that? Black beans on toast. <laughs> oh, all right, yes, all right. On TV, on and, uh, well, hello. Oh, I, I'm sorry I have to sit here quickly. There's a reason. They're all up to me. Yes, I'm not surprised. <laughs> no, no, you don't understand. I know too much. Well, no wonder they're all up to you. <laughs> Who are you? My name is... Fu Chang Hai Shan Tung Ming Kwan Si, but you can call me by my first name. <laughs> well, that's a relief, isn't it? Uh, what is it? Yen Shang Li Ting Sing King Wing Fu Fan Yaku Kuma Pu Li Chan. Yes, I'm human. <laughs> now, tell me why you're being chased. Have you ever heard of the Chuan Wong Tong? No, I didn't think you had. <laughs> well, it's a. Oh, I can't stay anymore now. I'm being watched. I shall have to go. Meet me tonight at Kowloon Fing. That's a Chinese laundrette. Laundrette, eh? Yes. Things ain't what they used to be here either. <laughs> Goodbye. And with that, she left the table. A hundred questions went through my mind. What was I becoming involved in? What was the Chuan Wong Tong? Where was the Kowloon Fing? I decided to go out to my room. I opened the door, and there, stretched out across the bed, was... An eider down. <laughs> I unpacked my things, went over to the wardrobe door, and opened it. Good heavens, who are you? I haven't got much time. You must help me. Here, take this packet and... <laughs> They've got me. No, well, just a minute. What shall I do with this packet? I, I, I can't tell you. Well, perhaps it's just as well. <laughs> this is terrible. <laughs> Mr. Wong. Yes? What is it? <laughs> a dead body in here. <laughs> oh. 
Oh, apologies. Loam should have been cleaned out. Lovely. <laughs> well, don't just stand there. Do something. Send for the police. That won't be necessary. I will take charge. Now, open up that package or I will be forced to use this gun. All right, Bond. Good heavens, it's China Tea. Let me see. Yes! Played by Lost Conway. <laughs> but wait, what's on the other side? Ah, just as I thought. Secrets of the Chan Wong Kong, the names and facts of this notorious smuggling organization. Full evidence of the cloaks, murderers, and cutloads that is a reveal for the first time. <laughs> With music and lyrics by Lionel Bart. <laughs> I see it all now. You are the Wong in Chuan Wong Tong. Correct. But I am not the leader. That is a mysterious Mr. Fu. I shall take you to him now, and then we shall decide what to do with you. Come on, move. I was taken to an evil-smelling waterfront warehouse. Inside, groups of shifty-looking men sat drinking and playing cards in the smoke-filled room. It looked like a coffee break with a variety orchestra. <laughs> There, also captive, was the Chinese girl. So they've got you too, you. Yes, Miss. Uh... Again, Chow Ling Ting Ting. Yes, 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 of course. Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, I forgot your name for the moment. <laughs> All alive, you two. Over here. Members of the Chang Wong Kong, please to stand by our dishonorable leader, the mysterious Mr. Fu. <laughs> Good afternoon, <laughs> You are Mr. Poo? Yes, I am. I mean, it's not my real name, of course. No, I don't think it could be. What is your real name? Mr. Wong. <laughs> you too, eh? <laughs> so, so, you found out about the Quang Wong Tong, have you? Yes, but I still don't know what it's all about. Well, we're smugglers, you see. Every day, a boat leaves Macau, and they search it from top to bottom. But, ha uh, ha <laughs> They never find nothing. Why? What are you smuggling? Boats. <laughs> Chinese boats? Chinese boats, yes. It's a load of old junk, really. <laughs> yes, but we can't have a good script every week. <laughs> well, Mr. Four, what shall we do with the prisoners? Uh, let's see now. What tools have we got? There's the boiling oil and the rack. Oh, wait a minute. I'm sure you'd like the feather torture, wouldn't you? Oh, yes, we'd be tickled to death. <laughs> Please, Mr. Fu, I can't bear it. Don't torture us. You mean right off? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know, it's rotten in it. I'm a bit of a devil, you know. I know. <laughs> Come along! <laughs> Come along, we are wasting time. I suggest we were... All right, everyone. Stay where you are. Thank heavens, the police. Well, Mr. Cartwright, we need the game. How did you know we were here? Through me, Hugh. Tell it to me, Interpol. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Fu, you eluded me for a long time, but I have got you at last. Well, go on then. Arrest yourself. Uh, come along. <laughs> uh, come along, Fu. Oh, no, stop messing up there. <laughs> No, no, come on. Ian, let go. No, no, Ian, let go. <laughs> well, goodbye, Hugh. Tell it to me and it's off on another job. After that, I made my way back to the boat and told Scotty to all of that. What a story. Both Wongs are now in prison. It's absolutely incredible. Yes, it is, but there's something even more incredible. What's that, sir? Getting through a Chinese sketch without doing that old joke about two Wongs don't make a right. <laughs> now we turn to...
to another mysterious organization, a group of song smugglers who go under the name of the Fraser Hayes Four. Kenneth Horn documentary feature, Hornorama. Yes, once again, Kenneth Horn and his team of investigators bring you a factual report on topics of immediate interest. And this week we present a close up on hobbies, games, and pastimes, including some of the lesser known sports, such as Amelia Winhardy. <laughs> well, now, first of all, let's talk to the man in the street. Uh, you, sir. How do you spend your leisure hours? Uh, in the countryside. Um, I love the fresh air pursuits, shooting, hunting, fishing, all those sorts of sports. I spend, uh, I spend most of my spare time down in Sussex. Or uh, simply splendid, such soundless solitude. There's nothing so soothing as a stroll in the sun, with the, with the soft breezes shooking through the trees. Shooking? Shooking, yes, it's a Scottish expression. Yes, it could be. <laughs> Stop breezy, soaking through the trees, and the tantalizing smell of fresh country air. You, uh, you go down to Sussex often, then? Oh, yes, 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 but not so much recently. You see, for the past few weeks, the countryside has been on a walk. Oh, what a shame, and, uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh, And were you there when the flooding came? Uh, yes. I, uh, I'm afraid I started it. <laughs> Oh, yes, he would, wouldn't he? <clears throat> ah, now, here's a lady. Madam, do you indulge in any hobbies? Oh, yes, yes, indeed I do, I do, yes. I have two, you see. Two? Yes, knitting and swimming. And you really enjoy them both? Oh, yes, I do, yes, I do very much indeed, yes. Mind you, sometimes the wool gets a bit soggy. <laughs> Yes, I suppose it would. And he has a very interesting old gentleman. Now, sir, I, I believe you are something of a campanologist. A uh, what? I, 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 uh, something of a campanologist. No, 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 not me. You know, no, you see, I'm a bell ringer. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. I am. I see. Well, now, have you, have you been uh, bell ringing for long? Oh, yes. Oh, no, no. Uh, every week, 
Hart. Ring the bells, uh, as she rings. The mini. How do you do? Forty-five years. Forty-five years. Forty-five years. Yes, yes. well, that's... That's wonderful, sir. Yes. Wonderful. Yes. Have you any interesting experiences to tell us? Yes, yes, yes. That's true. I have an interesting experience. I once... Uh, yes, I... <laughs> I once... I got... I got me foot uh, caught in the rope, you see. <laughs> and, of course, I went up with the bell. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear, yes. I and and what, the bell. what actually happened? And I got told off. <laughs> Well, now, let us consider some of the many pastimes and sports which help to brighten the leisure hours. One, one of the most widely popular pastimes which the British indulge in is football pools. Every week, people all over the country try to forecast these results with the ever-burning hope that one day, this might happen. Albion Rovers, two. Sunderland, two. Oh, Danny! Oh, Danny! Oh, Danny! Bertie! Yes, sir? I oh, won the football pools, sir. Do you realise what that means? Eight doors on a coupon and I've got them all. We must win at least, what, 75,000 pounds. Oh, go and tell your mum, quick. Oh, I'm so happy I can shout the top of my voice. Hey, your mum? Yes, dear? Dad's in an awfully good mood. Now's the time to tell him you forgot to post his coupon. <laughs> Finally, let us turn to those who prefer to spend their leisure time in the great outdoors. What better way of touring the beautiful English countryside than by caravan? Oh, hey, Andrew. Isn't it romantic having our own little home with us wherever we go? Hey, darling, it is. Oh, oh. Oh, it's the tenth time in a week I've dumped me head on this thing. Now, oh, now oh. don't get cross, my darling. Well... I, I know it, it has its little inconveniences. Yeah. But just think, no bother about hotels. We can just stop where we like and set up our house. And yeah, I know all that just to the old faggot. <laughs> yeah, Ambrose, you must stop grumbling, darling. We'll never be able to see so much of the countryside without our caravan. Now, would we? No, I suppose not, but Felicity... Yes, Ambrose. I'll make it to you. You can take your harness off now. <laughs> another Horner Armour next week when the subject will be radio engineering, is it a sound job? <laughs> also in next week's program we shall be hearing the music from the Cornish Landladies Operatic Society production of the Pirates of Penzance. <laughs> <laughs> and there'll be an excerpt from the new Saroyan play which deals with Jane Mansfield's life story called The Highest Jumper of Them All. <laughs> So until next week then, this is Kenneth Horne saying goodbye for now and leaving you with this thought from a listener. Does a schoolmaster ever get the wrong end of the stick? Good night. <laughs>
Oh, Dad, could I see you for a minute? Yes, my boy, come in. Well, Henry, what is it? Well, uh, Dad, uh, I don't know if Mum told you, but I've been very good this week. Oh, have you? Yeah, I've done the shopping for her. I spent most of the evenings working in the garden, and, uh, oh, yes, I'll fix a loose screw for you on the bathroom door. All right, Henry. Get to the point. Well, uh, Dad, I, I was uh, wondering, like, uh, could you please let me have 20 pounds for my new bike? <laughs> That was an excerpt from A Touch of the Sun. <laughs> Another in our new series, A Play to Remember, which may also help you to forget the next half hour. <laughs> Meanwhile, for those with a strong disposition, here is a sort of radio show which is beyond our camp. Among those taking part are Sir Gregory Pitt Carpington Thatch, Beth Welsh Nuts, <laughs> Stephanie Swelthurst, Ponkerton Smith, Miss Pigeon and her performing men. <laughs> Brad Brinner, Corcelia Mint. She's a proper handbag. <laughs> to continue, Auntie Macassar and her untamed doilies. And of course, Mr. Kenneth Horn, who prefers to remain anonymous. Ladies and gentlemen, Kenneth Horn. <laughs> Good evening. Welcome to the show. We hope by now that most of our regular listeners know Beyond Our Ken backwards. But for those who don't, it's actually a neck ruled noye. <laughs> Quite an interesting fact. Not funny, but it's interesting. But you know, when this show goes out overseas, it is actually known as neck ruled noye. Except, of course, in some of the more backward countries where. Guess what it's called? Uh, beyond our can. <laughs> Not keeping you, am I? <laughs> oh, good. Well, now, let me tell you some of the things that happened since last week. On Monday, I popped around to see an old chum of mine, and when I got there, he was dressed just in the tops of his pajamas. Well, naturally, I asked him what he was all about, and he said, I'm semi-retired. <laughs> On Tuesday, I suddenly had a wonderful idea. But she wasn't at home, so instead... <laughs> instead, I went and inspected the RAF's two new missiles. And of the two, I, I must say, I think I preferred Miss Gladys' aisle. <laughs> Mainly, I think, because she was much more down to earth. Anyway, well, <laughs> I've become very interested in painting recently, and feeling the need for some stimulating conversation on the subject, I went along to one of the popular hideouts of the Arty Crafty set, the Bohemian Coffee Bar in Chelsea. <laughs> admit that Winsmead's use of colours is far superior to any of the post-impressionist cool. I mean, take this particular work, early morning in Acton House Tree. I mean, look at it closely. Do you all agree that depth of perception is rare among British painters now? Well, yes, yes. Uh, would you go as far as to say that Winsmead is perhaps our most gifted painter? Oh, yes, I'd go further. Winsmead's a genius. Are you an art critic? Uh, no, I'm Winsmead. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I feel a strange and sudden urge. What is it, Lydia? Another poem coming on, dear? Yeah, I think so. Yes. Yes, wait. Yes, I've got it. Yes, I have. Now, let me think. Would that we were pink meringues, all soft and sweet and frothy. I wish I were a pink meringue. I'll melt up and drink your coffee. <laughs> Now you've spoilt me slow. Slow? No, that reminds me of a story. Not in front of the children, please. Yeah, Anyone here you got a tube of yellow ochre? Oh, certainly. <laughs> you are? What are you painting? I've played a fish and chip. <laughs> I'm doing them in oil, of course. <laughs> and you? Well, this yeah. is my latest work. I'm calling it quite simply Dawn. Mm, nice bit of stuff, ain't she? Yes. Do you like the way she's rising from the foam? Most artistic. Cost me a fortune in bottled beer. <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, thinking of doing something quite new and revolutionary for my next work. Uh, I shall ride across a canvas on a bike. Ah, oh, now, that's been done before. Not on a motorbike, it hasn't. <laughs> I can see the whole thing now. I it's say, been... look at that chap who's just come in, wearing a suit and carnation. Yeah, he looks a bit of a weirdy, doesn't he? Good morning. Good morning. Would you mind if I join you? You are, Pete. No, my name's Horn. <laughs> 
I know. I mean, are you arty? A R T Y. No, but I'm a bit crafty. Oh, do you paint? Well, in a small way. As a matter of fact, I brought some of my work with me. Now look, uh, here are some paintings I did on Hampstead Heath. Oh, good night. 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 Good Anything else? Well, yes, here's a portrait I did, a typical scene inside the House of Commons. Now, well, we're still alive. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, it's not bad at all. No, that certainly shows promise. Did you really paint this? Well, of course I did, it was one of my first by numbers. So, oh, 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 oh. did you hear that? Really, I painted by numbers, that's cheating. Yes, yes, absolutely, yes. I say, do you remember Tim Shelley, a lovely fellow, had a self-portrait exhibited, and they found out he painted it by numbers. Oh, my word, yes. I threw him down the steps of the Tate Gallery. <laughs> Poor old Timothy, he really fell out over 22. <laughs> well, look, uh, I'm only a beginner, you know, but I'm very keen. But you can't help to be one of us. Just look at you. No beard, no corduroy trousers, no open-toed sandals. Yes, and besides, you've washed. Yeah. <laughs> well, it doesn't stop me appreciating good art. I mean, I've got a pretty good eye for beauty. For instance, I think that uh, this young lady here would make a wonderful painting. Oh, well, thank you. I'd love Lydia, Lid. No, you don't. <laughs> I caught you once before posing for a painter, remember? Yes, Wimsmead, but that was different. He was a house painter. <laughs> Now, uh, here's a painting of a young lady you might appreciate. One of my best, I think. I call it the Scarlet Woman. Now, wait a minute. I, I know this girl's thing. Well, possibly. She's in here now. There, just behind the coffee machine. See? It can't be. Yes, it is. Good heavens, it's Pat Lancaster. <laughs> Hello, Ken. That I can't believe it. You, the Scarlet Woman. Oh, I'm not half as bad as I'm painting. Yeah, well, of course you are. Now, look, now, how about singing something for us now? Well, what about my accompaniment? Well, I'm sure if I put a sixpence in the jukebox on, on this show, there's almost certain to be a record of the variety of it. Now, there's someone who is as pretty as a picture. She ain't got a bad frame, either. <laughs> now, look, sir, if you're genuinely interested in art, you must live only for it. Become as dedicated as we are. Oh, you're all dedicated, are you? No, we never think of anything else. Take Ludlow. He... <laughs> <laughs> Ludlow puts art... 
first every time, don't you? Of course. I mean, last time I took a girl back to my flat to see me etching, I actually sold her 20 pounds worth. <laughs> You see, that is a true artist. Well, I can't promise to dedicate myself to that extent. Well, you say you can appreciate a good picture. Then have a look at some of these exhibits on the wall. Good idea. There, for example. Ah, do you recognize that painting of a policeman? Yes, it's a constable. How about this one? <laughs> How about this one here? Reclining figure. Yes, he's charming, but uh, I'm afraid I don't know the painter. It's not signed, is it? Well, look closely. You can just see his name scribbled across the bottom. There. <laughs> See? Leonardo Higgins. Oh, yes, Leonardo. He's done some wonderful things. I shall never forget Night on the Thames Embankment. Yeah, but we're talking about his paintings. <laughs> of course, you realise these few examples on the wall of the coffee bar are comparatively trivial. I mean, you can see much better pictures if you go into the Louvre. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ah, now, here's a really beautiful work of art. Such gaiety and colour and so striking. That's a lemonade advertisement. <laughs> oh, so it is. Well, that seems to be the lot. No, 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 no. There's one more over here. It's my very latest painting. Paris at the turn of the century. Oh, oh really? Yeah. really? What do you? What do you think of it? Well, I think it's superb. You captured the whole feeling of gaiety in that particular era. Oh, tar. And what's more, it's so lifelike. Paris at the turn of the century. Yes, one can sense the atmosphere. It's almost like being there. Ah, bonjour, Monsieur Henri. How have you been keeping? Mimi, Francoise, Colette? No, 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 no. Oh. <laughs> no. <laughs> I said, how have you been keeping? Oh, sorry. <laughs> But never mind, huh? The other is more interesting, yeah. never? <laughs> Mimi, Francoise, and Colette, huh? Oh, they are pretty, huh? Delightful, Pierre. Some of the finest poodles I've ever had. <laughs> and what about you? Oh, life is always gay for me. I... Henri, look over there. Isn't she beautiful? Who? <laughs> Gigi. <laughs> But, oh, no, Henri, tell me the truth. What is it I hear about you and Mademoiselle Claudine? Oh, we're just born army, that's all. Henri, you must remember one thing. You are not Claudine's only lover, you know. Well, I realize that. I'm Henri the Eighth, I am. <laughs> and I suppose you will be dining again this evening at the Moulin Rouge? Of course, the most exciting place in Paris, the Moulin Rouge, where all the girls can can. And some of them do do. <laughs> Bon chance this evening with Claudine. Bon chance. Uh, More champagne, monsieur. Oh, thank you, Gaston. The Baron Games have started early tonight. Look, there's a fellow under the table already. Oh, monsieur, uh, that is Toulouse Lautrec. <laughs> oh, yes, so it is. Well, now, Claudine, Claudine, are you enjoying yourself? No, of course, Henri. Mm, what a lovely selection of French festivals on the table. <laughs> you spoil me. Well, I like to spoil beautiful women. Oh, and I like being spoiled by you. You know something, Henri? I think, I think what attracts me so much about you is your air. My what? <laughs> your, your air. Oh, yes. Oh, all those lovely little curls. Oh, you must be so proud of them. Well, I am. Thank heaven for little curls. <laughs> Claudine, Claudine, I have a present for you. Now, close your eyes. Now, open them. Oh, oh a diamond gutter. Oh, you are a darling. Oh, would you like to put it on? <laughs> yes, I, yes, I would. <laughs> uh, there. Oh, yes. It looks lovely. <laughs> now try it on my leg. <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry, Claudine. Are you ready? Yes. Just now. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> oh no, there. No. There. No. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. That is much better. Oh, I tell you, that young man over there, he's been looking over at that 
Yes, I see him. Oh, yes, that's that, that's Monsieur Philippe Poubert, oh. one of the most eligible bachelors in Paris. Ah, oui, oui, yes. Here, here that you say no sense. Oh, good gracious, he's coming across to our table. Oh, good evening. <laughs> Excuse me. I say, mademoiselle, I've had my eye on your pastries all evening. <laughs> Could, uh, could I have a little pink one with a cherry on it? <laughs> well, by all means, Monsieur, take whatever you want. Oh, well, in that case, I'll have the lady. Come on. Take your hands off me, Monsieur. No, stop messing up. <laughs> look here, look here, you scoundrel. I'll belt you up. <laughs> now, just a minute, young man. Here, mademoiselle, tell your father to keep out of it. <laughs> Not my father. He's my lover. Mm. Oh. Now you've come too far, monsieur. You have insulted both the lady and me. In France, you know what this means? A duel. Oh, no, don't be like that. Therefore, in the traditional manner, I strike you across the face with a glove. Mm, yeah. You didn't have to keep your hand in it, did you? I demand satisfaction. All right, please, no, please, no. All right, then. I accept. A duel to the death. Very well. We will meet at dawn. Bonjour, Monsieur Faubert. Bonjour, oh, yes. Yeah, not nice and all, is it? Oh, I mean, being out so early, we might catch a death of cold. All right, gentlemen. Use your weapon. Hello. Dozy do. Back to back. <laughs> now. Ten paces. Un, deux. Trois, quatre, cinq, six, sept, huit, neuf, dix. Oh, oh, you got me. Bad luck, monsieur. Honestly, why did I have to choose a sword? Now we turn to a painting in sound, and the words and music are etched in by those four old masters of vocal harmony, the Fraser Hay Four. As I was going to strawberry bed, singing, singing, by the cup and dish, is the man of maiden taking away a folly tea. Strawberry sweet, I have to spare as I go on to strawberry bed. documentary feature, Hornorama. Yes, once again, Kenneth Horn and his team of investigators bring you a factual report on topics of immediate interest. And this week we present the close-up on public transport. Are we making progress? And if so, why aren't we getting anywhere? <laughs> Well, of course, vehicles using our roads have to be maintained properly. Let us talk now to a garage man. Now, sir, are you busy these days? Oh, yes, it never stops. <laughs> we 
Yeah, they've always got vehicles here for something or other. All sorts of things. Servicing, repairs, reselling, housing, switching oils, reupholstering, changing spare parts, all swiftly and successfully carried out by experienced staff. And what do you yourself do? Well, uh, speaking for myself personally, I, uh, I am only responsible for the vehicles in one respect. Uh, what's that? I spray them. <laughs> Now let's have a word with a long-distance lorry driver. <laughs> Remarkable old character he is, too. Oh, thank you. Very, very kind of you. Thank you. Very nice. And not good, not thank at Thank you, sir. Not and good all. night. I'm no, no, no. Just come now. I, we're not quite finished yet, sir. Oh, I don't you want to. Thank no, it's, uh, I'll tell you what I want you to ask you. Are you, uh, yes. you are a lorry driver? That's true. Yes, I, that's correct. I've been driving on the Great North Road for... Thirty-five years. Thirty-five years. Well, well, that's uh, absolutely, absolutely marvelous. No, not really. It's only a four-hour journey. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, transport. First, let us consider the railways. Every day, trains from all over the country bring businessmen into town. Let us now take a glimpse at a busy suburban station round about 8.25 any morning. Oh, oh. Uh, only, only just managed to catch it. You did, Ross. I thought you'd get to miss it this morning. Are you sure the train's not early, Jack? No, no, no. It's hang on, 8.25. Oh. You ought to get up earlier, you rock. <laughs> I could tell, dear, dear. <laughs> A fiercely alarm didn't go off. <laughs> I did have a mad dash run. <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor old Rodigan. Still, you made it. Yes, yeah, thank goodness. I say, Charles. Yes, Rodney. Do you mind if we have the window down? Why? So I can get into the carriage, you fatty. <laughs> mind you, once on board, the railway traveller can sit back and enjoy a journey free from interruption, except, of course, for one thing. Ticket, please. Have your tickets ready, please. Ticket, please. Oh, sir. oh. oh. Oh, yeah, oh, just a bit. I've, uh, I've got it somewhere. Sam took down here. I've, I've, oh, I'm, uh, I'm terribly sorry. I've, uh, I've lost the ticket, Inspector. Lost the ticket, have you? Uh, yes. I, uh, I'm afraid I have. <laughs> oh, yes, uh, you've lost your ticket, sir. Yes, uh, <laughs> really? Oh. You expect me to believe that? Oh, why not? I believe the railways when they say they lose money. Let us turn now from passengers to drivers of vehicles. Take the man at the wheel of a car. One thing you can be sure of, wherever it is, the man behind the wheel has to contend with the backseat driver. Yes, yes. Be careful. You're going too fast. Oh, now. no, I know. You are. I know, I know. You are. I'm doing the same speed as everyone else. Watch out, sir. You nearly hit him. I know what I'm doing. No, you are. Oh, shut up, you silly old faggot. <laughs> I'm driving, remember? Hey, oh, yes. hey, Look up behind. Oh, shut up. If I have another word out of you, Felicity, I shall dunk you on the dodgem cars. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, we come to the most modern form of transport, the powerful jet airliner, providing safe and speedy flights to all corners of the globe. We join our own commentator, Cecil Snaith, inside a new jet aircraft on a transatlantic flight. Hello, listeners. Cecil Snaith speaking to you from the passenger cabin of this magnificent aircraft on a flight to New York. At the moment, we are over the Atlantic, and far down below there, I can just see the familiar shape of the Queen Mary plowing through the water, also on its way to New York. Somehow, these two different modes of travel contrast very sharply, the old and the new, as it were. Well... <laughs> Worth. <laughs> well, now, when our listeners looking around this pressurized cabin, the, the passengers are comfortably seated, some sleeping, some reading, some just gazing out of the cabin windows. Comfort and luxury being the keynote of this veritable monarch of the air. Well, listeners, I'm going to have a word now with the pilots of this aircraft, just through this door here.
and there's a special snake on board the Queen Mary. And we're turning now to the studio. <laughs> Well, there you are. They'll be on the Hornorama next week when the subject will be Turkish bath attendants. Are they highly esteemed? <laughs> or are they just old sweats? <laughs> also, in next week's program, there'll be a, a rather quiet report from the Noise Abatement Society, and we shall be bringing you excerpts from the Electricity Board brochure just to provide a little light reading. <laughs> and we'll be going over to see the military tattoo on Agatha Winklebury. <laughs> Well, until next week at the same time, this is Kenneth Horne saying goodbye for now and leaving you with this thought from a listener. Are Russians who write in block letters capitalists? Good night. <laughs>
see. Now, what about this one? No, no, I wouldn't recommend the Paul Fenelay, sir. No? No. <laughs> it's rather inclined to pick up bits of fluff. <laughs> Alpha Mary. If I might be permitted to suggest... Oh. Norman, your trousers are baggy, aren't they? Yes, they are, Mr. Figley. Then belt up, there's a good lad. <laughs> Look, Figley. Figley, all I want is a plain, simple suit. Norman, get that roll of cloth down there, off the shelf. Oh, yeah. Uh, there it is. Lummy, it's heavy. Yeah, careful, lad. Lad, look out. Oh, my head. Honestly, you clumsy, stupid, blithering... Ah, uh, uh, please, Mr. Norman. Mustn't say things like that in front of this material. It's clerical grey. <laughs> Well, I'm sorry. Now, look, Figley, I've been thinking. Uh, it'll make it all so much easier if I just have an off-the-peg suit. Did you say off-the-peg? Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Norman, show him the rubbish. Here we are, sir. All your size, 25 guineas, or there's this one special at 30 guineas. Well, what's the difference? It has the carnation in it already. Oh, <laughs> yes, I, I, I'll slip that one on. You made a wise choice, Mr. Orr, and a lovely bit of Maria sackcloth, that. Yes, <laughs> Well, it's, uh, it fits quite comfortably. It looks a treat on you, a nice conservative cut. Yes, but a bit liberal around the back bench, I think. <laughs> Still, I'll take it. You can send my old one back sometime, all right? Goodbye, Figley. Good luck to you, sir. I, I, I feel a bit conspicuous in my new suit. I do hope nobody notices it. Hello, Ken. What a nice new suit. Good heavens, it's Pat Lancaster. <laughs> Pat. Pat, what on earth are you doing coming out of the police station? Oh, just fixing up a police concert. Oh, I see. Look who's behind you, the Variety Orchestra. What's up, Paul? Oh, we've just come to claim our instruments. They were towed away last night. <laughs> Honestly, the excuses get more incredible every week. Still, now you're all here? Sing, Pat. <laughs> The moment to go try your luck and do the things you've always wished you'd done. This is the moment to go have fun. This is the moment to live. This is the moment you dare not delay. To wait another day may take too long. This is the moment, don't hesitate. The world. A great big miracle We're part of that miracle on earth And I cannot help but be lyrical I have just found out There can be no doubt This is the moment to sing I'm gonna catch Mr. Gloom on a west Gonna banish all my cares somehow This is the moment to live and the moment to live is now Charlie Nice Pat. Thank you, Ken. By the way, where are you off to all spruced up? Well, as a matter of fact, I'm on my way to the BBC to compare a theatre magazine programme. What's that, Ken? Oh, you must listen. It's one of those typical show business epics the BBC always does so well. You know the sort of thing. Curtain up and on stage, please. Call in London across the footlights. Showtime. <laughs> stage, and from the world of the stage we bring a myriad of twinkling stars, stars that shine brightly in the theatrical firmament. Yes, from the glossy, magical world that is show business comes a galaxy of... Now get on with it! <laughs> stars. stars and more stars in a cavalcade of memories joined together now in this veritable kaleidoscope of sound and music, especially for you! <laughs> And now, 
Now, ladies and gentlemen, here is your compound. Sit back and relax as he takes you by the hand and leads you into a glittering wonderland. All right, all right, that's enough. Thank you very much. <laughs> How do you do, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the show. Well, first of all, we're delighted to welcome a delightful personality who has been delighting audiences with her delightful personality for many years. It's a pleasure and privilege and a great delight to introduce Miss Evelyn Miles. Thank you. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. <laughs> We're delighted to have you. <laughs> well, I must say, you're looking as delightful as ever, and what an enchanting gown. Thank you. It's a thrill for me to look back on the big career that's behind you. <laughs> I beg your pardon. Well, uh, what I mean is, uh, well, you've had a long and successful career in the theatre. How is it you managed to be so young and vivacious? Well, for one thing, I've always lied about my age. But you know, Kenneth, the theatre has always been very kind to me, which is very gratifying, especially when you consider what I have done to the theatre. Yes, yes. Well, now, um, of all the wonderful shows you've done, I think perhaps the one that stands out in our minds was your unforgettable performance in, uh, in, um, in... Roman Honeymoon. Roman Honeymoon, yes. What a lovely show that was. Of course, there was some time to go. And unfortunately, we haven't heard your voice in the theatre for many years now. Well, it was never very strong. <laughs> no, no, no. I meant, uh, when are we going to see and hear you on the London stage again? Oh, oh I see. Oh, well, very soon. Towards the end of this year, I have been offered a very exciting and challenging part. Uh, what's that? Peter Pan. <laughs> well, well, thank you for coming along, Evelyn Miles. It was delightful. Thank you, no, Ken. Not at all. <laughs> Now we have a great treat in store for you as we welcome the stars and the author of the new musical, Follow That Salad. <laughs> Here is Julian Wilson. Hello, Kenneth. <laughs> delighted to be here. Yes, de delighted to have you. Now... <laughs> Can you tell us something about your new musical? Well, I, I'll try. <laughs> it's all rather confusing, really. <laughs> it, it, it's about a tram driver who collects butterflies and who lives with his uncle, a piano tuner, and his aunt who runs a school that specialises in cake decoration. <laughs> there's, there's, there's all sorts of adventures in the school, including a magic cake which turns into a piano. And, of course, the tram driver falls in love with a pretty little fisher girl. Yes. Yes, well, well, well <laughs> don't go on, Julian. <laughs> don't go on. You, you spoil it. <laughs> anyway, we're going to meet the two young stars of the show now, little Sally Hoskins and lovely Leslie Gilcroft. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm so sorry. I meant lovely Sally Hoskins and, uh, oh, I don't know, though. <laughs> Hello, you two. Hello. Hello. Now, Sally, Sally, this is your very first lead in the musical, isn't it? How did you get the part? Oh, well, I... <laughs> I won it in a raffle. <laughs> And uh, how about you, Leslie? It's your first musical, too, isn't it? Yes, I'm a straight actor, really. I've been knocking about in rap for years. And then Julian spotted me playing Crazy Modo in The Hunchback of Notre Dame. <laughs> yes, that's right. And I, I knew right away he'd be perfect for the singing tram driver. <laughs> Well, I believe we're going to hear the duet from the show now, sung by Sally Hoskins and Leslie Gilcroft. You are the ripples in a stream. You are the tin of clotted cream. You are the tea bag in a pot of tea. You are the piano played by Russ. You are a number 13 bus. Yes, that's what you are to me. You are a headline in the news. You are a Caribbean crew. You are a planner at the BBC. 
You're a Harold Pinter Bay. You're the M1 Motor Bay. Yes, yes, that's, that's what you are doing. You're a breath of spring, a ming, a thing to cherish every day. You're a lucky charm, a chicken farm. You're a load of new moon hay. You're the winner of the fight. You're the stuff that washes wax. You're a frogman. I'm to bold and mild. Your both films on Oscar Wilde. <laughs> yes, that's what, what you are to me, my darling. That's what you are to me. Thank you, Sally Hoskins and Leslie Gilcroft. And, of course, Julian Wilson. Now for our next guest from the world of the theatre, we are privileged to have with us one of our contemporary and most distinguished Irish playwrights. I think it's right to say that the brilliant depth shown... In oh, the... for oh. heaven's sake, man, stop your blether and get on with the interview. I haven't got all day to waste. Well, I, I'm sorry. I was merely about to praise your current play. Why? It's a load of old rubbish. <laughs> Just that, and anyone who says so will get a punch right up the snout. <laughs> and that goes for you too, you bald-headed old rebel. Oh, no, I, 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 I think uh, I think that's quite questions. unnecessary. Oh, I, shut up! I must say you're a most unpleasant and aggressive person. <laughs> you should see me when I've had a couple of drinks. <laughs> Thank you, and good night. <laughs> Finally, we come to another successful musical of a different kind. The very popular East End musical, Do Me a Favor. <laughs> and here is the author-composer, number 18763429. <laughs> Hello, mate. You're inside again, then? Yes, it's only a short stretch this time, though. Still, he's given me a chance to whip off another musical. And will this one deal with low life? Of course. Well, I mean, when people go to the theatre these days, they don't want to be entertained. No, they want realism. After all, life's not a chocolate box. No? No, it's a dirty great dustbin. <laughs> I mean, well, you've got to talk to audiences in a language they understand. <laughs> so you think musicals have got to be different now to succeed? You're dead right, mate. But I can express myself better with a song I wrote on the subject, performed by some of the talented cast of our show. Well, now, there's Benny... He's a first-class counterfeiter, and, well, there's Joe and Mush, two of the best safe crackers in the country, and uh, there's Lil. Well, I can't tell you much about Lil. <laughs> but she'll never be on what's my line. <laughs> All right, then. Right, let's hear the cast now. so much for the cavalcade of show business. But now I really am delighted to introduce once again our really talented vocal and instrumental group, 
the Fraser Hayes for. Jimmy Crack Corn, Jimmy Crack Corn, Jimmy Crack Corn, Jimmy Crack Corn. Jimmy Crack Corn, and I don't care. Jimmy Crack Corn, and I don't care. Jimmy Crack Corn, and I don't care. Master's gone away. When I was young, I used to wait upon my master and give him his plate. And last of all, when he got dry and brushed away the blue tail fly. Jimmy Crack Corn, and I don't care. Jimmy Crack Corn, and I don't care. Jimmy Crack Corn, and I don't care. Master's gone away. One day he ride around the farm The flies so numerous they did swarm One bit the pony in the thigh <laughs> The devil take that blue tail fly Jimmy Crack Corn Jimmy Crack Corn Jimmy, Jimmy Crack Corn Jimmy Crack Corn Masters gone away. The pony he run, he jump, he pitch, he threw my master in the ditch. He died. The jury wondered why. The verdict, yeah, the blue tail fly. They lay him under a cinnamon tree. His epitaph is there to see. Beneath the stone I'm forced to lie. A victim of the blue tail fly. Jimmy Crack Corn and I don't care. Jimmy Crack Corn and I don't care. Jimmy Crack Corn and I don't care. My master has gone away. So to the Kenneth Horn documentary feature, Horn or Armour. Yes, once again, Kenneth Horn and his team of investigators bring you a factual report on topics of immediate interest. And this week we present a close up on holiday. Well, first of all, let's see whether people have made their plans already for this summer. Uh, what about uh, you, sir? What are, you, what are your plans? Well, I shall spend my summer holidays on the Sussex coast. <laughs> I, I love to just bask in the sun, spread eagles on the sand, listening to the waves lapping on the shore, and watching the seagulls swooping across the sky and over the sea. Yes. <laughs> Most refreshing, I'm sure, but how about swimming? Oh, I, I never swim in the sea myself. Well, why is that? Can't stand water in my mouth. <laughs> That's understandable, I suppose. Now, here's a lady. Any holiday plans yet, ma'am? Yes, yes. Yes, I'm going to Spain. And my girlfriend, Elsie, went there for the first time last year. <laughs> but she had a really wonderful time. Oh, really? How was that? Well, someone told her that CC meant no. <laughs> it was me, actually. <laughs> Now let's meet someone who earns his living from the seaside holidaymakers, a remarkable old character. The man who looks after the amusements at the end of the pier. Good evening to you, sir. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, good evening to you, sir. Uh, good evening. Thank you. Now, would you Thank mind... You, would you mind... Uh, would you tell us your age? Uh, no. Not, <laughs> not at all. I'm 85. 85 years old. 85 years old. Well, that's remarkable. And yes. how long have you been on the pier? I've never touched a drop. <laughs> wouldn't have the never stopped. No. No, sir. On the pier. The oh, pier. Oh, oh, yes. Ah, yes. Ah, oh. Sixty-five years I've been in the amusement arcade. Uh, I look after the penny peep shows. You know, uh, what the butler saw. And uh, naughty nights in Paris. Oh, yes. Uh, Do you ever uh, watch them yourself? Ah, uh, yes, I sometimes have a peep. 
but it brings tears to me eyes. It's all very sad. Yeah, but I, I've seen those peep shows often. They're not really sad. Uh, they are when you're 85. <laughs> Well, now, holidays. Every year, people live for those precious weeks when it's possible to leave behind the workaday worries and set out on a magical journey to a favorite resort. Well, Andrews, we're on our way at last. Yes, we must be halfway to Margaret yes. now. Oh, be... I can hardly wait yes. to get my shoes off and go, oh, and go paddling. No, oh, yes. yes. Yes, that will be like... Oh, my goodness. Oh, hey, oh hey, I, I just it? remembered something off. Oh, what is it? They've left the fire on in the lounge. We'll have to go back. Oh, don't be a silly old faggot. Uh, not a... We can't go back now. But we must. The house might catch fire. Oh, don't Ambrose. worry, it won't. Oh, but Ambrose, I tell you... No, it will. won't. Don't you needn't worry. Oh, dear Ambrose, how can you be so sure? Because I remembered something. I left... The bathroom tap running. <laughs> well, naturally, people's holiday tastes vary considerably. Some like to do the obvious, and some prefer to spend this leisure period in more unconventional ways. Take, for instance, those who find health and happiness by living life in the raw at one of Britain's many nudist camps. We sent Cecil Snaith to investigate. Well, listeners, I'm speaking to you now from the famous health and beauty camp in the picturesque countryside of Beresford in Hertfordshire. This is one of Britain's largest holiday camps for the naturalist, and to gain admittance, I have, of course, had to comply with the regulations by <laughs> removing all my clothes. <laughs> <clears throat> I must say the grounds of Beresford Camp are quite beautiful, surrounded naturally by a very high fence, and uh, there's absolutely every facility here, a tennis court, swimming pool, croquet, putting. I'm actually standing now on one of the magnificently kept lawns, and I'm told there's a most exquisite rose garden. I think it's through this gate here. Oh. <laughs> uh. And this is Cecil Smith from Beresford High Street returning you to the studio. Well, however the holiday season is spent, one thing is certain about the British character. Every year, a large proportion of Englishmen succumb to their fatal fascination for boats. Hello, Charles. Uh, hi there, Rodney. I say, I like your new yachting blazer. Yes, it is rather doggy, isn't it? But, uh, Rodders, what do you think of the boat? Oh, my word, you've done wonders with her. Yes. She's a trim little craft, isn't it? I hardly recognised her. Well, I've given her a complete overhaul. Do you, uh, do you like the new paint? Oh, yes, lime green is the colour this year. <laughs> you must be very proud of her. Oh, I am, I am. <laughs> I am. <laughs> terribly proud. I can't wait to get her afloat. Mm. It's a gorgeous day, too. Perfect, and the sea is as calm as a mill pond. Well, come on. Let's go aft. Let's get underway. <gasps> Any more for the Skylark? Twice round the bay for one and see. Back in time for tea. Well, there you are. There'll be another Hornorama next week when the subject will be blacksmiths. Are they in a shoddy business? <laughs> also, in next week's program, there'll be a special commentary from Richard Dimbleby, who will be describing Winford Vaughan Thomas. <laughs> There'll be poetry readings given by a young lady of Gloucester. <laughs> and we'll be going over to the London Zoo to interview the rhinoceros who keeps thinking he's Sir Laurence Olivier. <laughs> So, until next week, then, this is Kenneth Horne saying goodbye for now and leaving you with this thought, which comes from a listener. If the SS Eastbourne called it Brighton, would it be hove to? <laughs>
You might have been listening to or have just missed Beyond Our Ken, a sort of recorded radio show which gave employment to Kenneth Horne and also to Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Betty Marsden, Bill Pertwee, Pat Lancaster, the Fraser Hayes Four, and the BBC Variety Orchestra conducted by Paul Fennelly. The script, believe it or not, was written, and letters of complaint should be sent to Eric Merriman. However, the owners must inevitably fall on our producer, Jake Sprague. <laughs> Four, four. Settle down. Settle down. Now, first this morning, we'll take Simpkins Minor. Stand up, boy. All right, carry on. Uh, well, sir, I heard that tubby fellow has been meeting Rosemary Carter behind the tuck shop in morning break. <laughs> well done, Simpkins. Well done. Now, what about you, Barbara Hargreaves? Well, sir, I, I have it on good authority that Jane Fairgood of the third has been missing netball practice to go swimming with Roger Beckel. Excellent. Excellent. Nine out of ten. Next. Uh, that was an excerpt from School for Scandal. <laughs> uh, now that in our series a play to remember, which may also help you to forget the next uh, half hour. <laughs> Meanwhile, for those with a strong disposition, here is a sort of radio show which is beyond our ken. Among those taking part are Nosbert Halliburton the first, Petunia Wilt, Nosbert Halliburton the second, <laughs> Paddy Jock Fuellin and his Spanish dancers, <laughs> Miss Elizabeth Flagg. Oh, she's at the pole. <laughs> to continue, Fingers McGee of Interpol, <laughs> Nosbert Halliburton the third. And, of course, Mr. Kenneth Horne, who prefers to remain anonymous. Ladies and gentlemen, Kenneth Horne. Hello, good evening. Welcome to Beyond Our Ken. Well, now, in a recent survey, nine out of ten housewives said they preferred this show to any other soap powder. <laughs> well, now, let me, as usual, tell you some of the things that have happened since last week. On Monday... I got on the underground to come into town, and I sat back making plans for the day, but unfortunately my plans went wrong. She got off at Oxford Circus. <laughs> <laughs> However, I popped into the Aeolian Review Bar, had a peep, and popped out again. 
Quite, quite ridiculous, these places. All those girls strip-teasing, and there's a cover chance. <laughs> anyway, I, I don't know how the girls get away with it. They ought to be exposed. <laughs> Personally, I find the whole business nauseating, disgusting, and absolutely pointless. On Tuesday, I went there again. <laughs> And then on Wednesday, I ran into a friend of mine who has a job as a human cannonball. He's always being teased just because he gets fired out of a gun at the circus. But he believes he has a great future. After all, as he said, it's not easy to find men of my caliber. <laughs> and on Friday, well, Friday was rather a special day. I decided to buy a new car. My old one was getting so unreliable that sometimes I used to take a girl out for a ride and we both had to walk back. <laughs> anyway, I made up my mind to have a Straunce Mark 7. So I went along to their West End showroom. Morning. Ah, oh, good morning, sir. Good morning. Going to call the air to your service. Be the down. Uh, now, sir, I think you're interested in this bronze Mark 7. Yes, well, more than interested, actually. I'd like to buy one. Oh, 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 sir, you can't just walk in here and buy a car like that. Oh, uh, dear me. Yes, but look, yes. Ah, oh, sir, please, please. I've spent six long years at the training college of salesmanship, and what's more, passed out with honors. Does it mean nothing to you? Of course. Well, you must know something first about the model. I mean, you haven't even asked me about the suspension. And it's my best answer, too. <laughs> well, uh... Oh, go on, go on. <laughs> go on, ask me about the suspension. Oh, all right. What about the suspension? Oh, thank you. Well, sir, the suspension is the independent coil spring type with cast and camber angles of one and three degrees, respectively. Scribble thin inclination, of course. Yes, well, now, now that I know all that, uh, I'd like... Uh, I, 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 I... Uh, 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 <laughs> Ah, uh, steering, lubrication, carburetor, especially economical. It saves 50% on petrol. The sparking plug saves 40% petrol. And the hydraulic pedal three clutch saves another 20%. <laughs> I suppose if you do a long journey, the petrol tank overflows. <laughs> You're a chameleon. <laughs> uh, I'll have that in writing, I think. Now then. <laughs> If, there, if that's everything, do you think I can order the car? Of course, sir. Oh, good. Well, now, here's the check with my address. I'll wait to hear from you. Goodbye. Good day, sir. Well, honestly, some of these customers are so difficult. Well, now, that's settled. Now, what shall I do? I think I'll just hang around here for a bit. Ah, oh, standing on the corner, watching all the girls go by, on the corner, watching. Good heavens, this girl's Pat Lancaster. Hello, Ken. Was that you I heard singing? Well, just about, yes. Uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd much rather hear you sing, you know. Of course, I know it's not possible without Paul Fennelay and the Variety Orchestra, and, and they couldn't possibly be around. Oh, don't be too sure. Look who's coming down the road now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Oh, Paul, Paul, so this is what you get up to in your spare time. Oh, yes, but please don't tell the BBC. Why, uh, do you think they'd mind? Oh, yes, I'm using the Director General's cloth cap. <laughs> well, your secret is safe with me. Well, by another strange stroke of contrivance, you're all here, so sing, Pat. A lady loves expensive clothes and pretty jewels and furs and French chapeaux. She loves her lingerie and black and suits her zodiac. Loves the penthouse where she'll be content to stay. Find little gifts on her breakfast tray. But now and then pack and sail away for a simple Riviera holiday. A lady loves the cool amour, but first of all she loves to be secure. And she adores the subtle phrase that it's the man who pays. Yet there's one vital thought she will place above all of the things I make mention of. But most of all, a lady loves to love. 
Good luck to you. And thank you, King. All right, boys. After four. One, two, three, bang. Well, Pat, now then. Where are you off to? I'm going to the pictures, Ken. But again, you're always going. You, you must be quite a cinema lover. No, I go to watch the film. <laughs> no, I didn't really mean that. I, I mean you're a real film fan. Yes, I am, Ken. And I love those film magazine programs on the radio. Oh, so do I. Especially that one introduced by somebody who sounds rather like me. Mm -hmm. Oh, what's it called? Uh... <laughs> Picture go round. to your favorite film program, where, as usual, we have lots to interest the movie fans. First, we have an excerpt from the soundtrack of the new British film, The Other Woman, starring Celia Mitchell and Trevor Hawkins. <laughs> it's a drama of human emotions, and this scene is where Sir Clive Debden returns home one evening from his job at the Foreign Office. Is that you, Clive? Yes, Helen, it's me. <laughs> I'm sorry that the train was late. How did it go today? Oh, same as usual. Sort of. <laughs> no, dear, no. I, I didn't mean that. I, I meant... No, oh, well, never mind. Helen, can you stand a shock? Oh, Clive, you're not going to ask me to mend another fuse. <laughs> No, I'm not. Helen, I'm, a, I'm afraid it's pretty serious. <laughs> Sit down, dear. We've always been honest with each other, haven't we? Of course, Clive. Except that time when I didn't tell you it was me who'd left the cap off the toothpaste. <laughs> Helen, please. This is no time for jokes. If that was a joke. <laughs> Clive. Whatever is it? Helen, we are both adults. I'm sure we can be sensible about this. Work it out in some way, together. You're not trying to tell me that... Yes, Helen, I am. Oh, no. I'm a good girl. What's her name? Conchita Juanita Lodita Petita Montez. <laughs> She's not foreign, is she? <laughs> Yes. Does that make it worse? Much. Clive, there's one thing I must know. Anything, Helen. Have you acted yet? That is a fine move. And that I'm afraid we must leave the other. <laughs> If you want to know how it all turns out, then, of course, you ought to see the film. Now to the new crank organization's second feature. <laughs> uh, 
Our second feature, strange and traditional craft in the Outer Hebrides. <laughs> Listen now to the title song, sung on the soundtrack by Frankie Dara. <laughs> Harrington and the answers to last week's film quiz. Well, as you'll remember, we tested your knowledge of films by asking first, what famous picture did this come from? I wonder how many of you got it right. It was, of course, from the Barrett's of Wimpole Street. <laughs> Now, what about the mystery voice? A very familiar film star, but we speeded up the soundtrack and it sounded like this. Well, this is the voice played at its normal speed. Yup. <laughs> Thank you, Spencer Harrington. Another film excerpt now, and this time it's the new French film at the Continental Film Cinema, Hackney Wick. <laughs> Starring Michel Montage and Danny Gabel. And it's a good thing you can't see the subtitles. <laughs> Just arrived in England as American tough guy, Bart Winchester. He is talking to Peter Noble. Mr. Winchester, we, we've seen you in so many gangster roles. Aren't you just a little frightened of being typecast? Yeah, I must say that being known as a gangster in so many films has its disadvantages. People get so used to my film parts, they really think I'm like that in real life. Oh, no. Well, I'm telling you, it's true. I, I've noticed at parties, people sort of keep away from me. I, I don't know if they expect me to pull a gun or something. They, could be, you know. I mean, you crazy people are, I think. <laughs> <laughs> One rather pertinent question I'd like to ask. Yeah? Well, I, I know you're rather touchy about this, but I... Is it true that you wear a wig? <laughs> Well, what a nice chap Peter Noble was, wasn't he? <laughs> Finally, in Picture Go Round, we have something a little unusual. An unprecedented happening in the film world recently is that two film companies have made a film about the same thing. <laughs> With us in the studio are the two actors who play in the rival films. Well, now, gentlemen, you're both playing exactly the same film role. What have you got to say about it? Snap! <laughs> So much for the silver screen. And now for the golden voices of our resident songsters, the Fraser Hayes Ball. Oh, King Cole was a merry old soul, and a merry old soul was he. He called for his pipes, and he called for his lamps, and he called his musicians free. Now he 
Documentary feature, Hornorama. Yes, once again, Kenneth Horn and his team of investigators bring you a factual report on topics of immediate interest. And this week, we present a close-up on local affairs. Is the one going on next door? <laughs> well, now, first of all, let's talk to those who work for the Borough Council. You, sir. What department do you represent? Uh, sanitation. <laughs> and uh, what does that entail? Uh, well, this section is responsible for most aspects of sanitation throughout the district. Uh, it encompasses all sorts of services, such as refuse disposal, sewage, wash houses, swimming pools, shower baths, hosing down. It's quite extensive. Yeah. <laughs> But I believe you, uh, you have a, a, a particular duty to perform. Uh, that is so, yes, yes, I have. I, I myself personally am used by the council for a special purpose, mostly in the summer. Well, well what for? Uh, laying the dust. <laughs> well, now here's a lady. Now, madam, in what branch of local service are you engaged? <laughs> oh, uh, oh, you work in the library. I am, in fact, the chief librarian. Oh, and tell us, madam, at your particular library, what is taken out most? Me. <laughs> and I hope you're returned within the week. <laughs> Lastly, let us have a word with a delightful old character. <laughs> delightful old character, the local park keeper. Good evening. Uh, Good evening to you, to you, sir. Good evening thank to you. you. Thank you. Thank you, and good night. No, 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 not yet. <laughs> now, sir, how long have you been looking after this park? Uh, 35 years I've been here. 35 years? 35 years. Uh, of course, things have changed, changed quite a bit since the old days. You know... Yes, yes. I, well, how, how uh, do you mean? Oh, uh, there used to be some fine old goings-on in here. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 after the park gates had been closed. Oh, really? Uh, really? Oh, yes. Uh, some rare old times. Girls being chased all over the place. Yes, sir. Oh, dear. Yes, sir. Um, I, uh, what you're saying oh, is this. If you'll excuse uh, me, this uh, this sort of thing doesn't happen quite so much these days. Oh, no, no, not now. Well, why's that? Well, I can't run this car. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. 
<laughs> well, of course, there's no doubt that the many services carried out by local councils contribute to the well-being of a neighborhood. And in any road of well-kept property, there's almost one home that stands out and gains constant admiration. I say, Rodney. Yes, Charles. <laughs> just look at this house. Isn't it a picture? Oh, it's enchanting. Don't you just adore the subtle suggestion of neo gothic blended with pseudo Tudor? Absolutely, Rodney. How about that exquisite wrought iron work? Well, certainly, I think that's overdone. You mean it's overwrought? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I say you are a wag. That's just that I could be very happy in a place like that, Rodney. Mm -hmm. What do you suppose they gave for it? Oh, about ten or eleven thousand, I think. And worth every penny of it? Yes. Well, we'd better not stand here too long admiring the house. No, well, I suppose we'd better go in and collect the dust bins. Madam, is your back? Oh, no, 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 no. She's left the road. Look, I know, Ian. I'm not going to be Let us now consider another essential service to the community. I wonder how many ratepayers ever stop to think of the vital contribution to public health made by the sewer men. To find out something of the conditions they face, we send Cecil Snaith <laughs> down one of London's main sewers. Well, listeners, this is Harry Lyon. <laughs> <laughs> from a sewer pipe underneath one of London's busiest main roads. Above, I can hear the rumble of traffic, which adds a curious effect to the already eerie atmosphere of this dark, cavernous underworld. The feeling that one experiences down here is, is that of loneliness. And though London is high above, one does re... What is that? Funny, I could have sworn I heard a noise. <laughs> Anyway, as I was saying... <laughs> and this is Cecil Smith from the Thames Estuary, returning you to the studio. <laughs> Finally, we come to one of the more pleasant aspects of life in the community, that of social welfare. For in any district, one will find various organizations and clubs that fulfill the needs of those in search of companionship. Uh, it's crowded again tonight, but it's a day. Yes, I've never seen it. Oh, what is it, you old faggot? Oh, somebody's pinched me. Uh, you wish they would. Are you sure it was Mr. Jenkins? Teach him a lesson. Uh, all right. Oi, Jenkins. Uh, how dare you pinch my wife? Oh, I never touched her. He's lying. Oh. Go on, and uh, Take no. that. Get him out of I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm the new member. Oh, oh. oh good evening. Uh, welcome to the friendly society. <laughs> There you are. There'll be another horn armor next week when the subject will be marriage. Is it the main cause of divorce? <laughs> so, until next week, then, this is Kenneth Horn saying goodbye for now and leaving you with this thought from a listener. If a dentist called McTavish pulls your tooth out, do you become Scottish by extraction? Good night. <laughs> You might have been listening to All of Just Missed, Beyond Our Ken, a sort of recorded radio show which gave employment to Kenneth Horne and also to Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Betty Marsden, Bill Pertwee, Pat Lancaster, the Fraser Hayes Four, and the BBC Variety Orchestra conducted by Paul Fennelly. The script, believe it or not, was written and letters of complaint should be sent to Eric Merriman. However, the onus must inevitably fall on our producer, Jake Brown. <laughs>
Daddy, can I have an orange lolly, please? Oh, Andrew, I really can't be bothered to go out and get one now. You don't have to, Daddy. Listen. That was an excerpt from The Iceman Comet. <laughs> Another in our series, A Play to Remember, which may also help you to forget for the next half hour. <laughs> Meanwhile, for those with a strong disposition, here is a sort of radio show which is beyond our ken. Among those taking part are Chiversley Jump Humpington, Detective Inspector Bird of the Flying Squad, <laughs> Lydia Pott, the music of the Fleet Street Morning and Evening Pipers. <laughs> Miss Amelia Cannon. No, I she's a big shot. <laughs> to continue. Chamomile Fig, Lord Herbert Featherston Hoare and his Smoky Mountain Boys. <laughs> and, of course, Mr. Kenneth Horne, who prefers to remain anonymous. Ladies and gentlemen, Kenneth Horne. <laughs> Good evening, welcome to Beyond Our Ken, the show that is brilliantly produced, the show that has superb music and vocalists, the show that highlights the individual talents of a versatile cast, the show that oh, in my opinion... Oh, get on with it. <laughs> the show that next week will be without Kenneth Williams. <laughs> Well, now, let me, as usual, tell you some of the things that have happened since we last met. On Monday, I received a phone call from an old friend of mine, Bill Peace, suggesting we should dine together. So on Monday, Peace came to my house, and on Tuesday, I went to Peace's. <laughs> Wednesday, I had a, another rather nasty experience in my local. I was quietly toying with the cherry in my oatmeal stout. <laughs> When a chap came up to me, grabbed me by the lapels and shouted, I know your thought. I've a good mind to punch you right on your big nose. I don't like you at all, see? And for two pins, I'd break every bone in your body. Just then, his companion tapped me on the shoulder and said, Take no notice of Fred. He's a bit merry. <laughs> Thursday, I had a very interesting afternoon when I attended a local seance. We all sat around in a circle holding hands and hoping to get messages. Well, I didn't get any messages, but I got two jolly good phone numbers. <laughs> On Friday, I decided to stay in and get down to a job I'd been putting off for months, clearing out an old trunk of mine. Here's your morning coffee, Mr. Horn. Oh, sir, are you still at it? Well, yes, Prudence. Isn't it amazing how much stuff accumulates over the years? Look what I've come across. A photo of me as a baby. Oh. Oh, there, oh. lying on the rug, you see. Oh, sir. Oh, good gracious. I never realised you'd been bald all your life. <laughs> no, 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 Prudence, that's the other... Oh, oh. never, never mind, no. <laughs> now, wait a minute, I've got something here that'll surprise you. There. What do you think of that? A lock of beautiful golden hair. Oh, sir, you're not going to tell me this was yours? Yes, it was, Prudence. Oh. My head was a mass of golden curls. Oh. In fact, I remember all the boys at school used to think I was a girl. That must have been awkward for you. Yes, but it had its advantages. All the girls used to think I was a girl as well. Oh, <laughs> oh dear, you must have looked sweet, sir. It's all very nostalgic. Look here, here, my old school things. Cricket cap, blazer, silver cups and trophies. Oh, sir, did you win all those? Yes, I was pretty good at poker. <laughs> oh, how it takes me back. Oh, oh, Mr. Horne. Oh, just look at that. Whatever's that doing among your school things? Oh, that's one of my proudest possessions, Prudence. Oh, but people don't keep mementos like that. You don't understand, Prudence, you see... I was the one who climbed up and put it on top of the spire. <laughs> oh, dear, I bet you were the one. Well, not really. No, I was quite studious, actually. Here are some of my storybooks. Fotheringay of the Fifth Form, Black Patch, Scourge of the Seven Seas. Lovely. And, ah, here was my favourite. It's got a bit dirty. Let me adjust her. What a funny title. <laughs> oh, Prunes, Really? Well, I suppose it's little remarks like that that make this show what it is. Corny. <laughs> what is it, 
told then. It's called Adventure Stories of the Northwest Frontier. Lovely. Now, let's see, let's see. Yes, yes. I'll read this one. It all started at the British headquarters of the Bengal Lancers at Shaw. devil's going on in there? Sorry, General. Have you got hold of Major Forbes Phipps and Lieutenant Carfax yet? No, sir. They've got hold of me. Ah. <laughs> Send them in at once. Sir? Here it is, gentlemen. Now, I've sent for you. Good heavens, Carfax, what's the matter with you? You look whiter than white. What on earth is that you are holding in your hand? Four feathers, sir. I thought I told you to keep away from that fan dancer. <laughs> I beg your pardon, sir, but whoever gave those to Lieutenant Carfax is suggesting he's a coward. It's a beastly lie, sir, isn't it, Major? I mean, you know jolly well that I'm known to all the chaps in the wagement as Mad Carfax. Do you know, I always, th I always thought that was short for Madge. <laughs> Well, don't let it worry you, Carfax. You're going to get a chance to prove yourself. Both of you. A special mission, General? Yes, Major. There's a rumor that the Afridis might start a jihad in the Kinjan. And that means the Kyber Pass might be involved in a lash car. <laughs> Understand? Yes, sir. Then perhaps you'll be good enough to explain it to me. Well, sir. I, I, I gather the uh, Freedy Hill tribes are massing in the Kinjan Caves for an all-out attack. Oh. <laughs> oh. Thank you. Well, gentlemen, your mission is to get inside the Kinjan Caves and there contact the beautiful woman who rules the Hill tribes. As you know, her name is a byword. I wonder what the A stands for. <laughs> I mean, could it be Angela, perhaps? <laughs> Lieutenant, take these two needles. What for, sir? You knit. <laughs> Her name is Yasmin, but she's known throughout India as Free and Easy. <laughs> Free and Easy? Well, apparently she is. <laughs> However, she's working for us. Now both of you will go to Delhi, and there you will contact her faithful servant, Gunga Riwa. Good luck to you both. <laughs> Oh, Panja Hall. <laughs> How much further to Delhi, Major? Oh, goodness knows. By Jove, this, this heat is getting me down. It's almost unbearable, sir. Let's turn it off, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> Something tells me this mission is going to be pretty dangerous. I've a, I've a good mind to wash my hands of the whole affair. Oh, Major, please. Not while the train is standing at the station. <laughs> Good heavens, look. A band of ruffians led by a white woman. It must be Yasmin. No, no, it isn't. By God, sir, it's Pat Lancaster. So it is, but I was right about the band of ruffians. It's the Variety Orchestra. <laughs> Greetings, sir. Salam. Kuchda nahin hai. What does that mean? Sing, Pat. <laughs> When an irresistible force such as you Meets an immovable object like me You can bet as sure as you live Some's gotta give, some's gotta give, something has gotta give When an irrepressible smile such as yours Warms an implacable heart such as mine Don't say no because I insist 
where somehow someone's gonna be seen. So on God, who knows what fate has in store from its vast mysterious sky. I'll try hard, ignoring those lips I adore. But how long can anyone try? Fight, 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 fight it with all of our might. Chances are some heavenly star-spangled night. We'll find out as sure as we live. Jolly nice pat, or perhaps I should say, Masjum Kuran Taj Pokai. Oh, we're on our way again, Major Phipps. Oh, look, uh, Carfax, a, a bearded chap in a turban has just boarded the train. <laughs> He's coming into our compartment. Salam, sir. Salam, salam. Uh, be, uh, be careful, Major. You never know whether these chats are being sincere with all this friendly greeting business. You mean it might be a false salam? <laughs> Greetings, gentlemen. You are Major Ford Phipps, this one with all the Phipps. How do you know my name? I am Gunga Riva, humble servant to Yasmin. There has been a change of plan. We will not stop at Delhi, but continue on to Jamrud at the foot of the Khyber. And from there, I will lead you up the hill slope to the Ginyan Caves. much further is it, Gunga? Oh, it is not much further, Major. I can't understand it. There's a perfectly good footpath straight up to the caves, and yet you've brought us up by this route, up the rock face and with all these treacherous ledges. Why? It's a much prettier way round. <laughs> no, sir, we will rest here for a while. I say, Kurun Khan, what is this Yasmin like? Oh, she is very beautiful, very beautiful. <laughs> Have you not read the poem about her by the great philosopher and poet? Oh, my Kayam. Yeah, I can't say I have. How does it go? There was a young woman of Delhi who was... All right, all right. <laughs> we, better, we better not have the rest, I think. Well, no, gentlemen. From here on, it would be safer if you proceed in disguise. Here are some clothes and two turbans. You mean we're to be water carriers? Precisely. But look here, if I'm to uh, play the part of a water carrier properly, you'd better let me have a picture. Right here you are. This is one taken of me at the seaside. No, no, no. No, no, not this that way. sort at all. Oh, I think... oh, never mind. All right. Come on, let's get going. <laughs> Well, here we are, the Kinjan Caves. Follow me. You know, I don't like it, Carfax. They should have sent a detachment of gherkins with us. <laughs> oh, sir, don't you mean gurkhas? No, I was thinking of our overseas repeats, actually. <laughs> Good heavens, sir. Look at that woman doing an exotic dance. It must be Yasmin. Right. Joe, how exciting. She she dances with abandon. That's about all she has got on. <laughs> Come, gentlemen. Yasmin, here are two more tribesmen come to join. Greetings. Salam. This is uh, Forbes Phipps and Carfax, madam. Take off your disguises. That's better. Now I have a plan to help the British regiments overthrow... Everyone stay where they are. 
Or they will feel the blade of my cookery. Kuram Khan, where did you learn to use a knife like that? From a cookery book. <laughs> <laughs> now, Yasmin, I have known your plan all along. What treachery is this? I take off my disguise and see. <gasps> so, <laughs> it's you. Yes, it's me. So you would defy me. Yes, Yasmin. We have been ruled by you long enough. But now it is too late. It is 12 o'clock and the hill tribes are rising. Lazy devils. <laughs> Soon the whole army... All right, drop the knife. Gungariwa has a revolver. Well done. I am not Gungariwa. I take off my disguise and see... General. General. Yes, gentlemen. <laughs> Now, what about you, Yasmin? Uh, no, I don't think you'd better take any more off. <laughs> but, General, sir, what are we going to do about the tribes? Don't worry. I've seen to that. Listen, gentlemen, the Lancers. gentlemen. Let's put an end to the trouble on the Khyber Pass. The regiment will return to England immediately. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye. <laughs> Carfax, goodbye to you, old man. Bye, sir. Goodbye. Now, come here, Yasmin. Yes? You have served the British well, but your work is done. Now there'll be more time for play. What do you mean? Yasmin, you're, you're very beautiful. Come closer. No... No, I don't think I should. Oh, come on, why not? I have a surprise for you, Major. I, too, have been in disguise. She! Good heavens, who are you? I'm Carruthers of the Kyber Rifles. <laughs> Now here are four song carriers who really make a Gunga dim. The Fraser Hayes Four. While strolling through the park one day in the merry month of May, I was taken by surprise by a pair of roguish eyes. In a moment, my poor heart was stole away. A smile was all she gave to me. I immediately raised my hat And finally did remark I never shall forget The charm of that I met The happy day was rolling in the park Oh, I was young and fancy free Till all at once I knew Gay Cupid's dart had caught my heart and pierced it through and through. But how all this befell, to you I now will tell. Will you be my bride, my love? No, no. She cried? Not now. I'll never, never marry you. You're not my cup of tea. Your chin is much too large. Don't worry. I've a charge. While strolling through the park one day in the merry month of May, I was taken by surprise by a pair of bloodshot eyes. In a moment, my poor heart was stolen away. A smile was all she gave to me. Do 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 do. Soon we were as happy as could be, and I knew that she was the only girl for me. Shall forget the charm that I met, that happy day while strolling in the park. 
And so to the Kenneth Horn documentary feature, Hornorama. Yes, once again, Kenneth Horn and his team of investigators bring you a factual report on topics of immediate interest. And this week we present a close-up on food. And hope it goes down well. <laughs> well, first let us talk to that well-known gourmet, Stanley Birkinshaw. Now, sir, you're something of an expert on food, I uh, That is so, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, a connoisseur, you might say. Yes. And what, what, uh, what do you like? Oh, I like all sorts of succulent dishes. <laughs> such, uh, such delicacies as oysters, smoked salmon, asparagus tips. <laughs> uh, what was that one, sir? Asparagus tips. Oh, yes. <laughs> And uh, escargots, or as they're known in this country, snails. <laughs> Sometimes I'm satisfied with more simple dishes, such as sole and tartar sauce. <laughs> Russian salad or sausage and mash. Yes. And what about wine? Well, speaking for myself personally, I like a nice bar sack or so term, but I'm not really a connoisseur on drinks. Uh, that is my brother's province. Oh, uh, oh, you have a brother? Oh, yes, I have indeed, yes. Uh, Septimus Birkinshaw. <laughs> and is he anything like you? Oh, yes, he is, yes. He's a spitting image. <laughs> Here's a lady. Uh, madam, do you have any preference? Yes, I have, you say. Well, um, when I'm at home alone in the evenings, the thing that I really yearn for most is a, a nice, spicy foreign dish. Such as? Razzana Brazzi. <laughs> Now, here's a delightful old gentleman. <laughs> good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening to you, sir. Good evening. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, you like thank you, sir. Thank now, you. now... Oh. Just a oh, moment, if you yes. will. Do you know anything about uh, oh. the gastronomic art? Oh, yes. I detach you bit once. You're very nasty. No, no, no. no. Oh, 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 I... Oh, I... Oh. <laughs> yes, very nasty. You're not quite with me, sir. I, I, no. I meant uh, good eating. Yes, that's what goes, did right here. Oh, no. I blew up. I fell down. <laughs> I Let's uh, look at it. I can just, just, I, just one moment, sir. I, Let's put it uh, diff <laughs> differently, shall we? <laughs> Do you think food is important? No, 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 I don't. We could all do without it. I remember once I went without food for 28 days. 28 days? 28 <laughs> days. I went without food. Well, why, why, why was that? I couldn't attract the waiter's attention. <laughs> Well, to a lot of people, a meal is just a rather routine affair, but for the Epicurean, there are great delights in finding not only the right food, but the right place to eat it. Hello, Rodney. Hello, Hello Charles. <laughs> Where's the running into you here? Oh, I've been coming here for months, Rodney. It's the only place to go. It's rather quaint, isn't it? Absolutely dolly. I find there's something terribly convivial about the atmosphere. Why, that's it. it makes a refreshing change, not having some ghastly trio turning out the election from the middle of a mountain. <laughs> <laughs> so completely restful, mm. one can relax and come to <laughs> indulge in discreet conversation and enjoy the first-class cuisine. Oh, it says all right, but the menu doesn't seem to have much variety. Well, allow me to order Rodders. Now, look, I recommend this. Hmm, do you say so? <laughs> Miss? Yes, sir? Two tenpenny pieces of cake and six pennies of chips, dear. Lots of milk. Now let us turn to the manufacture of food. I, I wonder how many of us realise the care and preparation that goes into the product we eventually buy in the shops. We sent Cecil Snape to a famous chocolate confectionery and biscuit factory in the north. Listeners, uh, <clears throat> this is Cecil Smith speaking to you from the observation platform, which has been specially built so that any members of the public can freely inspect and survey the whole process of manufacture here. One gets a commanding view of the whole vast and complicated machinery that produces and packs the various products. Great cauldrons of deliciously creamy milk chocolate are being supervised by workers, ready to feed the machine which coats the toffees and biscuits. <laughs> yum, 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 yum. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> a 
as they speed on their way down the conveyor belt. The first and foremost impression one gets is that of hygiene. This factory is a perfect picture of gleaming white spotless walls, and everywhere one walks the beautifully shining and highly polished floors make it a very... Whoa! And this is Cecil Snaith, the chocolate-coloured commentator, <laughs> returning you to the studio. Finally, let us consider that traditional British heritage afternoon tea. The tinkle of teacups at four o'clock in any home presents a picture of gentility. But for those who prefer to venture out for tea, it can be something of a hazardous undertaking. Oh, and get out of it. Keep away from the jam. Oh, oh, oh. I think I'm entitled to a little jam on my bread, I darling. wasn't talking to you, you silly old faggot. Oh. <laughs> Look at a wasp hovering around the jam. Oh. Go on, get out of it. Here, yeah, have oh. another cucumber sandwich. Thank you. Oh. 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 Ants, ants, all over the sandwich. Oh, I'm not taking another bite of anything. Oh, no. I don't know why we couldn't have stayed. And had air tea in peace. Yeah. We've had to contend with flies and wasps and goodness knows. Oh, 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 I'll tell you something else. Yes? We'll never set foot inside this restaurant again. <laughs> well, there you are. There'll be it on a Hornorama next week when the subject will be perfume manufacturers. Do they ever get sent on holiday? <laughs> Also, in next week's program, we shall be having Miss Sophia Loren to sing us the jewel song from Faust. <laughs> and there'll be an excerpt from the new film which deals with life inside a Chinese cotton mill and called Loom at the Top. <laughs> so, until next week, then, this is Kenneth Horne saying goodbye for now and leaving you with this thought from a listener Is a 24 hour plumber always on tap? Good night. You might have been listening to What Have Just Missed, Beyond Our Ken, a sort of recorded radio show which gave employment to Kenneth Horn and also to Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Betty Marsden, Bill Pertwee, Pat Lancaster, the Fraser Hayes Four, and the BBC Variety Orchestra conducted by Paul Fennelly. The script, believe it or not, was written, and letters of complaint should be sent to Eric Merriman. However, the owners must inevitably fall on our producer, Jake Sprout. Red certainly not. Oh, go on. No. Go on. No. Oh, be a sport. No. Oh, go on. No. Oh, go on. No. There is an excerpt from The Reluctant Debutant. <laughs> Another in our series, A Play to Remember which may also help you to forget the next half hour. <laughs> Meanwhile, for those with a strong disposition, here is a sort of radio show which is beyond our ken. Among those taking part are Jeremy Fairbrass, Aluthia Fagg, the British War Office Cossack Dancers, <laughs> Marley Bright Winters Ready, Miss Fanny Ding Dong. That name rings a bell. <laughs> to continue... The Inland Revenue Fiddle Section, <laughs> Cannonball Cholmondeley, pronounced Cannonball, <laughs> and of course Mr. Kenneth Horne, who prefers to remain anonymous. Ladies and gentlemen, Kenneth Horne. <laughs> Welcome to 
Come to Beyond Our Ken, the show that is recommended by doctors everywhere as a cure for insomnia. Well, now, let me tell you, as usual, some of the things that happened last week. On Monday, I had hoped to see Barking Creek, but somebody had oiled him. <laughs> so on Thursday, I, I had a wonderful lesson in psychology. I was dining at a rather expensive restaurant when a couple arrived at the next table. She sat down and said something about being starving, but when the chap picked up the menu, I could see he was a bit startled at the price of the food. So he turned to his female companion and said, Well... What would you like, my beautiful little plump girl? <laughs> yes, I must remember that. However, on Friday, well, I was throwing a little cocktail party for the Kensington and St Pancras Poetry Lovers Circle. And I needed some of those little sticks that you stick in stuffed olives. So I popped into my local department store, Harridge's. <laughs> Lift, please. Going up. <coughs> First floor, lingerie, underwear, boy scouts outfits, umbrella stands, salted peanuts, gramophone needles, and a nasty little floor manager named Hopkins. <laughs> um, excuse me, miss. I, I wonder if you could tell me where I might find those little sticks you stick in stuffed olives. I'm sorry, sir. I haven't the faintest idea. But you know what they sell on every floor, don't you? Not a clue. Well, what's that you call out every time we stop? Oh, is that? Oh, I just make it up as we go along. <laughs> oh, yes, it's much more fun than saying the same thing day after day. Second floor, bathing caps, sideboards, electric kettles, ping-pong bats, left-handed screwdrivers, haggis, extension ladders for nylons, hooks and eyes, anything you care to try. Well, I think I... Oh, look, there's an information desk. I'll ask there. Uh, uh, excuse me. Oh, good morning, sir. How is the information? If there's any little thing you don't see in the store... Yes? ...then you can safely assume we haven't got it. <laughs> but just refer it to us and we'll go out of our way to tell you... Yes? ...how to do without it. <laughs> Yes, well, I happen to be looking for those little sticks you stick in stuffed olives. Oh, yes. And um, where'd you lose them? I didn't lose them. I'm looking for them. Oh, I see. You arranged to meet them here. No, I'm not meeting anyone. Stood you up, I see. Oh, a girls are a funny lot these days. Trouble is, they're so hard to... Please! You took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> Oh, a fine information service this is. Well, thank you. We don't often get compliments. <laughs> well, nice, you are now nice. then, just, just wait a minute. I think I've got this. Excuse me. Yes? Do you have any self-globulating thermodynamic left-handed fish hooks? No. But we've got loads of little sticks you stick into stuffed olives. Thank you. You'll find them over there. <laughs> There we are, sir. Nicely wrapped up. At last. And you're very, very lucky to get them. Oh, I certainly am. They were the last pair of Wellington boots in the place. <laughs> Wellington boots? I don't want Wellington boots. Oh, come, sir. This is England. Everybody wants Wellington boots. <laughs> but I want those little olives you stick in stuffed sticks. I mean, I mean those little stuffed... Uh, uh, I want the complaints department. Over there, sir. Thank you. Is this the complaints department? That's right. Well, look, I've been sold a pair of Wellington boots by mistake. <laughs> you call that a complaint? <laughs> Listen to this. I've been working for this firm for two years. At the end of the first year, I'm promised a rise, but do I get it? No. No, I don't. They changed my lunch hour from 12 to 1 to 1 to 2, which means I can't see my girlfriend because her lunch is still from 12 to 1. The food in the canteen's getting worse. I only get one week's holiday and my feet are poorly. Now, you think you've got a complaint? <laughs> Sorry I mentioned it. Goodbye. I say, uh, just a moment, sir. What have you got in that parcel? A pair of Wellington boots. Did you buy them? No, I didn't. I got them by mistake. I came here this just morning... Just as I thought, sir. 
I'm the store detective, and I've been watching you. Look, you, you, you don't understand. They're, they're supposed to be little sticks you stick in stuffed olives. <laughs> well, I've heard some stories in my... No, time. no, no, wait, wait. Uh, I can explain everything. I came in to buy some of those little stuffs you stick in stitched olives... Uh, those little olives you stuff into... Those stuffed sticks... Uh, help, help! All right, sir, come along, Just thank you. Just a minute. I can vouch for this gentleman. Thank heavens, it's Pat Lancaster! <laughs> All right, sir, come along, please. Pat, please tell this gentleman who I am. Of course. This is Kenneth Hall. What? The chap who does that program, Beyond Our Ken, every week? Yes, that's right. All right, sir, come along, please. No, Thank no, 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 no. <laughs> this is Pat Lancaster. Oh, well, that's, uh, that's different. Uh, just a minute. How do I know it really is Miss Lancaster? Well, she can prove it. Sing, Pat. <laughs> Didn't know what time it was Then I met you Oh, what a lovely time it was How sublime it was too I didn't know what day it was You held my hand Warm like the month that May it was And I'll say it was grand Grand to be alive, to be young Yours alone. Grand to see your face, feel your touch, hear your voice, say I'm all your own. I didn't know what year it was. Life was no prize. I wanted love, and here it was, shining out of your eyes. I'm wise, and I know what time it is. To be alive, to be young, to be mad, to be yours alone. Grand to see your face, feel your touch, hear your voice, say I'm all your own. I didn't know what year it was, life was no prize. I wanted love and here it was, shining out of your eyes. Jolly nice, Pat. Okay now, Mr. Store Detective. Oh, yes, that's Miss Lancaster, all right. Good. Well, now, does that make things different? It certainly does. All right, Miss, come along with me, will you? Uh, bye, Pat. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> My goodness, look at the time. I've got a party to organize. Taxi, taxi! Oh, you won't get one in this department, sir. Oh, oh, dear, I must get home in a hurry. Uh, I'll leave it to heritages. Mr. Fenneray, forward, please. <laughs> Say, uh, Horn, yeah. wheel the Kensington and St. Pancras pair to love a circle. Appreciate your gesture in letting us get together in your bed. Well, thank you. Then perhaps you'd be good enough not to flick ash all over the carpet. Uh, sorry. And hey, you over there. That's my best lamp standard. Please don't knock your pipe out on it. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I'm sure. <laughs> I'll do it here. Is that better? That happens to be my hand. Oh, sorry. I thought it was one of those modern ashtrays. Oh, <laughs> uh, 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 Mr. Horn. <laughs> Mr. Horn, have you met Chancery Willow Wade? Uh, how do you do? Have an egg sandwich. Oh, divine. <laughs> Hail to the blithe spirit, bird thou never worked. <laughs> Shelley? Yes, this egg sandwich is full of it. <laughs> I say, Horn, yes? these stuffed olives are delicious. And what a quaint idea, sticking matchsticks in them. Yes, well, I, I, uh, I had a bit of difficulty getting the proper sticks. Oh, did you go to Harridge's? Yes, don't tell me you managed to get some there. No, but I'm terribly pleased with my Wellington boots. <laughs> Mr. Horn! Yeah. Uh, shall I let you in? 
into a secret about our little band of members. Uh, please do, yes. Each of them in the circle is named after a famous poet. Chancery here is our Wordsworth. Yeah. And I'm Keats. And I'm Byron. <laughs> and who's that tall chap over there? Long fellow. <laughs> Yes, I thought it might be. And uh, you see that one in the corner spinning a cowboy rope? Don't tell me he's your poet lariat. <laughs> oh, you guessed. Well, everyone, what about giving our hairs to some of our recent offerings? Oh, yes, yes. 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 Well, let's start with Percy Calthrop. Percy. <laughs> I shall give you my latest. It's called a Calthrop's Elegy in Oxford Street. Last week I met a sales girl. In love with her did fall. And every time I kissed her, she cried, Will that be all? Well done. And so he should be. <laughs> His work is known all over the West End. Yes, I've seen it chalked up on the walls. I think. <laughs> and now, perhaps something a little more classical from our newest member, Thackeray. Lindy, Thank you. No, <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> I must go down to the sea again. Well, thank goodness he's gone. <laughs> Never did like him anyway. Now, what about you, Chauncey? All right. How about 280 pounds owed to my bank manager? Oh, no, no, not that one, please. Oh, very well. Peanuts. <laughs> I know a bar where peanuts and customers sit drinking. They serve them free from 12 till 3 while everyone gets stinky. <laughs> I rarely drink. I sit and think whilst everybody lingers. I'm never tight, but late at night, I do have salty fingers. <laughs> Yes, Mr. Horn, what did you think? What did I think? Well, I suppose it could be verse. Oh. Now, you must hear from Windersley. He's our great modernistic poet. Ah, oh, yes, he is the Picasso of poetry. I hope you've got something new, Mendesley. I have indeed. I penned it last night. Oh, how oh, sad. <laughs> oh, I must have absolute yes, quiet, yes, please. Yes, yes. Quiet. quiet for Windersley. I say, what on earth's he doing? Shh, he's got to get in the mood. Yes, but not on my carpet. <laughs> but he always strikes that pose before reciting. Quiet, please. <laughs> Splidge, splage, splodge. Three purple bananas on a windowsill. <laughs> A wondrous scene, they look serene and tranquil on the windowsill. Oh, that's jolly. I haven't oh. finished. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. Go on. Splidge, splage, splodge. Thank God. I am going to splidge. That was brilliant. Don't you think so, Mr. Hall? Well, I... Uh, when does this stuff always say something? Didn't it say anything to you? Well, yes, but I'd rather not repeat it, actually. <laughs> the trouble with you is you didn't understand it. I must confess I didn't. Of course not. You've probably never been pony trekking in the French Alps. <laughs> well, I... I haven't, but what's that got to do with it? <laughs> you see, the man just doesn't know. No, it's going to be Philistine. I'll go find him. It's a Philistine. I doubt. I doubt if you could do anything like that. Well, I don't profess to be a highbrow poet. Well, you are not exactly a long hair. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, oh, no. Still, I'll have a go. Now, uh, now let's think, shall we? Yeah, let's think. Uh, You're not going to write it on the spur of the moment. No, I'll write it on a little bit of paper, I think. <laughs> now, here we are. There we are. It's finished. <laughs> well, now, here it goes. Quiet, please. Darkling and dankling and low it sped, the sky o'ercast with stars. What fearsome thrill, how boots the night? What ho for berries and lemons? <laughs> oh, that was positively spellbinding. What, uh, what would you call it? Well, I think I shall call it simply in search of those little sticks you stick into stuffed olives. Brilliant. Your nine titles to join our little poet. Oh, well, thank you. By the way, everyone seems to have written poems except this charming lady. Oh, you mean Laura Lodge? Yes. Uh, madam, aren't you a poet? No, no, I'm not. But I'm a constant source of inspiration to all the other poets. As the painter has his true life model, so the poet needs his. Well, I'm afraid I don't quite understand. Well, you see... I am the young lady from Gloucester. <laughs> Well, so much for poetry. And now, breathe that a man with soul so dead, who never to himself had said, it's the Fraser Hayes Ford. The mulberry bush, the mulberry bush Here we go round the mulberry bush On a cold and frosty morning This is the way we sing and play Sing and play, sing and play This is the way we sing and play Every Friday evening This is the way we play a jig This is the way we play a jig This is the way we cha-cha-cha Cha 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 This is the way we cha 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 on a cold and frosty morning. This is the way they sing today. Ba 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 ba. And so to the Kenneth Horn documentary feature, Horn or Armour. Yes, once again, Kenneth Horn and his team of investigators bring you a factual report on topics of immediate interest. And this week we present a close up on the city. Well, first of all, let's talk to those who work in this hub of commerce. Now, you, sir, I, I believe you're connected with the stock exchange. Uh, that is so, yes. Um, I am something of a speculator in stocks and shares. Are you considering some sort of investment? Well, I might be. What's the market like? Well, of course, there are severe fluctuations in stock market prices at present <laughs> due to a false inflationary spiral, but consoles and certain industrials are safe. Speaking for myself, I'm more or less satisfied with my preferentials, but I'm slightly concerned on another score. Oh, what's that? My debentures keep slipping. (laughs) 
Now, here's another gentleman. Are you a lucky investor? Yes, I certainly am. Do you know, two weeks ago, I had nothing. Today, I'm worth several thousands. Did you have expert advice? No, but I had complete confidence in my bankers. Well, may I ask who they were? Wolves, Manchester United, and Blackburn Rovers. <laughs> Now, here's a lady. Madam, I, I think you said you were a managing director's personal secretary. Yes. <laughs> That's right. How do you find your employer? Oh, he, he's most attentive. <laughs> Only yesterday he offered me a controlling interest in the firm. That's the fifth time I've refused. The fifth time? Yes. For a long time he's been trying to give me the business. <laughs> Well, I can't say I blame him either. <laughs> there goes a premium blonde. <laughs> now, now we're privileged to meet a wonderful character. Good evening, sir. Yes, uh, good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Good night. No. <laughs> Just a moment, sir. Sorry. I'd like you, if you will, to tell yes. us about your job in the city. Yes, sir. I, I am the... Stock key keeper at the Royal Mint. At the Royal Mint? At the Royal uh, Mint. Uh, how interesting. That's yes. where all our sixpences, uh, shillings, florins and half-crowns are made. Yes, we're, we're simply coining money. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're back again. Yes, good. <laughs> And how long have you been stockkeeper at the Mint? Forty-five years. Forty-five? Forty-five long years. Forty-five long years. Tell me, sir, uh, has any money ever been lost? Oh, yes. Yet all the time we are losing it. Hundreds of pounds every week. Good gracious. Why yes. is that? The Mint's got a hole in it. <laughs> Well, let us now spare a thought for just two of the many millions who every day travel from near and far to their jobs in the city. Hello, Rodney. Hello, Charles. I say, what a gorgeous carnation you're wearing this morning. Yes, it's rather dolly, isn't it? Well, we all need something to cheer us up. Did you read the financial press this morning? Oh, I certainly did. Do you really think we're heading for an economic crisis? Well, the government will have to impose some measures of restraint to protect our balance of payments. All right, you are, Charles. Well, quite frankly, Rodders, I'm getting terribly bored with the same routine. Yes, it's a pretty humdrum existence, but I trust we won't always be doing it. I should hope not. Personally, I'm sick to death of sweeping these roads every day. Lend us your broom. We had the shovel. Oh, I hit the broom. <laughs> Those with an intimate knowledge of the city will be well acquainted with the old lady of Threadneedle Street, in other words, the Bank of England. And the expression, safe as the Bank of England, is certainly well justified when you consider its impenetrable vaults. We sent Cecil Snaith to report. Well, listeners, I'm speaking to you now from deep down beneath this ancient and historic building in what one might call the old-fashioned walls. <laughs> well, I'm standing in one of the huge safe rooms in which the vast sums of money are kept. And so foolproof is the system that once the enormous steel doors have closed, entrance or exit is impossible. Now, no doubt at this juncture, many listeners who know me well... <laughs> may suspect that I'm going to get myself locked in here for several days. <laughs> well, I can assure you that even though I seem to be rather accident-prone, well, I'm not that much of a, to coin a phrase, right Charlie. So, let me just describe for you the interior of this vast... <laughs> Oh. And this is Cecil Wright Charlie Snaith returning you to the studio. Let us remember that even the most routine city job is not without its hazards. 
Quite often, an innocent bank cashier has been bound and gagged by bandits. So, ladies, please, be reasonable the next time your husband says, Sorry, dear, I was tied up at the office. <laughs> Finally, I'll remind you that business hours for city men vary considerably. But we wouldn't be far wrong in guessing that the peak hour in most suburban homes is round about 8.25 any morning. Felicity, where's my stud? I can do it. Honestly, you can never find anything in this house. Andrew, darling, come on, breakfast, Triggy. I haven't got time for breakfast, you old buffoon. Look at the time. Oh, you've got five minutes to get to the station. Come on, my darling, just have some toast. Oh, built up and do up me cuffling. Oh, dear. There, now, Rush, rush, rush. Oh. It's all your fault. It is. Why don't you get me off to work in time? Now, don't stop that, Ambrose, dear. Here's oh. your umbrella, briefcase, oh. and bowler. Now, goodbye, my darling. I'll never make it. Goodbye, Felicity. Ambrose! You silly old faggot. I'm retired. <laughs> Well, there you are. There'll be another Hornorama next week when the subject will be... <laughs> Doctors' prescriptions should chemists dispense with them. <laughs> also, next week's programme, we shall be having the President of the Royal Academy to sing for us, You've Got to Have Art. <laughs> well-known critic Bernard Levin will be talking about the latest hit in the theatre <laughs> and telling us who hit him. <laughs> and there'll be an excerpt from the new film which deals with the work that goes on inside a baked bean factory and called Can Can. <laughs> so until next week then, this is Kenneth Horne saying goodbye for now and leaving you with this thought from a listener. Does a blonde policewoman make a fair cop? You have either been listening to or have just missed Beyond Our Ken, a sort of recorded radio show which gave employment to Kenneth Horne and also to Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Betty Marsden, Bill Pertwee, Pat Lancaster, the Fraser Hayes Four, and the BBC Variety Orchestra conducted by Paul Fennelly. The script, believe it or not, was written, and letters of complaint should be sent to Eric Merriman. However, the onus must inevitably fall on our producer, Jake's Brown. <laughs>
Oh, wait, Miss Byfield, please. Certainly, sir. There you are. Uh, thank you. Boy, say, just a minute. There must be a mistake here. It, it can't possibly be 37 and 6. It is, sir. But I only had fish and chips. That's right, sir. The price of fish and chips today is 35 shillings. Well, he's, he's preposterous. Fix the manager. Very good, sir. <laughs> Good morning, sir. Something the matter? I should think there is. What's the meaning of charging 35 shillings for fish and chips? Well, I'm afraid we couldn't obtain our normal supplies of plate, cod, or rock salmon. No? So the fish today is a rather expensive delicacy from abroad. That is an excerpt from Dear Octopus. Another in our series, a play to remember, which may also help you to forget the next half hour. <laughs> Meanwhile, for those with a strong disposition, here is a sort of radio show which is beyond our ken. Among those taking part are Midgley Woodruff, Ada Lola Brigida, the Staffordshire Pottery's Chamber Music Ensemble, <laughs> Eustace Formaldehyde, Miss Prunella Parasol. She's a shady character. <laughs> To continue, Sir Humphrey Staccato, Dame Edith Ann Field, and of course Mr. Kenneth Horne, who prefers to remain anonymous. Ladies and gentlemen, Kenneth Horne. Hello, good evening, and welcome to Beyond Our Ken, a show that has been compared favorably with the weather forecast. <laughs> and here now is our own show forecast. Douglas, please. The outlook for the next 30 minutes is as follows. Mainly dull with bright patches here and there, occasional drivel and isolated laughs from a scattered shark. <laughs> oh, thank you, Mr. Smith. Well, now, let me tell you some of the things that have happened since we last met. On Tuesday, I attended a concert at the Festival Hall to hear the performance of a brand new work by Nasrallah Parmenta extremely popular composer. From his pen came such things as, uh, well, as, uh, as ink. <laughs> He's also well known for his adaptation of the trumpet voluntary to strings. <laughs> and possesses a very rare instrument which sounds like this. <laughs> Now you will know why it's very rare. <laughs> and actually, it's quite a dangerous instrument and must never be played during the mating season. <laughs> On one occasion at the festival hall, uh, during a fugue, a whole flock of lesser spotted grudge hawks flew in and delivered a protest. <laughs> right on Nasrallah Parmenter. <laughs> The particular piece he was responsible for on Tuesday was a concerto for orchestra and mouth violin. Now, there are very few people who play the mouth violin, except Mavis Trubwhistle, uh, another piece he was responsible for. <laughs> However, coming to Thursday, on Thursday evening, I've been spending the evening with friends and arrived home around about 10.30. When I turned the key in the lock, well, I didn't know what I was letting myself in for. <laughs> Near the door won't open. Prudence. Go away, you horrible monster! Open this door. That will do you no good. I've barricaded the door. You can't get in. What's the matter with you, Prudence? Good heavens, you haven't got your boyfriend round again? Whoever you are, go away. Go on. Get back to outer space. <laughs> Prudence, open this door. It's me, Kenneth Horn. Of course it is. Hang on, sir. I'll move these things away from the door. Ah, well. Now, ah, that's better. Now, Prudence, whatever's got into you? Oh, I'm ever so sorry, Mr. Horn. I've been scared out of me wits. It was that thing I've been watching on television. Oh, it was horrible and terrifying, sir. Prudence, I've told you before not to watch Jukebox Jury. <laughs> It wasn't that, sir. It was the play. 
science friction it was first. <laughs> Not suitable for people of a nervous disposition. That's what they said before. Then why did you watch it? I didn't know I had one until afterwards. <laughs> oh, sir, you should have seen... Ah! Ah! Oh, look out the window. It's one of them. Prudence, prudence, prudence. Those are my pyjamas on the washing line. Oh, dear. Now, look, just calm down and tell me all about it. All right, sir. Well, it was cold. The fantastic heat. And, oh, sir, that music. <laughs> My name is Peter Calthrop. My wife Sally and I came down from London and opened a pub in a quiet little village of Burbleberry. It was a pretty uneventful life. Until one day last summer. Here you are, Mr. Dingle. A pint of best ale. Oh, thank you. Oh, my word, it's warm, isn't it? Our beer always is. Oh, <laughs> oh dear Peter. Oh. I don't think I've ever known it so hot. Oh, I don't know. Remember that week in Brighton? <laughs> yes, but I'm talking about the weather. Uh, good evening, all. Good evening. Oh, oh there's our local author. Hello, Gavin. Written any good books lately? Oh, no, it's too hot to work. My thermometer says 110 degrees. Oh, well, our oh. thermometer says 108 degrees. Then you're two degrees under. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Looks like a stranger to the village. Good evening. Could I have a room, please? Oh, we're rather full. I could manage something if you don't mind sleeping with the... Uh... All right. No silly jokes about where I sleep. <laughs> I'm not a commercial traveler. <laughs> Very well. <laughs> I have, uh, have you a suitcase? No, but I do have some rather expensive technical equipment which I'd like treated with care. Oh, you're not from television, are you? Because personally, I get my things quite as... My I dear get... madam, <laughs> I happen to be a scientist. Oh, that's interesting. May I buy you a drink, sir? Thank you. I'll have half a pint of ferrodicarbosol magnesium acid. <laughs> well, I'm awfully sorry, sir. This is not a free house. <laughs> oh, here. Yeah. Oh, this heat... It's getting unbearable. Yes, it's, it's almost uncanny. Oh, I think there's something funny going on. Well, it certainly isn't the script. <laughs> well, it ain't never has been as hot as this in Burberry. And be no one believe me, but this very morning, I was down by old Barnaby's meadow, and I seen him with me own eyes. Well, that's nothing new, these courting couples all the time. Oh, no, no, this was something I'd never seen before. Just near old Barnaby's house, it were. Flying saucers. Oh, yes, old Barnaby and his wife having another row. <laughs> That's a strange object that landed in the field, I tell you. Oh, you my fire cart, you fools. Uh, go on, ma'am. <laughs> tell us, what happened? Well, it was even hotter than now when the object landed. The lid opened and... And... Oh, oh go on, uh, out with it. Uh, horrible, horrible it were. A great joy and insect. <laughs> Good grief. Look at the thermometer. It's 120. Peter, I'm frightened. Now, look, if there's anything unusual going on, the BBC will know about it. Switch the wireless on, Sally. Right. Chanted lady, five to four on fifth. <laughs> oh, last. <laughs> now, here's the result of the misshapely legs of Hampstead contest. The winner is number 19. Good heavens, it's Pat Lancaster. <laughs> oh, they've got me by the way, it's a great big groping tentacle. Oh, oh Peter, really? <laughs> well, personally, I don't believe a word of this nonsense. Oh, no, look at the temperature now, 140. What you people don't understand is these are monster insects controlled by radio, and they generate a heat of thousands of degrees centigrade. But what use is that? Well, it might come in handy for making toast, I suppose. <laughs> this landing is probably an advanced party to prepare for a major invasion. Oh, no! It's getting on her. Yes, who knows? There might even be a thing in here. There is, actually. It's upstairs, first on the... <laughs> Oh, 
Now, look here. If what you say is true, we must do something. Where's the phone? There. The phone. Ah, here. Yeah, good. Yeah. Where's Wally? Why for all have been... A... Why for all have been alerted by now? I'll speak to the minister. Ha- Hello? For Hugh Ridgway, please. Hanford here. Scientific advisor. Uh, Hello? Hello? Uh, Sir Hugh Ridgway here. Hello, Sir Hugh. Has the terrible news reached you yet? Yes. 28 for 2, death for sure. <laughs> oh, sir. I mean the invasion of England by giant electricity generating the monsters. Hello, hello, sir. They could wipe us all out. Oh, don't worry, old boy. Cartridge is batting at number four. <laughs> sir, invaded by monsters. Uh, what sort? Electricity generating insects. You must do something. Oh, I'm sorry, Hannaford. It's not my opinion. Try the electricity authority. <laughs> hello, hello. Hello. Oh, Baba. They... they can't help. What? Oh, my goodness, what are we going to do? I can't stand it, do you hear me? I can't stand it! I can't! This is going to be the end of all! Oh, my God, you can't stand it! What are we going to do? Sally, Sally, it won't do any good acting like this. Oh, I don't know. The drama department might be listening. <laughs> I'll get in touch with Scotland Yard. Hello. 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 What's the matter? Oh, no. The line's been cut. I'm not surprised. It was pretty filthy. Well, <laughs> Look here. Why don't one of us nip down to the local police station? Don't be a fool. It's not safe with those things outside. It's the only way. I'll go. Oh, oh my God. God. <laughs> now, where's my equipment? Gentlemen, this is a television walkie-talkie. Not only can I keep in touch with you, but you can watch my progress on this small screen. Now, be careful of the things, Hannaford. All right, but they should happen to get me. Yes. Well, it'll be just one of those things. (laughs) There. There are the pictures on the television screen now. I'm getting into a car now. The road is clear ahead. The heat is intense. Now, going past the post office. Getting hotter. There's the church on the left. There seems to be something ahead of me I can't quite see. What is it? There's nothing on the screen. Great Scott, yes, it's ahead of me now. Can't you see it? It's, it's... Ah! No, no, the screen's gone blank. Wait a minute. There's something coming on. You feel okay, you start the day with butter's porridge flakes. (laughs) Goodness, they don't make a sound. Porridge flakes. And now, part two. Ah! <laughs> oh, it's ghastly. I've never seen anything like that. Ah! Oh, good heavens, the set's gone dead. Whatever he saw must have been pretty terrible. Perhaps it was the squire's wife. <laughs> oh, oh sir, I'm scared half to death. What on earth are we going to do now? Listen. There's something coming. <laughs> the door handle's turning. All right, everybody, back against the wall. <laughs> oh, it's horrible. It's incredible. A double-headed insect monster from outer space. I've never seen anything so ghastly. Coming nearer. Ah! Good afternoon. I'm, I'm sorry if I frighten you. You filthy beast! <laughs> oh, no, don't be like that. Oh, you're hideous. Well, two heads are better than one. What are you doing here? Well, I just popped down from another planet. Yes. Is this the start of a mass invasion? No, of course not. I only come down to ask a question of the Earth people. Well, we are the Earth people. What do you want of us? Well, I was just wondering. Yes? Do you think we could borrow half a cup of sugar? <laughs> and this week we present a close-up on sport. Well, first of all, let's talk to a well-known cricket umpire... Mr. Stanley Birkinshaw. 
Glad to have you with us, sir. Oh, the pleasure's mine, I assure you. Yeah. You've umpired quite a lot of matches, I suppose. Oh, yes, indeed, yes, I have. Surrey versus Sussex. Essex versus the MCC. South Africans versus Worcester. Oh, all sorts. Yes. And you're always there at the wicket to see fair play. Uh, oh, yes, that is so, yes, yes, indeed. I scrutinise every aspect of the match. Of course, I'm supposed to observe strict impartiality, but I must confess that on one occasion I did wish for some advice to Peter May. Really? What, what, what was that? Uh, I, I said, if, if you want to stop Sabah Rose scoring any more sixes, take Statham off and substitute a slow-off spinner. <laughs> and uh, uh, just at that juncture, they had to stop play. Why was that? Well, so the wicked would have a chance to dry out. <laughs> and now here's another gentleman. What's uh, your sport, sir? Well, I simply adore a game of water polo because I don't get the chance to play enough. Why not? My horse isn't too keen, you know. <laughs> Now then, here's one of the leading tennis stars. Madam, what do you think of your chances? Yeah, I, I definitely think I shall catch a Wimbledon this year. You're a really good player, then. No, but I've got the most gorgeous pair of frilly panties. <laughs> well, that's what counts. <laughs> yes. Well, now to the Olympic Games, which once more are to be held this year. We're privileged to have with us the familiar figure who carries the burning torch into the arena. Good evening, sir. Um, good evening, sir. Good evening to you. And I'm very honoured. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure you are. Yes. Thank you. Good now, night. now, sir. Oh, oh yes. So, uh, I... so you're the one, are you? Uh, I am, sir. Yeah, yes. That is me, yes. They bring me out of retirement every four years, you know. Yes, I see. Yes. And, and how long have you been doing it? Thirty-five <laughs> years. How long? Thirty-five Thirty years. Ah, uh, yes. And I'll be there again this year, trotting round the arena. Wearing me same old shorts and running best and carrying that flaming thing around. Now tell me, sir. Flaming torch, yes. I can. You do, do you? Around. Would you tell me, uh, with your vast experience now, what do you think will happen at the Olympic Games? I will confidently predict one of the biggest shocks there has been for years. Oh, I see. You've got some inside information there. No, I've got a dirty grey hole in my shorts. <laughs> well, now then, sports. At one time, riding was a somewhat exclusive pursuit, pretty well confined to the country set. But now even the Londoner can enjoy riding at such places as Hampstead Heath. Hello, Rodney. Uh, you ought to tell him here, Charles. <laughs> I said, never knew riding habits you've got on. Brand new, Rodney. They're absolutely dolly, isn't it? Very contemporary. What a novel idea. Taffeta breeches. <laughs> Actually, it's my own design. I call them London breeches. Why? They're always falling down. <laughs> It's almost time you had some new gear, you know. <laughs> Your riding whips would be a dad, yes? I know, it's been a poor crop this year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, come on, it's a lovely day for a ride, isn't it? I say, shall we make a race of it, Rodder? Oh, fabulous. Loser buys the drink. Right here. Yes. Get ready. Yes. Set. Go. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, boy, come on. Come on, come on. Come on. Oh, do I, do, I do wish these donkeys would go a bit faster. Oh, Mary, go to show you this. Go to carrot a bit further. Oh, I'm teasing you. It's been long. Well, there can't be many of us who don't enjoy a nice swim now and again, but, but very few of us are, are capable of indulging in such a sport as high diving. We've got something of a surprise for you now. <laughs> Something of a surprise. So over to our own commentator, Cecil Snape. Well, hello, listeners. 
This is Cecil Snaith speaking to you from a well-known indoor swimming pool. Uh, the surprise that was mentioned by Mr. Horn just now is that I myself was high diving champion of my college at university. Yes, I, I've been in some dives in my... <laughs> Of course, it's been quite a while since I actually done any fancy diving, but the BBC persuaded me to convince listeners that there is at least one thing I can do properly. So I'm standing now on the top springboard, uh, clad, not unnaturally, in my shark skin bathing trunks. I just thought I'd... just thought I'd uh, slip that in as this isn't television. <laughs> Well, the, the dive I shall attempt is a double reverse back somersault and two half turns. Uh, a feat only possible on an extra springy diving board. So, listeners, here I go. Cecil Snape from the shallow end, <laughs> returning you to the studio. Now let us turn to perhaps the most widely appreciated sport, football. And even if you're not fortunate enough to watch a really serious game of football, like, uh, well, like the show business 11, then uh, no doubt you support your own home team. And at any match they play, you can be sure of hearing the loyal and ever-devoted fans. Go on, Billy. That's it, lad. Make circles round him. Oh, he's a grand player, isn't Billy? Oh, this team will be nothing without him. I'm telling you, worth every penny of the money they paid for him. Look at him now. Look at him. He's got the ball again. Go on, Billy. Show him how it's done. Go on. What? He's he past one man, two men. Just watch him now. That's it, Billy. He's got past another one. Go on, lad. Shoot. Go on. Shoot. It's an open door. Shoot, Billy. He missed. Put that right idiot on the transfer list. They shouldn't have bought him in the first place. It's ridiculous. <laughs> there you are. There'll be another Hornorama next week when the subject will be Turkish bath attendants. Are they highly esteemed? <laughs> or are they just old sweats? <laughs> also in next week's program there'll be a, a rather quiet report from the Noise Abatement Society and we shall be bringing you excerpts from the electricity board brochure just to provide a little light reading. <laughs> and we'll be going over to see the military to two on Agatha Winkleberry. <laughs> so until next week at the same time, this is Kenneth Horne saying goodbye for now and leaving you with this thought from a listener. Are Russians who write in block letters capitalists? Good night. <laughs> That gentleman over there. Come here. Come here. <laughs> now, do you mind if I kiss you? Oh, no, it's not that number. No, I mean it. Mm. I find you madly fascinating. Mm. Oh, come on. Put your arms around me. Oh, and... Yeah, it's all wrong. <laughs> I, I don't know you at all. Mm. I've never seen you before. Oh, that makes it all the more exciting. Mm. 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 That is an excerpt from Love from a Stranger. <laughs> Another in our series, A Play to Remember, which may also help you to forget the next half hour. <laughs> Meanwhile, for those with a strong disposition, here is a sort of radio show which is beyond our ken. Among those taking part are Lieutenant Commander Haldicott Mackridge Stendispas, Turkish bath attendant, <laughs> worried blue eyes of South Clapham, the Bournemouth ladies' girl black and white minstrels, Widgley Farson, 
Miss Gertrude Gardner, the famous left-handed piano player. Oh, I know her. She's a bit of a vamp. <laughs> to continue, Ross Atwell, Frank Edgware and... Frank Edgware and Dennis Morden. <laughs> and, of course, Mr. Kenneth Horne, who prefers to remain anonymous. Ladies and gentlemen, Kenneth Horne. <laughs> Good evening. Welcome to Beyond Our Camp. Hey, let me tell you some of the things that have happened since we last met. On Monday, I popped into my favorite exotic coffee bar in Kensington, a place called the Co Cup of Cocoa, <laughs> which I always find fascinating. I can spend hours in there just sitting and watching the brown sugar sink slowly through the froth. <laughs> However, on Wednesday, I was in town when I run into, ran into a chap I know who's got a rather unusual job. He tests mattresses. It's quite a skilled job. And actually, there's a special name for blokes who test mattresses. Oh, what is it now? Oh, dear, oh, dear. Oh, yes, I know. A mattress tester. That's right. Yes. <laughs> anyway, he was looking pretty miserable because apparently he'd just been given the sack. And when I asked him why, he said, Well, they caught me standing up on the job. <laughs> well, on Thursday, I, I wanted to meet the supervisor of program planning for the BBC, Mr. Spencer Lotterby. So I went along to Broadcasting House. <laughs> How much longer do I have to wait? Oh, Commissioner, look, uh, I've read the Radio Times and the listener twice already. Well, we've got a book here you might like to read. Oh, yes. There's uh, one or two bits. Well, you know, <laughs> I've marked the pages. <laughs> Keep, it to <laughs> Keep it to yourself. But here you are. Oh, thank you. Now, what's it called? Oh, the Listen with Mother Annual. <laughs> Well, I suppose oh, I... Good grace, you're still waiting, Mr. Horn. Haven't they sent you up yet? No. Well, you should have done. After all, you've sent us up enough times, haven't you? <laughs> oh, perhaps you care to accompany me. I'm the press officer. Mr. Lotterby's on the eighth floor, though I ought to warn you, he's a very difficult man to get into. Right, up we go. <laughs> oh, golly, that was quick. Yes, that's one of our best sound effects. <laughs> Oh, look, uh, look, that office there, Edwin Braden, it says. He's our musical arranger. I must uh, No, 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 no. He mustn't be disturbed. He's hard at work. Listen. <laughs> look, look, I, I'm sure he wouldn't mind no, about... No, Mr. Horn. He prefers to be on his own most of the time, you know. In fact, we call him the lone arranger. <laughs> Pass on. Yes, as quickly as possible after that one. <laughs> ah, here we are, Mr. Lotterby's office. Ah, good morning. I'm Spencer Lotterby. Uh, this is Mr. Kenneth Horn, sir. Kenneth Horn? It's funny, we've got a Kenneth Horn on our files. Does a show called Beyond Our Ken? Actually, according to the statistics, nobody listens to him. But there's another fellow in the show everyone's mad about. His name is Kenneth Williams. <laughs> Yes, I wouldn't miss him myself. Versatile, handsome, mellifluous. Yes, now, isn't, uh, isn't Betty Marsden on that show, too? Oh, yes, she's always overacting, you know. <laughs> excuse, uh, me, uh, uh, excuse me, sir. Mm. What about Hugh Paddock? Yes, what about you? <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Uh, oh, 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 I, yes. I could... Uh, yes, that's <laughs> Mr. Lotterby, this listener research business is very interesting. I'd like to know how you get your information. So would I. <laughs> no, no, actually, we have a team of experts going round asking people what they like. And what do they like? Well, most of the men seem to go for cricket commentaries. And what do the women go for? Kenneth Williams. <laughs> a very versatile, handsome, mellifluous. Yes. <laughs> By the way, what does mellifluous mean? I've no idea. <laughs> but we can soon find out. Uh, get me information. We got one of the best information departments. They know everything. Oh, yes. Hello? Oh, Spencer Lotterby here. I want to know the meaning of mellifluous. Mellifluous. 
M for mellifluers. <laughs> e for mellifluers. Oh, M for mother. E for Edward. Uh, L for leguminous. Leguminous. <laughs> L for latitude. Latitude. L. Oh, never mind. Well, I'm sorry I asked. Tell me, Mr. Lotterby, how does one learn the job of listener research? Well, you start with the keyholes and work your way up. <laughs> We've got lots of other interesting statistics, you know. You'd be amazed at the number of people who listen to the news in Norwegian. Really? <laughs> Where do they all come from? Norway. <laughs> But if you want some really interesting statistics, come into this room here. Yeah, how about those? 34, 26, 36. Good heavens, it's Pat Lancaster! <laughs> And the Variety Orchestra are all here studying the statistics. <laughs> well, I don't know. They even whistle off key. All right. <laughs> Bing, Pat. Jarl in Ice Pan. Uh, by the way, Mr. Lotterby, it's time for the critics. Oh, yes, the critics. Now, what's that program all about? I've never heard it. Neither have I. That's why I'm going to listen. I'll switch on my set. Last race of Newbury. First, Rose of Summer, 20 to 1. Second, Helping, 100 to 7. Third, Saddle of Lamb, joint favourite. <laughs> That is the end of the racing results. Now, here is an announcement. In the play at 8.30 this evening, The Sport of My Mad Mother, the part of the Lotus Eater will be played by Peggy Mount and not Sir Donald Wolfie. <laughs> as shown in the Radio Times, which incidentally is on sale now, price fourpence. And now we present the critics. The chairman today is Kenneth Hall. Ordinary thing. I must listen to this. Ladies and gentlemen, the critics. <laughs> Good afternoon. Our art critic today is Eustace Peabody, so we'll start with films. <laughs> the film we've seen this week is Hiroshima Mon Treaty Park. <laughs> now then, Elizabeth Cragepot Hobartson. Yes, well, as a matter of fact, I went to see this film with our book critic, Neville Hodge. And I must admit I was held from beginning to end. <laughs> He's a bit of a devil, is old Neville. You liked it, then? Oh, I enjoyed it tremendously, yes. Neville Hodge? Oh, yes, rather. Thank you. Thank you. Now, what did our theatre critic think of the film? T.B. Gorsley. Uh, well, I mean, quite honestly, I, I, I would like to be able to say that I didn't enjoy this film, but I'm afraid I did. Uh, the, the, the whole thing had a tremendous depth, even uh, though it was on a wide screen. And I, I felt that uh, what came across particularly well was the, 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 the fortita in re, suaviter in modo. Oh, yes, definitely. I mean, one got the impression that at the very least it was... Well, how, how, how shall I put it? Well, um, um, se non e vero e ben travato. Oh, yes, definitely. Of course, I, uh, I can understand that some of us might not like it as much as others, but then <laughs> chacun a son goût, as I always say. Oh, yes, definitely. Elizabeth. Elizabeth, do belt up. <laughs> you don't know what I'm talking about. Oh, yes, I do. Well, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> However, if I was asked to sum this film up in one word, I think I should say that the whole thing was... Uh, 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 Millifluous? Uh, uh, yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, Thank you, yes, that's right. <laughs> well, now... Now our radio critic, Marvin Spenlove. Well, I don't intend to wallow in the asinine verbosity of course, no. I was be quite outspoken. I hated it. Oh, oh no. Yes, I hated this film. Yes, but why? Dennis Williams wasn't in it. 
Well, there we are. I myself couldn't get in to see it. There were enormous queues for the five bobs, and I certainly wasn't going to pay seven and six. However, in summing up the general opinion of the critics, I would say that we vote Hiroshima Mon Tweety Pie a miss. <laughs> Oh, turn it off. But that program will have to go. You know, Mr. Orme, there's going to be some radical alteration in the BBC programs in the future. Really? How do you mean? Uh, well, I mean, for one thing, we are hoping to sell some of our radio shows to the American market. In fact, with that in view, we've already Americanized one of our most popular programs. W would you like to hear the recording? Yes, I would indeed. All oh, right, right. Uh, stand by. This is the BBC Light Program. We present another gripping installment of... <laughs> the Archers. A tale of simple country folk. The story you are about to hear is true. Only the fat stock prices have been changed to mislead the income tax collector. My name is Archer, Dan Archer. I'm a farmer. <laughs> Wednesday, May 1st, me and my assistant were working in the fields on our usual beat, the sugar beet. Tied up all the loose ends, and we were taking a shortcut across the field of corn when an emergency call came through. Hello, Archer. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. We've got to get back right away. Something's cropped up. Okay. <laughs> Say, Dan, how come you get a telephone call in the middle of the cornfield? Never heard of the corn exchange. <laughs> got back to the farmhouse, it was deserted. The reason was soon obvious. Wrong farmer. We finally got the right one. I threw open the door. There was a woman standing by a table. Well, hello there. Uh-huh. Who are you? My name is Archer. Doris Archer. I'm your wife. Uh-huh. What's the... <laughs> What's the trouble, ma'am? It's our boy Jack. He's missing. <laughs> started the search immediately. We looked in the barn. <laughs> Nothing suspicious there. I questioned the milkmaid. She didn't know much. She does now. <laughs> the search continued. At last we found a man who might help. He was out in the pasture taking stock of the stock. Hey, mister, can I have a word with you? Okay, okay, just stick to the facts. <laughs> Who are you? My name is Gabriel, Walter Gabriel. I'm a herdsman. Okay, Mac, what do you heard? <laughs> well, they go around the other way to the hut and they roar about the Uh-huh. Well, they're out there the way right now. Are you sure? Yeah, right now, right up there in the water at the airport. Thanks, mister, you've been a little help. Archer. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay, we'll check on it. That was my dog. He thinks he's got a lead. Come on. Okay. Say, Dan, how come you got a telephone call in the middle of a herd of cattle? Never heard of the stock exchange. We followed up the lead. It was right. We closed in on the hayloft. There in the corner, we found the answer to the Jack Archer case. Jack Archer. Immediately, we reported back to the farmhouse. Well? My name is Archer, Dan Archer. I'm a farmer. I know that. Just give me the facts. Oh, ma'am, we found him. Is it bad? Worse than that, our boy Jack has disgraced the family name. Yeah, we found him in the hayloft operating a secret radio. Oh, no. Jack Archer, a traitor. I'm afraid so, ma'am. But why? He was listening to Mrs. Dale's diary. <laughs> Well, you may be interested to know that Jack Archer was found guilty and received the maximum sentence. Fifty-two weeks in the Huggins. <laughs> However, some more interesting facts I learned from the BBC were all about FHF, 
which I always thought meant fairly high frequency, but turned out to be the Fraser Hayes Fall. And so to the Kenneth Horn documentary feature, Hornorama. Yes, once again, Kenneth Horn and his team of investigators bring you a factual report on topics of immediate interest. And this week we present a close-up on Russia. Is their political outlook in doubt? Or can we take it as red? <laughs> First of all, let's talk to an authority, Mr. Stanley Birkinshaw. Now, sir, uh, I understand you just returned from a lecture tour in Russia. Uh, that is so, comrade, yes. Uh, <laughs> my my uh, subject was the British way of life. Uh, did you travel far? Oh, yes, indeed, yes. It was an extensive tour uh, right across the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. <laughs> I, I visited such places as Minsk, Omsk, Vladivostok, Murmansk, the Caucasus, Sebastopol, across the Russian steppe, and finishing up in Moscow. Yeah. Were your lectures well attended? Oh, yes, indeed. Wherever I spoke, there was an overflow. <laughs> Here's a, a very, very attractive Russian lady. Now, madam, I, I must say, uh, I find you extremely beautiful, and I would no. like... No! Oh. <laughs> I thought that was a word you've never used. <laughs> However, I understand your fiancé is closely connected with various international organizations. That, that is true, yes. He is very, very keen on, well, you know. Yes, I think I know, yes. <laughs> In fact, that is where we first met. Oh, you were both delegates at Euro. Yes, we used to work out together. <laughs> and now we're privileged to meet a remarkable old character who has actually lived and worked in Siberia. <laughs> good evening, sir. Uh, good evening to you, sir. Ah, uh, yes, I'm very proud. Thank you, sir. Honor. Thank you. Now, Thank sir. Thank you. Now, sir. Yes. You've... Ah. Yes. You've actually been to the Urals. Yes. Yes, I'm afraid I had to, sir. <laughs> you see, I, I was working out there in the salt mines for something like 35 years. How long? 35! Yes, yes, quite an old suit. <laughs> yes, very funny, sir. Hey, tell us, yes. tell us something I've always wanted to know. What do they do with all that salt? Uh, they, they, uh, they, they wrap it up in little blue bags <laughs> um, for them to take to crisps. <laughs> Russia, a vast and industrious country, and in many fields, great advances are being made. I said no. <laughs> oh, she's back, is she? However, I was thinking particularly of those pioneers of progress, the Russian scientists. Hello, Rodney. Hello, Corbyn, Charles. <laughs> Hey, what a lovely blue tie. Yes, it's rather dolly, isn't it? <clears throat> it's my conservative club tie. What about this gorgeous Cossack hat I'm wearing? Oh, yes. What, sir? Keep my head warm, sir. <laughs> oh, you are a rag. Rodder, would you care for samovar tea? No, you never have samovar. <laughs> I don't think that's funny. Oh, get with it, comrade. <laughs> Honestly, you're a bit of a red square. <laughs> Come on, I think it's time we got on with our latest project. Let's hope this rocket works, or we'll be for it. All right. Stand by, comrades. Ready to launch rocket? Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. There, there. Right. You fool! You said it along the ground instead of up. <laughs> it's not my fault. You knocked the milk bottle over. <laughs> Really, to understand the Russian way of life, one has to talk to the ordinary people, learn their social and sporting interests. With this in mind, we sent Cecil Snape to Moscow. 
Well, listeners, I'm speaking to you now from a famous Soviet working man's club. Well, <laughs> all sorts of indoor games are being played. There are, in fact, one or two other Englishmen here. It's quite easy to spot them. They <laughs> haven't got snow on their boots. <laughs> <laughs> However, standing by me now is a Russian gentleman by the name of Ivan. As a matter of fact, listeners, when he told me he was Ivan, I said, Yes, you, you look pretty terrible. <laughs> Little joke which, unfortunately, he did not share. <laughs> so, he has invited me to join him in a game called Russian Roulette. <laughs> I've, uh, I've never played this before, but we have a revolver with six chambers. We place just one bullet in it, spin it round and then pass the gun back and forth, firing it at our own heads. <clears throat> Sounds fun. <laughs> well, I have won the toss, so Ivan starts off. Now you sneak. Thank you. Now you, Ivan. Oh. Now you sneak. This is where it starts to get exciting. <clears throat> Now you, Ivan. <laughs> the last shot is yours, Nate. Oh. <laughs> well, here goes. Oh, my cloak! My cloak! My cloak! <laughs> and this is Cecil, not such a fool, Snaith, returning you to the studio. Turn to those legendary Russian figures, the anarchists. Is it true that they were always plotting for the downfall of government officials? Let's eavesdrop on two such anarchists in a dark alleyway just outside Moscow. Felicity. Yes, Ambrose. You didn't forget to bring the bomb with you, did you? No, darling, uh, I've got it here. Uh, well, get ready to throw it when I give you the word. Uh, we'll teach. That picture of each fellow a thing or two, are you? Yes, uh, do you really think our little plan will work? Of course it will, you silly old faggot. Oh. <laughs> I've been watching Petrovich's movements very closely. I know. He passes through this alleyway every night, sharp at nine o'clock. Oh, but oh. Ambrose, oh. look at the time. Oh, good heavens, it's twenty past nine. Yes. He's very late tonight. Oh, dear. What is it? I do hope nothing's happened to him. <laughs> well, there you are. There'll be another horn around. And next week, when the subject will be physical training, does it get your back up? <laughs> also, in next week's program, we shall be reading extracts from the autobiography of a department store detective entitled The Confessions of a Counter-Spy. <laughs> and there'll be a preview of the new film starring Bridget Bardo and called The Gladys Morgan Story. <laughs> so until next week at the same time, this is Kenneth Horne saying goodbye for now and leaving you with this thought from a listener. If a chemist bought some strepto traps, would it be to catch some streptomycin... Good night. <laughs> you might have been listening to What Have Just Missed, Beyond Our Ken, a sort of recorded radio show which gave employment to Kenneth Horne and also to Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Betty Marsden, Bill Pertwee, Pat Lancaster, the Fraser Hayes Four, and the BBC Variety Orchestra, conducted by Paul Fennelly. The script, believe it or not, was written, and letters of complaint should be sent to Eric Merriman. However, the onus must inevitably fall on our producer, Jake Brown. <laughs> The last in the present series, the best of the best. The last in the present series, the best of the best. The last in the present series, the best of the best. The last in the present series.
Okay, Chuck, this one's ready. Stand clear. Timber! Well, that's another one, McGinty. Yeah. Boy, am I fed up with chopping these gosh darn trees down day after day. Who'd be a lumberjack? What are you talking about, man? It's a great life. Ah, oh, shucks. You're like all the other guys around here moaning all the time. Why be miserable? Look at me. I really enjoy being a lumberjack. Ah, you're gonna whistle while you work. You're gonna whistle. So that was an excerpt from The Most Happy Fellow. <laughs> the last in our series, A Show to Remember which may also help you to forget the face I pull to get a laugh at this point every week. <laughs> Meanwhile, for those who haven't been able to see that face, here is a sort of radio show which is beyond our ken. Among those taking part are Sir Hugh Grit, <laughs> the cloakroom attendant's poetry lover's circle, <laughs> Murchison's thrip, Miss Rona Rancy. She's gone off a bit. <laughs> Game to the last to continue. <laughs> Lofty Shorthouse, the Sheik of Golders Green, and of course Mr. Kenneth Horne, who prefers to remain anonymous. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Anonymous. <laughs> thinks he's going to be in the next series, I expect. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to this last in our present series of Beyond Our Ken, affectionately known to us as B.O.K., because we hope it'll be OK on the night. <laughs> well, now, let me, as usual, tell you what's been happening since we last met. On Saturday, I went to the cinema and saw a film all about life among the Eskimos. Quite an eye-opener it was. I learned one thing from it. Those Eskimo girls will do anything for a cloth coat. I thought you'd have to think about that one a bit. <laughs> Monday, well, Monday I was going to see Fanny by gaslight, but she'd had electricity put in. <laughs> so instead, I decided to take a bus somewhere. It was a great fun. The London Transport were a bit annoyed. I took it to Pontefract. <laughs> anyway, it was all right. I took the bus back two days later, and they thought it was just running late. <laughs> On Wednesday, I got into more trouble when I had my face slapped at a big cocktail party I attended. A very charming young lady. It wasn't really my fault. I mean, the badge she was wearing did say press. <laughs> Thursday, I spent most of the day at home playing the piano. Now, that may surprise you, but for years I've been playing the piano on and off. Always had a rather slippery stool. <laughs> Actually, at one time, I even played in a trio. It was only a, a small trio, just the two of us. <laughs> Me on the piano, and you hoodie me in on vibes. <laughs> However, Thursday evening, I did pop out for a meal, and uh, I ordered a salad. Well, when it arrived, it looked a bit bare, so I called the waiter over and said, just look at this salad. I've never seen a salad so bare. And he said, oh, well, sir, it's the French dressing, you'll know. <laughs> <laughs> Which uh, explained everything, really. <laughs> That's all the news up to date. Now, where's the car? Where's the car? Come on. Come on. All right. Now, gather round. Gather round. Now, sh now uh, listen a moment. Now, look, this is the, this is the last show. You know, and, I, and I've been thinking, perhaps we ought to make a, a suitable gesture to our producer. No. <laughs> William's not that sort of gesture at all. I mean, well, I, I think we ought to show our appreciation for what he's done for us. Wonderful oh, idea. No, I agree. Yeah. 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 Well, what has he done for us? <laughs> oh, well, all sorts of things, like... Uh, uh, well, then he was always very... Uh, you, you must admit he, 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 he... Yes, what has he done for us? <laughs> oh, no, Ken, be fair. I, I mean, I'm sure we can all honestly say that whenever the opportunity arose, Jakes was always there with a helping hand. Yes, you can say that again. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you, you couldn't have a more polite, courteous, considerate old gentleman. <laughs> well, look what his wife told us. He never forgets to hold open the door for her when she fetches the coal in. <laughs> 
Yes, well, perhaps we should give him a small token of our esteem, but what now? Why don't we give him something to wear on formal occasions? Such as? Well, for instance, teeth. <laughs> Ah, oh dear, you know, it's so difficult to know the right thing. Now, let's, uh, let's see. Um, has anybody got anything they'd like to get rid of? Kenneth Williams. What a splendid idea. <laughs> I'm sure Jake's would love to get rid of Kenneth Williams. Oh, that's charming. <laughs> All right, Paddock, why don't you give him one of your old suits, like the one you're wearing? Now, just a minute. Look, this isn't getting us anywhere. Betty. 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 Yes, Ken, yes. Uh, can you think of anything we can give our producer? No, nothing. Well, that's the best suggestion so far. <laughs> of course. Why didn't we think of it before? We'll give him nothing. Well, at least he's practical. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Oh, all right. Let's, yeah. let's get him over here and tell him. Uh-oh, Jakes, Jakes. Where is he? Jakes! Jakes! Coming, coming. Well, uh, Jakes, the, the cast and I have been having a little chat, and, well, Jakes, on behalf of all the cast and myself, as a, a token of the very high esteem in which we hold you, I have much pleasure in presenting you with this. Oh, thank you. What is it? Nothing. <laughs> oh, you shouldn't have. <laughs> Go on, Jakes, take it. We know it's not much, but it's the thought that counts. Yeah, yeah. Beep, 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 beep. Oh, no, really, I, I, I hardly know what to say. Well, that makes a change. <laughs> oh, look, look, a little tear has crept into the corner of his eye. Well, it's not every day he gets nothing. All I can say is, I shall treasure it always. Oh, come on. You can do better than that, Jakes. Make it more dramatic. Yes, Lift more, it off the more, paper. Oh, yes. <laughs> more feeling. I Try it with the emphasis on treasure. I shall treasure it always. <laughs> I shall treasure it always. Exit dramatically, effects door shut. Those are the directions. Oh, I'm sorry. You'd think he'd know, wouldn't you? No. Door, please. Well, thank goodness he's gone. Well, now, on with the show. On with the show. You know, I thought it'd be... Hello. Who can that be, as if I didn't know? Hello. Good heavens, it's Kenneth Horn. <laughs> Pat, Pat Lancaster, you've been dying to say that, haven't you? All right, sing, Pat. <laughs> The same old hoodoo follows me about. The same old pounding in my heart whenever I think of you. And darling, I think of you day in and day out. Day out, day in. I needn't tell you how my days begin. When I awake, I awaken with a tingle. One possibility in view. That possibility of maybe seeing you. Come rain. Come shine, I need you and for me the day is fine. Then I kiss your lips and the pounding becomes the ocean's roar. A thousand drums, can't you see it, love? Can there be any doubt when there it is? In view, that possibility of maybe seeing you come rain, come shine. I meet you when to me the day is fine. Then I kiss your lips, and the pounding becomes a thousand drums. The ocean's roar. Can't you see it, love? Can there be any doubt?
jolly nice pants. Thank you. And now, Ken, as this is the last show for a while, we've got a surprise for oh. you. Stand by. <laughs> This week, we bring you a scorching and sensational life story. It's savage, sordid, tempestuous. Packed with human emotions and wild passion, we present... The Kenneth Horn Story. Only once in a lifetime does a personality come along who possesses so many fine qualities. Wit, charm, abounding talent, a man who is loved by everyone. But unfortunately, we're not doing the Kenneth Williams story. <laughs> Ours is the Kenneth Horn story. Yes, Kenneth Horn, gay, vital, ebullient, mellifluous. <laughs> A man of infinite taste, elegant, charming, brilliant raconteur, a rich... Oh, sen- get on with it. <laughs> well, hanging it out Please. like that. <laughs> Pardon that interruption, Andrew. <laughs> Kenneth Horne, how much do we really know of him? Well, I could tell you a thing or two. <laughs> Do you remember that voice? Oh, I, I, I said, really, you, you haven't got her here, have you? Yes. Come in, Mavis Prendergast. Well, well, well. After all these years, eh? Well, I'm terribly sorry. I'm afraid I don't remember you. Of course you do. <laughs> How could you forget your old games, mistress? Well, well. Bless my soul. Bless my soul, old, old Mies Ben Prendergast. <laughs> yes, that's right. It's me, dear, dear Lemuel. Lemuel? Oh, yes. His name then used to uh, be... No, no, please, maybe it's... Maybe it's... Yeah, but I, I, I thought everyone knew. Lemuel Water Sprite. Oh, <laughs> Lemuel Water Sprite. <laughs> all right, all right. That's enough out of you, Leslie Blanche Flower. <laughs> How did you know? <laughs> anyway, all we're trying to establish is that at school, Kenneth Horne was a very good sport. So was maybe Spendergast. <laughs> From school, Kenneth Horne went to Cambridge University and, as a young man, distinguished himself in the debating society. His wit and oratory won general acclaim. They still talk of his sparkling repartee on the occasion when one of our up-and-coming politicians was speaking in the union debate. <laughs> Furthermore, this house believes in the freedom of individual expression. And, gentlemen, if there ever comes a time when we should lose sight of that glorious adventuring spirit and the true conception of a life free from one sense and not to mention uh, the British Empire, <laughs> in which our loyalty and devotion must never for a minute falter, and gentlemen, this I would finally say. Let us go forward with supreme optimism in the prosperity and continuing progress of expansion, knowing that we, of all people, believe in our island heritage. Oh, belt up! <laughs> From university, he entered the world of commerce. A financial wizard with a luck of Midas. Anything he touched turned to gold. For instance, he had a golden secretary. <laughs> but even in the frantic world of business life, he found time for show business. He formed a dance band known as the Kenneth Horn Hotshots. <laughs> Ken himself played alto sax and also delighted the customers with his vocals, with such popular numbers of the day as... <laughs> Good night, Cock Fosters. <laughs> you city of a million memories. The fragrant perfume of a thousand cigars and boozing in bars in June. <laughs> Good 
good night, cock pastel. It's 40 minutes on a 2-9 bus. A trip to paradise that's hard to resist. It's shrouded in mist in June. Sweet city of Middlesex, you turn me into a broken-hearted clown from Piccadilly. It's a stone's throw just at the other end of town. Good night, Huck Foster. And good night, Kenneth Horn. <laughs> then came the war. Our hero was very popular with the Army and Navy. He went into the Air Force. <laughs> As an RAF officer, he made something of a reputation for himself. Here, you, just because there's a blackout, there's no need Let to... us gloss over <laughs> his war efforts. <laughs> his rank? His rank was wing commander, and after the war, his rank was the one just outside Euston Station. <laughs> One day, his taxi carried an important passenger from the BBC. I say, driver. Yes, sir? I've been studying you closely. Your looks and appearance are just what we want. Oh, really? Yes, you'll be absolutely right for radio. <laughs> success followed success. Comedy shows, panel games, variety. Kenneth Horne was the busiest man in the BBC. Apart, of course, from the chap who dealt with complaints from listeners. <laughs> Almost every night he was working, and long will Kenneth Horne remember those 20 questions. I'm home, dear. Where do you think you've been? Out. Alone? No. Who with? Someone. Animal? Yes. Female? Yes. Could you eat her? I certainly could. <laughs> and the next object is a rolling pin. No. A rolling pin. <laughs> Most of those in the limelight, Kenneth Horne pays the penalty of fame. Here, yeah, mister, can, can, can I have your autograph? Yes, yeah, yes, of course. Now, lend me your pencil, will you? Oh. Uh, there we are. Oh, ta. I suppose you are Mr. Kenneth Horne, the famous playwright? Well, no, I'm, I'm afraid I'm the other one. Oh. Have you got a rubber on you? <laughs> so we come to the present day. And let us end the Kenneth Horne story with a final word from the star of our show, Kenneth Horne. Well, thank you. You know, ladies and gentlemen, Beyond Our Ken doesn't really have a star. It's a show that is based on teamwork. The spirit of comradeship which the cast share is unique in show business. I quite agree. Nobody's asking you. I'll say what I think. Don't be so rude, will you? You keep out of this, Mark. What you're saying, Paddy? You're out of this. Don't you talk to me, It's all right, we were only joking, but I'm certainly not joking when I say it's always a pleasure to introduce the Fraser Hayes Ball. In Dublin's fair city, where the girls are so pretty, I first set my eyes on sweet Molly Malone. She wheeled her wheelbarrow through streets broad and narrow, crying cockles and mussels, alive, alive, oh, alive, alive, oh. But sure it was no wonder For so were her father and mother before And each wheeled their barrow Through streets broad and narrow Crying cockles and mussels Alive, alive, oh And 
serve to the Kenneth Horn documentary feature, Hornorama. Yes, once again, Kenneth Horn and his team of investigators bring you our factual report on topics of immediate interest. And this week we present a close-up on France. Chers auditeurs, écoutez maintenant un rapport factuel des sujets immédiatement intéressants. Which roughly translated means Douglas Smith ate un grand boss. Well, now then, first of all, let's talk to this gentleman. You, sir, uh, I believe you're a regular visitor to France. Uh, that is so. We, we, uh... <laughs> Once a year, I spend several uh, weeks in the south of France, Cannes, Nice, and Tropez, or, or some such sun-soaked resort. <laughs> What sort of a resort was it, sir? Uh, sun silk. Oh, yes. <laughs> now, what do you like to do? Oh, all sorts of things. I spend most of my days basking in the sun. Swimming, water skiing, sightseeing, lazing outside cafes, sipping soft drinks. <laughs> and at night, well, there's so many things. There's um, the casino, restaurants, bars, saucy shows. <laughs> oh, it's one gay, endless round of pleasures. Yes, but uh, isn't all this rather expensive? Yes, but I don't mind splashing out occasionally. <laughs> And now we are privileged to meet a remarkable old gentleman who lives and works in Paris. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Ah, good evening to you. Ah. Good evening. I'm very privileged to choose coal upon me. Thank you, Thank sir. You. Now, now Thank tell you. me, whereabouts in Paris do you work? I work, oh, I work in one of them naughty review <laughs> uh, uh, places. You know where everyone... Yes, 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 I know. <laughs> Yes. Ah, 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 ah. Quite, sir. I, I understand. Uh, How long have you been there? Thirty-five years. How long? Thirty-five years. Here. Now, sir, I presume you like your job. Oh, uh, no, 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 not really. Well, why not? Well, it gets a bit cold posing like that every day. <laughs> Well, now, France. Firstly, it is inevitable that we should think of its gay, romantic capital. Yes, Paris, the magic mecca of tourists the world over. And wherever there are tourists, you can be sure there will be those whose job it is to cater for tourists. Hello, Rodney. Bonjour, Charles. <laughs> what did you think of last week's lot? Peasants, Charles. Absolute peasant. I know. The Louvre, the Eiffel Tower, the Folie Berger, and that's their lot. Yes. If I hear another one say that tower's quite an Eiffel, I shall scream. Mm. <laughs> well, what can you expect with the people that are coming to Paris these days? Yes, I got my own back on one of them, though. I told him to spend a night out with April. You did? Yeah. I did! <laughs> and when he said he'd never heard of her, I said, everyone's heard of April in Paris. Oh! Oh, you are a rag. <laughs> Still, it, it's no laughing matter, really. Only made a few francs last week. Me too. Well, let's hope this boat loads a bit more culture conscious. Yes, here they come. Mm. <coughs> press cards. Naughty Don't press, press cards. Get it right. <laughs> One cannot think of France without thinking of wine. Not unnaturally, since the produce of its famous vineyards are known the world over. For those who might like to know a little more about winemaking, we sent Cecil Snaith to Bordeaux. Yes, listeners, I'm speaking to you now from outside a beautiful old chateau in the vineyards where some of the most superb wine is produced. Now, some of you who are not wine drinkers may be put off by the old conception that the grapes are trodden by barefooted French peasants. So let me assure you that these days it is much more modern and hygienic. They wear boots. <laughs> <laughs> the whole process of winemaking is absolutely fascinating and I'm now going down into the cellars of the old chateau where the wine has been fermenting in large vats and I'm told is now matured and ready for bottling so let's go down and see for ourselves it's 
rather dark in here, of course, but uh, if I remember rightly, the steps down are just about it. Oh! oh. Ah! And this is Chateau Snaith, 1960, returning you to the studio. <laughs> Finally, let us spare a thought for those whose sense of daring and adventure prompts them to attempt a journey to France by swimming the channel. Yes, and in the summer of every year, it's a common sight to see the small boats crossing the water with their hopeful companions swimming alongside. Uh, keep it up, Felicity. Never mind, we're nearly there. Come on faster, or it'll be dark before we land. I'm hungry. What again? Oh, all right. Open your mouth, and I'll chuck another sardine sandwich. Oh, dear, you missed. Oh. Hard luck. That was the last one, too. I don't think I can go any further, Andrew. But you must. Look, Cape Grisnes is just ahead. You can't give up now, you silly old faggot. Oh, dear, dear, dear. Come on, Felicity, that's oh, it. Forward, tied together. Forward. Oh, We're here. We've made it. Oh, oh thank goodness. Ambrose, I'm absolutely exhausted. Oh, stop my complaining. Darling. You've been moaning all the way across. Never again, Ambrose. What do you mean, never again? What I say, you and your bright idea. Well, it's the cheapest way I know to get to France. You <laughs> So ends another series of Beyond Our Ken. We'll be back later in the year. So until we meet again, this is Kenneth Horne saying goodbye for now and leaving you with this final thought from a listener who says, if all the thoughts at the end of the show are provided by listeners, what's the scriptwriter doing? <laughs> You've either been listening to or have just missed Beyond Our Ken, a sort of recorded radio show which gave employment to Kenneth Horne and also to Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Betty Marsden, Bill Pertwee, Pat Lancaster, the Fraser Hayes Four and the BBC Variety Orchestra conducted by Paul Fennelly, who played Edwin Braden's music, which was strictly incidental. <laughs> the script, believe it or not, was written and letters of complaint should be sent to Eric Merriman. However, the onus must inevitably fall on our producer, Jake Brown.
Sandwich bird. No, thank you. Like a plum? No. It's a seaside rock. Ada, please, don't remind me. It's the worst holiday we've had for years. You're telling me. I never had me itsy bitsy teeny weeny yellow polka dot bikini out of the cellophane once. <laughs> I'll be glad to get home. Ada, Ada, quick, look out of the carriage window. Sonny Bert, what is it? You've seen a ghost or something? No, no, look, quick, up there in the sky. That big round thing. Oh, Bert, the sun's come out. <laughs> That is an excerpt from Suddenly Last Summer. <laughs> yes, each week at this time, we shall be bringing you a film worth remembering, which is more than can be said for the next half hour. <laughs> However, for those with patience and understanding, here is a sort of radio show which is beyond our ken. Among those taking part are patience and understanding, the Right Honourable Hugh Wendersley Skeet Smeltafont, Miss Rose Anne Crown, <laughs> the First Aid Society's Adhesive Band, <laughs> Widgley Clack, Miss Deirdre Dividend. Mm, she's very cooperative. <laughs> to continue, Traffic Warden, Sir Geoffrey Gore with a spoon, <laughs> Capuchin Rowbottom, and of course, Mr. Kenneth Horne, who prefers to remain anonymous. Ladies and gentlemen, Kenneth Horne. <laughs> Well, good evening and welcome to the first in a new series of Beyond Our Kent. Well, here we are again, much the same as usual, except that our producer has been influenced by Alfred Hitchcock, and he's asked me to tell listeners that no one, but no one, will be allowed to tune in after the program has started. <laughs> Matter of fact, it's rather a proud moment for me. We've actually done something like 60 shows altogether, and for those who are interested in statistics, they might like to know one or two facts. For instance, so far, we've cracked 32,600 gags. We've got 27 laughs. <laughs> the producer has used 21 blue pencils. <laughs> Betty Marsden has appeared in 17 different ensembles. <laughs> and Kenneth Williams has worn one suit. Oh, charming. Yes, well, I'll give you another statistic, too. Kenneth Horn hasn't had to have his hair cut once. <laughs> All right, that's enough statistics. Well, now let me, as usual, tell you some of the things that have happened since we last met. Well, there were holidays, of course. Actually, I've been to Cornwall for three years running. So this year, I decided to go by train. <laughs> of course, the... Uh, the weather wasn't very kind, but then even abroad it hasn't been good. Some friends of mine went to Aix-les-Bains. They were telling me it rained so much you only had to go out in the street to have a bain, and they came home with lots of aches. <laughs> However, one of the most important happenings for me was that I decided to buy a new house. Well, there were all sorts of reasons. I felt like a change of neighborhood. I'd always wanted a nice house in a select district. And apart from that, I'd been evicted. <laughs> <laughs> Well, anyway, one morning I went around to see that old established firm of estate agents, Arthur Figley and Son. Oh, good morning. Arthur Figley? No, I'm Hilda Potter. Oh, I see, but this is Arthur Figley's. No, that's right, yes. I'm his amanuensis. Oh, are you? Yes. I'm also the woodworm expert. <laughs> Do sit down. Thank you. Sorry, I should have mentioned it before. That chair's got a touch of it. <laughs> <laughs> now, I take it you want to see Mr. Figley. And the name, sir? The name Horn, Kenneth Horn. Oh, yes. Uh, Mr. Horn. Mr. Figley and his son have often spoken about you. Oh, really? What did they say? I don't know. They always send me out of the room first. <laughs> well, I'd like to see him anyway. Very well. Just a moment. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Figley. There's a gentleman to see you. How would I describe him? Oh, large, spacious, well-built, somewhat detached, semi-furnished on top and in good condition. <laughs> Here, the name's Kenneth Horn. Very good, Mr. Figley. You may go in, sir. Oh, thank you, Miss Potter. That's a rather old-fashioned speaking tube. Does uh, Figley sound far away? No, oh, no, he's only two mins from the tube. <laughs> go in, sir. Yes. Yeah. 
one, that one should have gone out, shouldn't it? Um, <laughs> goodbye, Miss Potter. Goodbye. Ah, uh, morning, Figley. Oh, uh, morning, Mr. Hall. I thought you'd be married. I'm on the phone. Hello? Oh, uh, Mr. McCraith. Well, that offer for the house in Kingsley Road. I'm afraid it's fallen through. No, no. It's the house that's fallen through. <laughs> Yes, yes, well, the soil was a bit soft and it slipped halfway down. <laughs> right, oh, goodbye. Mm. Norman? Yes, sir? Make a change in the particulars for number 10, Kingsley Road. It's got a sunken living room now. <laughs> all right, Jack. Here, we'd better alter the price, though. After all, we was asking 5000 All right, make it 6000 <laughs> Now then, Mr. Owen. I interest you in some nice property. Well, yes, Figley, that's why I'm here. Well, I'd see you. You wouldn't like to buy a barber's shop, I suppose. Well, no, thank you. Oh, it's a snip. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, what makes you think I'm looking for a business? I heard your last radio series. Figley. <laughs> oh, Figley, I, also... oh, I want I to never... buy a nice residential uh, property. The bungalow? Oh, no, a house. Oh, well, that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I, I think I've got the very thing for you. It's not 10 Kingsley Road, is it? <laughs> oh, good gracious, no. No flies on you, is there, eh? <laughs> oh, you were heard me, didn't you? I wouldn't dream of selling you a place like that. Well, I've got a very nice, classy residence in the Finchted Garden suburb. Oh, it's the most lugubrious neighborhood. <laughs> Surely you mean salubrious. No, no, there's nothing like that goes on there. <laughs> that sought after the area, you know. Lady Grangeforth, she had a big house there. Well kept? Well, I've heard, yes, she... Oh, no, I... <laughs> yes, no, oh, oh, yes. All the property's well cared for. The people are very select. You won't see any lines of washing hanging out in the suburb. No washing? No, we're very select people, even if they do wear filthy clothes. <laughs> What? Well, now, what's the, what's the house like? Norm, bring details of Monterey Paws, Larches Road. Here we are, Mr. Holmes. Oh, thank you. Now, let's just see, shall we? Uh, uh, no, four bedrooms, mm -hmm. two intercommunicating kits, yeah. bath, and, good gracious, a swimming pool. One of the delightful features of the place. But isn't it rather unusual to have an indoor swimming pool? Oh, not really. The damp coast doesn't work. <laughs> Norman, I'm your father, am I not? Yes, sir. And I'm the head of this firm, am I not? Yes, sir. And you are a junior partner, are you not? Yes, sir. Then can you remember, I do the punny line. <laughs> uh, 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 excuse me, Mr. Pigney. Oh, yes, come in, my dear. Mr. Orn, I'd like you to meet Miss Janet Waters. Hello. How do you do? One of my more reliable colleagues. Oh, really? Severe? Given half the chance, I would. <laughs> I mean, is she qualified? Oh, rather, she's an FRICF and an FRIBA. Yes, she's also a nice bit of STUWF, isn't she? <laughs> I don't suppose she sings by any remote chance. Oh, I don't know if she knows that one, but she does sing. <laughs> would you like to hear her? Well, I certainly would. Right. <laughs> Miss Potter, you know that vacant lot down the road? Well, send them in here, will you? <laughs> That's not the variety orchestra conducted by Paul Fenley, is it? However did you get, Mr. Orr? Well, I think I know this show by now. Sing, Janet. <laughs> Being completely on fire. You and the night and the music thrill me, but will we be one after the night and the music are done? Until the
Janet, and don't worry too much about being an architect and surveyor. You'll be something quite different next week. Oh, all right. Bye. Bye. Well, now, Figley, about the property. Can I see the house? On a clear day, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really mean it, Mr. Owen. I, I just said he'd get a laugh. <laughs> what happened, then? <laughs> Our son, Norm, he's got the keys. He'll show you over the place. Oh, good. And if you'll... Uh, if you'll just look out of the lounge window, you'll find a very lovely view of Hampstead Heath. I'll open the window. Now, Mr. Orne, you just listen to the birds. Ah, <laughs> Probably a lark, I should think. <laughs> Let's go upstairs, shall we? Right, follow me. By the way, Mr. Owen, there is one thing I ought to point out. <laughs> Mr. Horn, Mr. Horn, where are you? I'm in the cupboard under the stairs. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, what is it? The ninth stair is missing. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'll remember in future. Well, come on, there's lots more to see. Now, uh, Mr. Horn, here is the main bedroom. Yes, this is a nice room, but, uh, well, that floor doesn't look too safe. Oh, it's as safe as ours is, Mr. Horn. Now, cast your eyes round, and you'll just have to admit this is a very, very lovely... <laughs> Lounge. <laughs> well, I'm telling you, Piggly, there isn't a flaw in it. Of course there isn't a flaw in it. I told you the house is perfect. Look, there's nothing between the roof and the foundation. You're in luck, then. It's the latest thing, the new open plan living. <laughs> all right, all right, Piggly. How much is this house? Well, we were asking 10,000 pounds or near offer. 2,000? Three. 2,500. 2,750. 2,600. 2,650. Done. You certainly have been. <laughs> well, now, to those of you who've been through the procedure of buying a house, you'll know that this is only the beginning of the problems ahead. First of all, there was my bank manager who said, of course, we'll agree to a loan, Mr. Horn, providing you can satisfy us that you don't really need it. <laughs> Then there was that never-to-be-forgotten visit to the solicitor. Good morning, Mr. Horn. Do come in. Gimble, Dunkerton, Sim, Thwaite, Chorley, Havershed, and Cradlewick? Yes. Which are you? Smith. <laughs> and do have a seat. Thank you. Ah! Not there, Mr. Horn. I advise you not to sit on the couch. It has, as we legal men say, a slight structural defect in its fundamental congranulation. <laughs> what does that mean? It's got a wobbly leg. <laughs> And should you sit there on, it's possible you could cause yourself some sort of mischief to your person. And, uh, 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 you don't want to get involved in a long, costly legal battle with us now, do you? Of course not. Then I advise you to sit on the chair. <laughs> right. You're an astute man, Mr. Horn. Five guineas well spent. Five guineas? Professional advice. I told you. <laughs> Did I not? Not to sit on the, on the couch. That amounts to a fraudulent... Ah, 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 ah. Careful. That could be a, a malicious statement. Oh, I'm sorry. That's better. Now, Mr. Horn, here's a copy of the lease of the property. You'll just peruse it. You'll find it all quite straightforward. Thank you. Now, let's see. Uh, 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 here in article, the lessor, which expression shall admit the successors and the assigns of the one part, uh, 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 aforesaid delineated to the messuages of the tenements. <laughs> messuages? 
I'm sorry I'm not getting the messuage. <laughs> oh, it's perfectly simple. Messuage means a dwelling house. It's a very old English word. Well, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Beg your pardon, Mr. Holmes. What did you say? Oh, nothing. Just another very old English word. <laughs> Uh, let's see now. That's the contiguous of the premises, demise in hereby, da 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 heretofore, according. Yes, yes, good, good. That seems to be in order. You mean to say that you understand it all? Yes, perfectly. Oh, good. Well, then, when we meet again, say, in a fortnight's time, yeah? perhaps you'll explain it to me. <laughs> Smith? Uh, yes, Mr. Gimble? Of course I should be delighted. But... Well, if you'll excuse me, Mr. Hall, Mr. Gimble wants to have a drink with him. Goodbye. And at that point, he was called to the bar. <laughs> However, things gradually sorted themselves out, and some four months later, I moved into my new house on the Finstead Garden suburb. Well, Prudence, what do you think of it? Oh, it's lovely, sir. Yes, I think I'll be very happy here. It's all so tranquil. It's quiet and peaceful as well. Yes. <laughs> One thing, I shan't be disturbed up here. Oh, look, sir, there's your next-door neighbour coming out. I think it's time to get friendly. Well, I may as well get acquainted. Good morning, sir. Good well, morning to you, too. Oh, no. You know, I think, can I borrow your lawnmower? Prudence, Prudence. Get out of Figley on the phone. Right, sir. Tell him I'm thinking of moving. <laughs> and now I can strongly recommend a very desirable property to whom we're very attached, the Hornet. And so to the Kenneth Horn documentary feature, Hornorama. Yes, once again, Kenneth Horn and his team of investigators bring you a factual report on topics of immediate interest. And this week we present a close-up on the Olympic Games. Was the outcome influenced by the heat and sun of Rome? And if so, where are athletes browned off? Well, now, first of all, let's have a word with the gentleman who attended the Olympic Games. You were, you were actually there, sir. Uh, that is so, yes. Uh, uh, I was present in the capacity of a spectator. You went all that way to support our team? I did, most certainly, yes. Uh, I was a most enthusiastic supporter. I stood up in the stand and I shouted out, Come on, the British contestants! Show us your faces! Show them the British possess superiority! Every success, lads and lasses! I, I thought it would spur them on. Yes. 
And did it? Unfortunately, no. You see, after the first day, the Olympics Committee had me forcibly removed from the stadium. Oh. Why was that? I doused the Olympic flames. <laughs> So you were put out as well. Well, bad luck, Mr. Burgerjohn. Well, now, many excuses were made for the failures of some of our athletes. Now, you, sir, now, you came in last in the 1,500 meters. Why? Well, it was such a lovely day, I decided to walk. <laughs> and here's a very charming member of the British contingent. Madam, how did you get on at the Games? Awfully well. <laughs> You see, there was this handsome American hurdler. No, 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 no. Uh, I meant in your particular event, uh, in, uh, swimming, wasn't it? Oh, yes. You see, well, I'm afraid I was disqualified because of my swimming costume. <laughs> you see, I was wearing a bikini. A bikini? <laughs> oh, oh, I see. That's short for bikini. Yes. That's what the judge said. <laughs> What a pity. Still, I'm sure we'll be seeing more of you. <laughs> However, let us consider the important accusation made that the British team did not have enough time to get acclimatized. For an opinion on that, let's ask one of our leading athletes. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Good evening to you. Thank you. Um, right, please. Good. Right, now, well, well, right, sir. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Well, sir, what are your feelings in this matter? I have a very definite views about it, sir. It was absolute madness to arrive in Rome only two days before the games. None of us had a chance to get acclimatized. I see. see. It's no no. And how long no. do you think you should have been there? Thirty-five years. <laughs> How long? Thirty-five years. Well, it, it, it doesn't no. seem to affect you. No. I mean, it's a remarkable no. achievement to no. win a gold medal at your age. No. No. You really must have had no. the will to win. Yes. Yeah. No, no, it wasn't that. Well, what was it then? Well, the starter shot me in the foot. <laughs> Well, there were indeed several outstanding successes for the British in this Olympiad. <laughs> several outstanding successes for the British, but for the most part, it was a failure. Now, why? Why? <laughs> As I was saying, why and what went wrong? Well, one theory advanced by team managers was that the athletes broke training and were living it up. Now, was this really true? Hello, Rodney. Hello, Tron. I say, you look a bit rough. Just look at those Olympic rings under your eyes. <laughs> You've obviously been living it up. I have not, Rodney. Oh, yes, we have. I watched you burning a Roman candle at both ends. That is simply not true, Rodney. Oh, no. What about you and that shot foot champion, Madame Tamarova? No, Rodney. Can't stand her. She's always throwing her weight about. <laughs> there you are, an athletic rag. Yes. <laughs> There must be some good reason why you did so badly this morning. I mean, our 28 competitors were staring lost. But it wasn't my fault. Stuffing yourself with spaghetti bolognese, I said. I was not. Well, it was pretty pitiable, wasn't it? You got a good start and going well up to the halfway, and then you suddenly stopped dead. Why, Charles? I couldn't help it. What happened? Well, the egg fell off my spoon. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that will certainly be remembered about the Olympic Games was, was the brilliant and exclusive coverage made by the BBC. However, many of you who followed this may have missed the inimitable report made by our own commentator. Yes, we sent Cecil Snape to the Olympic Games. Hello there. Well, listeners, this is Cecil Snape speaking to you from the stadium in Rome. Magnificent venue of the 17th Olympiad. So far, only one minor incident has marred this Olympiad when yesterday one competitor was stepped on with spiked running shoes and what Olympiad. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> well, I'm 
standing now in the midst of the various field events which are going on all around me. Over there, the heats of the hammer throwing. Just in front, the long jump final. Over there, the discus. And behind me, the javelin throwing. <laughs> well, now, I can see that the discus is about to be thrown by Nicky Draskia Vinuskoof, the British competitor. <laughs> and it's a good throw. I should imagine it's something like a hundred and sixty javelin. Only inches short of. <laughs> oh, and this is Cecil Snape, gold medalist in the long jump, returning here <laughs> to the studio. <laughs> Well, success or failure, no doubt. Discussions on the 1960 Olympiad will go on for some time. But let us now look forward into the future. Already plans have been laid for the next Olympic Games to be held in Japan in 1964. And already in certain British homes, extensive preparations are being made. Come on, Vinnie, get a move on. Salt, mustard, vinegar, pepper. Good. Now I can have me supper. <laughs> about me, Ambrose? You can have a glucose tablet and an arrowroot biscuit later on. Good, Ambrose. Don't argue. And while I'm eating, uh, carry on with your skipping. Good, Ambrose, I've been at it all day. No. I'm exhausted. No stamina, that's your trouble, oh, you old faggot. <laughs> and after skipping, we'll have a bit of weight lifting. Oh, no, my dear. Then twice round the backyard at full speed. Thirteen knees bent, oh, running on the spot for twenty minutes, no. and three back somersaults. No. Well, Ambrose, yeah. I refuse to do all this. It's quite ridiculous. Look, do you want to go to the Olympic Games in Japan? Yes, of course I do, my darling. Mm. Well, please be real. What do you mean? Well, after all, Ambrose, we're only going there to watch. <laughs> Bit on the horn around next week when the subject will be timber merchants. Do they ever give you a raw deal? <laughs> also, in next week's program, Emlyn Williams will be giving us some more readings from the works of Lionel Bart. <laughs> There'll be a talk given by a man with only two front teeth on central eating. <laughs> And there'll be an excerpt from the new film starring Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers called The Joyce and Lionel Blair Story. <laughs> and that's all for now. So until next week at the same time, this is Kenneth Horne saying goodbye for now, leaving you with this thought from a listener. When the Chancellor's wife does him a good turn, does he give her a credit squeeze? Good night. <laughs>